1. A CONFESSION 1 1884, I wrote it on the slip of paper and handed it to him myself. In this note not only did I confess my guilt, but I asked adequate punishment for it, and close with a request to him not to punish himself for my offense. I also pledged myself never to steal in future to an autobiography, P.T. I. C. H. V. I. 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 2. Speech at Alfred High School, R. A. J. K. O. T. 3 July 4, 1888 I hope that some of you will follow in my footsteps, and after you return from England you will work wholeheartedly for big reforms in India. From Gujarati Kathy Our Times, December 7, 1888. One when Gandhiji was 15, he had removed a bit of gold from his brother's armlet to clear a small debt of the latter. He felt so mortified about his act that he decided to make a confession to his father. Parental forgiveness was granted to him in the form of silent tears. The incident left a lasting mark on his mind. In his own words, it was an object lesson to him in the power of Ahimsa. The original not being available. His own report of it, as found in an autobiography, is reproduced here. To according to Mahatma Gandhi, the early phase, pages 212, one of the sentences in the confession was, So, Father, your son is now, in your eyes, no better than a common thief. 3. Gandhiji was given a send-off by his fellow students of the Alfred High School, Rycott, when he was leaving for England to study for the bar. In an autobiography, P.T. I. C. H. Zai, he says, I had written out a few words of thanks. But I could scarcely stammer them out. I remember how my head reeled and how my whole frame shook as I stood up to read them. V.O.L. 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 1. 3. Letter to Lakshmidas Gandhi, London, Friday. November 9, 1888 Respected brother, I am sorry that there has been no letter from you for the last two or three weeks. Your silence is due perhaps to your not having heard from me. But it was impossible for me to post any letters before I reached London. That you should not have written to me on that account is indeed surprising. As I am far from home we can meet only through letters. And if I do not get letters I feel very much worried. Therefore please drop a postcard every week without fail. I would not have been anxious if you did not have my address. But I am sorry that you have stopped writing after having written to me twice. I joined the inner temple on Tuesday last. I will write in detail after I hear from you next week. The cold here is now bitter but such bad weather generally does not last long. In spite of the cold I have no need of meat or liquor. This fills my heart with joy and thankfulness. I am now keeping very good health. Please give my respects to mother and sister-in-law. Mahatma, Vol. I. Also from a photostat of the Gujarati 4. London DIARY 1 London, November, 12, 1888 What led to the intention of proceeding to London? The scene opens about the end of April. Before the intention of coming to London for the sake of study was actually formed, I had a secret design in my mind of coming here to satisfy my curiosity of knowing what London was. While I was prosecuting my college studies in one when his nephew and co-worker, Kaganil Gandhi, was proceeding for the first time to London in 1909, Gandhiji gave him his London diary. The diary filled about 120 pages. Kaganil Gandhi gave it to Mahadev Desai in 1920. But, before doing so, he copied out in a notebook about 20 pages of the original. The remaining 100 pages were not continuous writing, but merely a chronicle of incidents during his stay in London from 1888 to 1891. The original being untraceable, Kaganil's copy is reproduced here with minimum editing. Gandhiji wrote the diary in English when he was 19. 2. Pavnagar 1, I had a chat with J. Shankar Bach. During the chat he advised me to apply to the Junagadh 2 state to give me a scholarship to proceed to London, I being an inhabitant of Sur. 3. I do not perfectly remember the answer I made to him that day. 
I suppose I felt the impossibility of getting the scholarship. From that time I had my mind the intention of visiting the land. I was finding the means to reach that end. On 13th April, 1888, I left Pavnagar to enjoy the vacation in Rykot. After 15 days of vacation, my elder brother and I went to see Patwari. On our return my brother said, we would go to see Mavji Joshi 4, and so we went. Mavji Joshi asked me as usual how I did. Then put some questions about my study in Pavnagar. I plainly told him that I had hardly any chance. of passing my examination first year. I also added that I found the course very difficult. Hearing this, he advised my brother to send me as soon as possible to London for being called to the bar. He said the expense will be only RS 5000. Let him take some Uradol. There he will cook some food for himself and thereby there will be no objection about religion. Don't reveal the matter to anybody. Try to get some scholarship. Apply to Junagad and Porbandar states. See my son Kavalram 5, and if you fail in getting the pecuniary help and if you have no money, sell your furniture. But anyhow send Mohandas to London. I think that is the only means to keep the reputation of your deceased father. All of our family members have great faith in what Mavji Joshi says. And my brother who is naturally very credulous made a promise to Mavji Joshi to send me to London. Now was the time for my exertions. On that very day my brother, notwithstanding his promise to keep the matter secret, told the thing to Kasal Bhai 6. He, of course, approved of it in case I could observe my religion. The very day it was told to Major Pai 7. He quite agreed with the proposal and offered to give me RS 5000. I had some faith in what he said. And when the matter was disclosed to my dear mother, she reproached me. One former princely states in Gujarat 2 Ibad 3A district in Surashra 4 priest family friend and advisor of the Gandhi 5 leading lawyer of Kathy Wan. Six Gandhiji's cousin and father of Kagandal and Maganal both of whom worked with him in South Africa. Seven Gandhiji's cousin. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 3. For being so credulous and she said I would never get any money from him when the time comes, which she thought never will come. On that day I was to go to Kival Ram Hai. I saw him accordingly. There I had not a satisfactory chat. He no doubt approved of my object but said, you will have to spend there at least RS 10, oh oh oh. This was a great blow to me, and again he said, you will have to set aside all your religious prejudices, if any. You will have to eat meat, you must drink. You cannot live without that. The more you spend, the cleverer you will be. It is a very important thing. I speak to you frankly. Don't be offended. But, look here, you are still very young. There are many temptations in London. You are apt to be entrapped by them. I was partially dejected by this talk. But I am not a man who would, after having formed any intention, leave it easily. He illustrated his statement by giving example of Mr. Gulam Mahand Munshi. I asked him whether he could help me in any way in getting the scholarship. He answered in the negative. He said he would very gladly do anything except that. I told everything to my brother. Then I was entrusted with the business of receiving the consent of my dear mother, which I thought was not an arduous task for me. After a day or two, my brother and I went to see Mr. Kivalram. There he saw us though he was very busy at that time. We had a talk of the similar kind that I had with him a day or two earlier. He advised my brother to send me to Porbandar. The proposal was agreed to. Then we returned. I began to introduce the subject to my mother in joke. The joke was turned to reality in no time. Then a day was fixed for my going to Porbandar. Twice or thrice I prepared to go, but some difficulty came in my way. 
once I was to go with Zaverkand, but an hour before the time of my departure a serious accident took place. I was always quarreling with my friend Sheikh Metabwan. On the day of departure I was quite engrossed in thinking about the quarrel. He had a musical party at night. I did not enjoy it very well. At about 10.30 p.m., the party ended and we all went to see Meg Jibhai and Rami. On our way I was buried in the madcap thoughts of London on one side and the thoughts of Sheikh Metab on the other. Amidst thoughts, I came unconsciously in contact with a carriage. I received some injury. Yet I did not take the help of anybody in walking. I think I was quite dizzy. Then we entered the house of Major Pai. There I again came. One boyhood friend of Gandhiji whom he tried for several years to reform, but without success. 4. In contact with a stone unknowingly and received injury. I was quite senseless. From that time I did not know what took place, and after that, I am told by them, I fell flat on the ground after some steps. I was not myself for five minutes. They considered I was dead. But fortunately for myself the ground on which I fell was quite smooth. I came to my senses at last and all of them were quite joyful. The mother was sent for. She was very sorry for me, and this caused my delay though I told them that I was quite well. But none would allow me to go, though I afterwards came to know that my bold and dearest mother would have allowed me to go. But she feared the calumny of other people. At last with great difficulty I was allowed to leave Raikot for Porbandar after some days. On my way too I had to encounter some difficulties. At length I reached Porbandar to the joy of all. Lao Pai 1 and Karsondas 2 had come to the Kadi bridge to fetch me home. Now what had I to do in Porbandar was to exact consent from my uncle, and, secondly apply to Mr. Lely 3 to render me some pecuniary help, and last, in case of failure to get the state scholarship, to ask Parmanan Bai for to give me some money. The first thing I did was that I saw uncle and asked him whether he liked my going to London or not. Then, naturally, as I had expected, he asked me to enumerate the advantages of going to London. This I did according to my power. Then he said, of course, the people of this generation would like it very much, but, as for myself, I do not like it. Nevertheless we shall consider afterwards. I was not disappointed by such an answer. At least I had the satisfaction to know that at all events he liked it inwardly and his deed proved what I thought right. Unfortunately for me, Mr. Lely was not in poor Bandar. It is quite true that misfortunes never come single. After his return from the district where he had gone, he was to go at once on leave. My uncle advised me to wait for him till the next Sunday. And if he did not come up during that time, he said, he would send me where he should be. But it gives me much pleasure to write here that he returned from the district on Sunday. Then it was settled that I should see him on Monday. It was done accordingly. For the first time in my life I had an interview with an English gentleman. Formerly I never dared to front them. But thoughts of London made me bold. I had small. One Gandhi's cousin, two Gandhi's elder brother, three British agent in Porbandhar state during the minority of the Prince for Gandhiji's cousin. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 5. Talk with him in Gujarati. He was quite in a hurry. He saw me when he was ascending the ladder of the upper story of his bungalow. He said the poor Bandar state was very poor and could not give me any pecuniary help. However, he said, I should first graduate in India and then he would see if he could render me any help. Indeed such an answer from him quite disappointed me. I did not expect such a reply from him. Now what I had to do was to ask Parman Bai to give me Rs 5000. He said he would very gladly give them if my uncle approved of my going to London. I thought this to be rather a difficult task, yet I was determined upon exacting his consent. I saw him when he was busy doing something, and addressed him thus, Uncle, now tell me what you really think of my going. 
My chief aim in coming here is to exact your consent. Then he replied, I cannot approve of it. Don't you know that I am going on a pilgrimage, and is it not disgraceful on my part to say that I like that people should go to London? However, if your mother and brother like it, I do not at all object to it. But then, I said, you don't know that you prevent Parman and Bai from rendering me pecuniary help by refusing to allow my going to London. Just as I uttered these words, he said in an angry tone, is it so? My dear chap, you don't know why he says so. He knows that I will never approve of your going and so he brings forth this excuse. But the real thing is that he is never to render you any help of the kind. I do not prevent him from doing so. Thus ended our talk. Then I gaily ran off and saw Parman and Bai and word by word related what took place between my uncle and myself. He too was quite angry when he heard this and at the same time made a promise to give me RS 5000. I was quite overjoyed when he made a promise, and what pleased me more was that he swore by his son. Now from that day I began to think that I would surely go to London. Then I stayed some days in poor Bandar and the more I stayed there the more I was assured of the promise. Now here is what took place at Rykot during my absence. My friend Sheikh Metabhu, I should say, is very full of tricks, reminded Major Bhai of his promise and forged a letter with my signature in which he wrote that I stood in need of RS 5000 and so on. The letter was shown to him and it actually passed for a letter written by me. Then, of course, he was quite puffed up and made a solemn promise of giving me RS 5000. I was not informed of this until I reached Rykot. 6. Now to return again to poor Bandar. At length a day was fixed for my departure and I bade farewell to my family members and was set off for Rykot, with my brother Carsondas and Megji's father, really an incarnation of miserliness. Before going to Rykot, I went to Bhavnagar to sell off my furniture, and discontinue the rent of the house. I did it only in one day and was separated from the friends in the neighborhood, not without tears from them and my kind landlady. I should never forget their kindness and that of Anna Prem and others. Having done this, I reached Rykot. But I was to see Colonel Watson one before my departure for three years. He was to come to Rykot on the 19th June. 1888. Indeed it was a long time for me because I reached Rykot in the beginning of May. But I could not help. My brother entertained very high hopes of Colonel Watson. These days were indeed hard days. I could not sleep well at night, was always attacked by dreams. Some persons dissuaded me from going to London and some advised me to do so. Sometimes my mother too asked me not to go and what was very strange that not infrequently my brother also changed his mind. So I was held in suspense. But, as all of them knew that I should not leave off anything having first begun it, they were silent. During the time, I was asked by my brother to sound the mind of Megjibhai about his promise. The result was quite disappointing, of course, and from that time he always acted the part of an enemy. He spoke ill of me before anybody and everybody. But I was quite able to disregard his taunts. My dearest mother was quite angry with him for this and sometimes uneasy. But I could easily console her, and I have the satisfaction to see that I have very often consoled her with success and have made her laugh heartily when she, my dear, dear mother, should be shedding tears on my account. At last Colonel Watson came. I saw him. He said, I shall think about it, but I never got any help from him. I am sorry to say that it was with difficulty that I could take a trivial note of introduction which, he said in a peremptory voice, was worth one lakh of rupees. Now really it makes me laugh. Then a day was fixed for my departure. At first it was the 4th of August. The matter was now brought to a crisis. The fact I was to go to England went through the press. My brother was always asked by some persons about my going. Now was the time when he told me to leave off the intention of going, but I would not do that. Then he, one political agent of Kathianwar, stationed at Rykot. 
Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 7. Saw H.H. that the Corsa had one of Rycott and requested him to render me some pecuniary help. But no help was obtained therefrom. Then for the last time I saw the Corsa had been Colonel Watson. I received a note of introduction from the latter and a photo from the former. Here I must write that the fulsome flattery which I had to practice about this time had quite made me angry. Had it not been for my credulous and dearest brother, I would never have resorted to such a piece of gross flattery. After all, the 10th August came and my brother, Sheikh Metab, Mr. Nabubai, Kasalbai and I started. I left Rykot for Bombay. It was Friday night. I was given an address by my school fellows. I was quite uneasy when I rose up to answer the address too when I spoke half of what I had to speak, I began to shake. I hope I will not do it again when I return to India. Before proceeding further I must write. Many had come to bid me farewell on the night. Messrs. Kavalram, Kaganal Patwari, Vralil, Harishankar, Amolik, Manikshand, Latib, Popat, Panji, Kimji, Ramji, Damodar, Megji, Ramji Kalidas, Naranji, Ran Khadas, Manalil were among those who came to did farewell. Jata Shankar Vishvanath and others may be added. The first station was Gondal. There we saw Dr. Bell and took a purbhai with us. Nabubai came as far as Jetpur. At Dola, Asman Pai met us and he came as far as Wadwan. At Dola, Messrs. Narandas, Prant Shankar, Narbharam, Anandra and Vralil had come to bid farewell. 21st was the day on which I was to leave Bombay. But the difficulties which I had to withstand in Bombay are indescribable. My caste fellows tried their best to prevent me from proceeding further. Almost all of them were in opposition. And at length my brother Kasalbhai and Patwari himself advised me not to go. But I wouldn't give heed to their advice. Then the sea weather was the excuse which delayed my proceeding. My brother and others then left me. But on the sudden I left Bombay on the 4th September 1888. At this time I was very much obliged to Messrs. Jagmohandas, Damodardas and Bechardas. To Shamalji, of course, I owe immense obligation, and what I owe to Rankhadlil III I don't know. It is something more than obligation. Messrs. Jagmohandas, Manshankar, one ruler of the state to vide speech at Alfred High School, Raikot, April 7, 1888. Three Rankhadlil Patwari was very close to Ganthiji with whom he was in correspondence. Patwari's father helped him financially to go to England. 8. Bachardas, Naralandas Patwari, Dwarkadas, Popatlil, Kashidas, Rankhadlil, Modi, Thakur, Ravi Shankar, Faraz Shah, Ratan Shah, Shamalji and some others came to see me off on board the steamer, Clyde. Of these, Patwari gave me RS5, Shamalji as many, Modi 2, Kashidas 1, Narandas 2, and some others whom I forget. Mr. Manshankar gave me a silver chain, and then they all of them bade farewell for three years and departed. Before finishing this, I must write that had it been some other man in the same position which I was in, I dare say he would not have been able to see England. The difficulties which I had to withstand have made England dearer to me than she would have been. September 4, 1888 The Sea Voyage it was about 5 p.m. when the ship weighed anchor. I was very anxious about the voyage but fortunately it agreed with me. Throughout the voyage I was not at all seasick and I had no vomiting. It was for the first time in my life that I sailed in a steamship. I enjoyed the voyage very much. At about 6 o'clock the dinner bell was rung. The steward asked me to go to the table. But I did not go and ate what I had brought with me. I was very much surprised at the liberty which Mr. Masmuter took with me on the first night. He spoke to me in such a manner as if we were very old acquaintances. He had no black coat. So I gave him mine for dinner. He went to the table. From that night I liked him very much. He entrusted his keys to me, 
and I began to look upon him as my elder brother from that very night. There was one Maratha doctor with us as far as Aden. He, on the whole, looked like a good man. Thus for two days I lived upon the sweet meat and fruits which I had on board with me. Then Mr. Masmuter made an agreement with some boys on board to cook us food. I would never have been able to make such an agreement. There was one Abdul Majid who was a first-class passenger while we were saloon passengers. We enjoyed our dinner cooked by the boy. Now something about the steamship. I liked the arrangements of the steamer very much. When we sit in the cabins or saloon, we forget that the cabins and the saloons are a part of the ship. We sometimes do not feel the motion at all. The dexterity of the workmen and the sailors was indeed admirable. There were musical instruments in the steamer. I every now and then played upon the piano. There were cards, chessboard and drafts on the board. The European passengers always played some games at night. The decks are a great relief to the passengers. You are generally tired of sitting in the Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896 9. Cabins On the decks you get fresh air. You can mix with and talk with the fellow passengers if you are bold and have got that stuff. The scene of the sea when the sky is clear is lovely. On one moonlight night I was watching the sea. I could see the moon reflected in the water. On account of the waves, the moon appeared as if she were moving here and there. One dark night when the sky was clear the stars were reflected in the water. The scene around us was very beautiful at that time. I could not at first imagine what that was. They appeared like so many diamonds. But I knew that a diamond could not float. Then I thought that they must be some insects which can only be seen at night. Amidst these reflections I looked at the sky and at once found that it was nothing but stars reflected in waters. I laughed at my folly. This reflection of the stars gives us the idea of fireworks. Fancy yourself to be standing on the story of a bungalow watching the fireworks performed before you. I very often enjoyed this scene. For some days I did not speak a word to the fellow passengers. I always got up at 8 a.m. in the morning, washed my teeth, then went to the W.C. and took my bath. The arrangement of the English water closets astonished a native passenger. We do not get their water and are obliged to use pieces of paper. After enjoying the sea voyage for about five days, we reached Aden. During these days not a single piece of land or a mountain was seen by us. All of us were tired of the monotony of the voyage and were eager to see land. At last on the morning of the sixth day we saw land. All looked gay and cheerful. At about 11 a.m. We anchored at Aden. Some boys came with small boats. They were great swimmers. Some Europeans threw some money in the waters. They went deep into the waters and found out the money. I wish I could do so. This was a pretty sight. We, after enjoying this sight for about half an hour, went to see Aden. I must say here that we simply saw the boys finding out the pieces. Ourselves did not throw a single pie. From this day we began to experience the idea of expenses of England. We were three persons and had to pay two rupees for boat hire. The coast was hardly at a mile's distance. We reached the coast in 15 minutes. Then we hired a carriage. We intended to go to see the waterworks which are the only object of interest in Aden. But, unfortunately, the time being up we could not go there. We saw the camp of Aden. It was good. The buildings were good. They were generally shops. The construction of the buildings was most probably like that of the bungalows in Rikot and especially the new bungalow of the political agent. I could not. 10. See any well or any place of fresh water there. I am afraid that perhaps the tanks are the only place for fresh water. The heat of the sun was excessive. I was quite wet with perspiration. This was because we were not far from the Red Sea. What astonished me more was that I saw not a single tree or a green plant. Men rode on mules or asses. We could hire mules if we liked. 
the camp is situated on the hill. I heard from the boatmen, when we returned, that the boys of whom I wrote above are sometimes injured. The legs of some and arms of others are cut off by sea animals. But still the boys, being very poor, sat each in their small boats in which we dare not sit. Each of us had to pay one rupee for the carriage fare. The anchor was weighed at 12 a.m. and we left Aden. But from this day we always saw some land. In the evening we entered the Red Sea. We began to feel the heat. But I don't think it was so scorching, as is described by some in Bombay. Indeed it was unbearable in the cabins. You cannot expose yourself to the sun. You will not like to stay even for a few minutes in your cabin. But if you are on the deck you are sure to receive pleasant gales of fresh air. At least I did so. Almost all the passengers slept on the deck and so did I. The heat of the new morning sun, too, you cannot bear. You are always safe when you are on the deck. This heat we generally get for three days. Then we entered the sewers on the fourth night. We could see the lamps in the sewers from a great distance. The Red Sea was sometimes broad and sometimes quite narrow. So narrow that we can see the land on both the sides. Before entering the Suez Canal we passed the Hell's Gate. Hell's Gate is a strip of water very narrow, bound on both the sides by hills. It is so called because many ships are wrecked at that place. We saw the wreck of a ship in the Red Sea. We stayed at Suez for about half an hour. Now it was said that we shall receive cold. Some said that you will require liquor after leaving Aden. But it was false. Now I had begun to talk a little with the fellow passengers. They said, after leaving Aden you will require meat, but it was not so. For the first time in my life I saw the electric light in the front of our ship. It appeared like moonlight. The front part of the ship appeared very beautiful. I think it must appear more beautiful to a man seeing it, placed on some other place, just as we cannot enjoy the beauty of our person as others, that is, we cannot see it to advantage. The construction of the Suez Canal I am not able to understand. It is indeed marvelous. I cannot think of the genius of a man who invented it. I don't know how he would have done it. It is quite right to say that he has competed with nature. It is not an easy. Volume 1, 1884 30 November, 1896. 11. Task to join two seas. Only one ship can pass through the canal at a time. It requires skillful pilot ship. The ship sails at a very low motion. We cannot feel its motion. The water of the canal is quite dirty. I forget its depth. It is as broad as the Aji one at Ramnath. You can see men passing by on both the sides. The part near the canal is barren. The canal belongs to the French. Another pilot comes from Ismailia to direct the ship. The French take a certain sum of money for every ship that passes through the canal. The income must be very large. Besides the electric lamp in the ship, there are seen lights at a distance of some 20 feet on both sides. These are the lights of different colors. The ship has to pass these rows of lights. It takes about 24 hours to pass through the canal. The beauty of the scene is beyond my power to describe. You cannot enjoy it unless you see it. Port Said is the terminus of the canal. Port Said owes its existence to the Suez Canal. We anchored at Port Said in the evening. The ship was to stay there for an hour, but one hour was quite sufficient to see Port Said. Now the currency was English. Indian money is quite useless here. The boat fare is six pence each. A penny is worth one anna. The construction of the port said building is French. Here we get an idea of the French life. There we saw some coffee restaurants. At the first I thought it was a theater. But it was nothing but a coffee house. On one side we drink coffee or soda or tea or any drink, and on the other we hear music. Some women are playing fiddle bands. A bottle of lemonade in these cafes as they are called, will cost you 12 pence, which we get for less than a penny in Bombay. Customers are said to hear music gratis.
but really it is not so. As soon as the music is finished, a woman, with a plate covered with a handkerchief in her hand comes before every customer. That means that you give her something and we are obliged to give something. We visited the cafe and gave sixpence to the woman. Port said is nothing but a seat of luxury. Their women and men are very cunning. The interpreter will follow to guide you. But you boldly tell him that you do not want him. Port said is hardly as big as the proper para two of Rycott. We left Port said at 7 p.m. Among our fellow passengers one Mr. Jeffries was very kind to me. He always told me to go to the table and take something there, but I would not go. He said, after leaving Brindisi you will feel cold, one river near Rycott to locality. 12. But it was not so. After three days we reached Brindisi at night. The harbor of Brindisi is beautiful. The steamer just touches the coast and you descend to the coast by means of a ladder provided there. It being dark I could not see Brindisi much. There everyone speaks Italian. Roads of Brindisi are paved with stones. The streets are sloping. They too are paved. Gas is used for lamps. We saw the station of Brindisi. It was not so beautiful as the stations of the B, B, and C, I, R, L, Y. But the railway carriages were far bigger than ours. The traffic was good. When you land at Brindisi, a man would come and ask you, in case you are a black man, Sir, there is a beautiful girl of fourteen, follow me, sir, and I will take you there, the charge is not high, sir. You are at once puzzled. But be calm and answer boldly that you don't want her and tell the man to go away and thereby you will be safe. If you are in any difficulty at once refer to a policeman just near you, or at once enter a large building which you will surely see. But before you enter it, read the name on the building and make sure that it is open to all. Thus you will be safe. This you will be able to make out at once. Tell the porter there that you are in a difficulty and he will at once show you what you should do. If you are bold enough, ask the porter to take you to the chief officer and you will refer the matter to him. By a large building I mean that it must be belonging to Thomas Cook or Henry King or some such other agents. They will take care of you. Don't be miserly at that time. Pay the porter something. But this means is to be resorted to when you think yourself to be in any danger but these buildings you will only see on the coasts. If you are far away from the coast you are to find out a policeman and in case of failure, your conscience is the best dictator. We left Brindisi early in the morning. After about three days we reached Malta. The ship anchored at about 2 p.m. She was to stay there for nearly four hours. Mr. Abdul Majid was to come with us. But somehow or other he was very late. I was quite impatient to go. Mr. Masmuter said, Shall we go alone and not wait for Mr. Majid? I said, Just as you please. I've no objection. Then, of course, we went alone. On our return Abdul Majid saw us and said he was very sorry that we went away. Then Mr. Mazumdar said, It was Gandhi who was impatient and told me not to wait for you. I was really very much offended by such behavior of Mr. Masmuter. I did not try to wash off the charge but silently accepted it. But I know that the charge would have been washed off, had I only hinted to Abdul Majid, had Mr. Masmuter really wanted to wait for you, he had better not act according to what I said. And I. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 13 think this would have been quite sufficient to convince Mr. Abdul Majid of my having no hand in the doing. But at that time I did not mean to do anything of the kind. But from that day I began to entertain very low opinion about Mr. Masmuter, and from that day I had no real respect for him. Besides there happened two or three things which made me like Masmuter the less day by day. Malta is an object of interest. There are many things to see. But the time at our disposal was not sufficient. As I said before, Mr. Masmuter and myself went to the coast. Here we had received a great rogue. 
we had to suffer a great loss. We took the number of the boat, and to see the city we hired a carriage. The rogue was with us. After driving for about half an hour, we reached St. Juan Church. The church was beautifully built. There we saw some skeletons of eminent persons. They were very old. We gave a shilling to the friend who showed us over the church. Just opposite the church was a statue of St. Juan. Thence drove to the city. The roads were paved. On both sides of the pavement were paved walks for men. The island is very beautiful. There are many grand buildings. Went to see the Armory Hall. This hall was beautifully decorated. There we saw very old paintings. They were not really paintings but embroidered in. But a stranger would not perceive that it was embroidered work unless told by somebody. In the hall were the arms of old warriors. All of them were worth seeing. Having no record, I do not remember them all. There was a helmet which was thirty pounds in weight. The carriage of Napoleon Bonaparte was very beautiful. Having given a tip of six D to the man who showed us over the hall we returned. We were obliged to take off our hats when we saw the church and the armory hall, as a token of respect. Then we went to the shop of the rogue. He tried to force something upon us. But we wouldn't buy anything. At length Mr. Mesmuter bought the views of Malta for two slash six. Here the rogue gave us an interpreter and himself did not come with us. The interpreter was a very good man. He drove us to the orange gardens. We saw the gardens. I did not like the gardens at all. I like our public park of Rycott better than the gardens. If there was anything worth seeing for me. It was the golden and red fishes in a small enclosure of water. Thence we returned to the town, went to a hotel. Mr. Mesmuter took some potatoes and tea. On our way we met an Indian. Mr. Mesmuter being a very bold man spoke to the Indian. On further talk with him it was understood that he was the brother of a man who had a shop in Malta. We at once went to the shop. Mr. Mesmuter had a 14. Good chat with the shopkeeper. We made some purchases there and spent two hours in the shop. So we could not see much of Malta. We saw another church. That too was very beautiful and worth seeing. We had to see the opera house but we had no time to do that. We took leave of the gentleman who gave Mr. Mesmuter his card to his brother in London. On our return, the rogue again met us and came with us at 6 p.m. We reached the coast and paid the rogue, the good interpreter and the carriageman. We had a quarrel about the fare with the boatman. The result was, of course, in favor of the boatman. Here we were treated a good deal. The steamer Clyde left at 7 p.m. After three days' voyage we reached Gibraltar at 12 p.m. The ship remained there the whole night. I had a good mind to see Gibraltar. So got up early in the morning and awakened Mesmuter and asked him whether he would come with me to the shore or not. He said he would. Then I went to Mr. Majid and awoke him. We three went to the shore. The time at our disposal was only eleven halves hours. It being the dawn of the day all the shops were shut. It is said that Gibraltar being a free port smoking is very cheap. Gibraltar is built upon a rock. On the top is the fortification which to our great sorrow we could not see. The houses are in rows. In order to go from the first row to the second, we are obliged to ascend certain steps. I liked it very much. The construction was beautiful. Roads were paved. Having no time we were soon obliged to return. The ship weighed anchor at 8.30 a.m. In three days we reached Plymouth at 11 p.m. Now was the proper time for cold. Each and every passenger said that we would die without meat and drink but nothing of the kind happened to us. Indeed it was pretty well cold. We were also told about the storm but could not see the storm. Really I was very anxious to see it but could not. It being night we could see nothing of Plymouth. We had dense fog there. At length the ship left for London. In 24 hours we reached London. 
left the steamer and reached Victoria Hotel Viaduct Tilbury Station on the 27th 1 October, 1888, at 4 p.m. 27th 2 October, 1888, Saturday, T.O. 23rd November, Friday Mr. Ms. Muter, Mr. Abdul Majid and I reached the Victoria Hotel. Mr. Abdul Majid told in a dignified air to the porter of the one the source has 28th which was a Sunday. Evidently this is a slip. In an autobiography, P.T. I. C. H. X. I. 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 Gan P. G. says he arrived in London on the Saturday, which fell on October 27th. To Ibid. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 15. Victoria Hotel to give our cabman the proper fare. Mr. Abdul Majid thought very highly of himself, but let me write here that the dress which he had put on was perhaps worse than that of the porter. He did not take care of the luggage too, and as if he had been in London for a long time, stepped into the hotel. I was quite dazzled by the splendor of the hotel. I had never in my life seen such pomp. My business was simply to follow the two friends in silence. There were electric lights all over. We were admitted into a room. There Mr. Majid at once went. The manager at once asked him whether he would choose second floor or not. Mr. Majid thinking it below his dignity to inquire about the daily rent said yes. The manager at once gave us a bill of sixes. Each per day and a boy was sent with us. I was all the while smiling within myself. Then we were to go to the second floor by a lift. I did not know what it was. The boy at once touched something which I thought was lock of the door. But as I afterwards came to know it was the bell and he rang in order to tell the waiter to bring the lift. The doors were opened and I thought that was a room in which we were to sit for some time. But to my great surprise we were brought to the second floor. Incomplete 5. Draft of letter to Frederick Lely one London, December, 1888 DEARSIR you will know me by looking at the note which, you said, when I had the opportunity of seeing you, you would preserve. At that time I had requested you to render to me some pecuniary aid as a means to enable me to proceed to England. But unfortunately you were in a hurry to leave. So I had not the sufficient time to say all that I had to say. I was at that time very impatient to proceed to England. So I left India on the 4th of September. 1888, with what little money I had at that time. What my father left for us three brothers was indeed very little. However, trusting that nearly sixty-six, which was all my brother could with great difficulty spare for me, would be sufficient for my three years' stay in London. I left India for receiving legal education in England. I knew while in India that education and living in London were very expensive. But now from two months' experience in one Gandhiji sent this to his elder brother, Lakshmidas Gandhi. 16. London, I find that they are more so than they appeared to be in India. In order to live here comfortably and to receive good education, I shall require an extra help of OO. I am a native of Porbandar and as such that is the only place I can look up to for such help. During the late rule of H. H. the Rana Sahib, very little encouragement was given to education. But we can naturally expect that education must be encouraged under the English administration. I am one who can take advantage of such encouragement. I hope, therefore, that you may please render me some pecuniary help and thereby confer great and much needed obligation on me. I have asked my brother Lakshmidas Gandhi to receive it and am sending him a note to see you in person if necessary. Trusting you will be induced to grant my request. With best respects, I beg to remain, yours, M. K. Gandhi. I prepared this draft of a letter three weeks ago and have been thinking over it ever since. Believing that a reply to this letter will come in the meantime I am sending you the draft. I have not asked for the whole amount, as it would be unreasonable. Again he may think that if I had been absolutely dependent upon his help, I would not have proceeded to England without making sure of it. But having found on arrival here that I shall need more funds, I have asked for only the additional amount. I have not offered to bind myself in any way, 
because I did not think it necessary. Nor did I feel that it was proper to bind myself for an amount which will cover only part of my expenses. Besides, if... Point 1. Incomplete Mahatma, Vol. I. Also from a photostat. 1. This covering note, originally written in Gujarati, was addressed to Lakshmidas Gandhi while forwarding the draft to him. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 17. 6. Letter to Call. J. W. Watson. Colonel J. W. Watson Political Agent Kathy Awa. December, 1888. Dear S.I.R., it is about six or seven weeks since I landed in this country. By this time, I am comfortably settled and have fairly begun my studies. I have joined the Inner Temple for my legal course. You are well aware that English life is very expensive and, from what little experience I have had of it, I find that it is more so than I could persuade myself to believe while I was in India. My means as you know are very limited. I don't think I can go through a course of three years satisfactorily without some extraneous help. When I remember that you took a great deal of interest in my father and had extended your hand of friendship to him, I have very little doubt that you will take the same interest in what concerns him and I feel confident that you will try your best to procure me some substantial help which would facilitate my course of study in this country. You will thus confer a great and much needed obligation upon me. I saw Dr. Butler a few days ago. He is very kind to me and has promised to give me all assistance he can. The weather so far has not been very severe. I am doing very well. With best respects, I beg to remain, dear sir, yours faithfully, M. K. Gandhi. Mahatma, Vol. I. Also from a photostat. 7. Indian vegetarians I India is inhabited by 25 million one of people of various castes and creeds. The very common belief among the Englishmen who have not been to India, or who have taken very little interest in. 1. Obviously, a slip for crores. 18. Indian matters, is that all the Indians are born vegetarians. Now this is true only in part. Indian people are divided into three main divisions, viz, the Hindus, the Mohammedans, and the Parsis. The Hindus are again divided into four chief castes, viz, the Brahmins, the Kshatriyas, the Vaisyas, and the Sudras. Of all these, in theory, only the Brahmins and the Vaisyas are pure vegetarians. But in practice almost all the Indians are vegetarians. Some are so voluntarily and others compulsorily. The latter, though always willing to take, are yet too poor to buy meat. This statement will be borne out by the fact that there are thousands in India who have to live on one pies 11 slash d a day. These live on bread and salt, a heavily taxed article. 3. For even in a poverty-stricken country like India, it will be very difficult, if not utterly impossible, to get eatable flesh meat for 11 slash d. 3. The question who are vegetarians in India being disposed of, the natural question will be what is vegetarianism as practiced by them? To begin with, Indian vegetarianism does not mean the VEM1 diet. The Indians, that is, the Indian vegetarians, decline to take, besides fish, flesh and fowl, eggs, for they argue that to eat an egg is equivalent to killing life. Since an egg, if left undisturbed would, prima facie, become a fowl. But, unlike some of the vegetarian extremists here, they not only do not abstain from milk and butter, but consider them sacred enough to be used on what are called fruit days, which occur every fortnight, and which are generally observed by the Haikas Hindus. Because, as they put it, they do not kill the cow in taking milk from her. And certainly the milking of a cow, which, by the way, has been the subject of painting and poetry cannot shock the most delicate feelings as would the slaughtering of her. It may be worth mentioning and passant that the cow is an object of worship among the Hindus, and a movement set on foot to prevent the cows from being shipped off for the purposes of slaughter is progressing rapidly. The Vegetarian, July 2, 1891-8 
Indian vegetarians II Indian vegetarians food generally varies with the parts they live in. Thus in Bengal the staple article of food is rice, while in the Bombay presidency it is wheat. 1 vn probably means vegetables, eggs, milk. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 19. All the Indians generally and the grown-up persons particularly, and among them the high caste Hindus ache two meals a day with a glass or two of water between the meals whenever they feel thirsty. The first meal they take at about 10 a.m., which would correspond to the English dinner, and the second meal at about 8 p.m., which would correspond to supper so far as the name goes, though in reality, it is a substantial meal. From the above it will have been seen that there is no breakfast hitch, seeing that the Indians generally rise at 6 o'clock, and even as early as 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, they would seem to require or the ordinary midday meal. Some of the readers will no doubt wonder how the Indians go about without anything to eat for nine hours after their first meal. This may be explained in two ways, viz. First, the habit is second nature. Their religion commands some, and employment or custom compels others, to take not more than two meals in one day. Secondly, the climate of India, which except in some parts is very hot, will account for the habit. For even in England, it appears that the same quantity of food is not required in summer as in winter. Unlike the English, the Indians do not take each dish separately, but they mix many things together. Among some of the Hindus it is one of the requirements of their religion to mix all their food together. Moreover, every dish is elaborately prepared. In fact they don't believe in plain boiled vegetables, but must have them flavored with plenty of condiments, for example, pepper, salt, cloves, turmeric, mustard seed, and various other things for which it would be difficult to find English names unless they be those used in medicine. The first meal consists generally of bread or rather cakes of which more hereafter own pulse, for example, peas, haricot beans, etc., and two or three green vegetables cooked together, or separately, followed by rice and pulse cooked in water, and flavored with various spices. After this, some take milk and rice, or simply milk, or curdled milk, or even whey, especially in summer. The second meal, that is, the supper, consists of much the same things as the first one, but the quantity is less and the vegetables fewer at this meal. Milk is more liberally used at this meal. The reader should be reminded that this is not the food that the Indians invariably use nor should he think that the above will be the typical dishes all over India and among all classes. Thus, for example, no sweets are mentioned in the specimen meals while they are sure to be used among the well-to-do classes at least once a week. Moreover, while, as 20 said above, wheat preponderates over rice in the Bombay presidency, in Bengal rice gets the better of wheat. So also with regard to the third exception which must prove the rule, the food among the laboring class is different from what is given above. To mention all the varieties would be the fill-up volumes and to do so would, it is to be feared, divest the article of all interest. Butter, or if you please, clarified butter, is much more used for culinary purposes than in England or, it may be, even in Europe. And according to a doctor of some authority, if it would do no good, much use of better, in a hot climate like that of India would do no harm such as it might do in a cold climate like that of England. It will perhaps strike the reader that the fruit, yes, the only important fruit, is sadly conspicuous by its absence in the above mentioned specimen dishes. Some, among many of the reasons, are that the Indians do not know the proper value of fruit, that the poor people cannot afford to buy good fruit, and that good fruit is not available all over India, except in large cities. Indeed, there are certain fruits, not to be found here which are used by all classes in India. But alas, these are used as superficial things, not as food, and no one knows their value chemically, because no one takes the trouble to analyze them. The Vegetarian, February 14, 1891 9. Indian vegetarians e in the previous article more hereafter was promised about the cakes. These cakes are generally made of wheat flour. 
Wheat is first ground in a hand mill simple contrivance to reduce the wheat to powder not a mill requiring machinery. This powdered wheat is passed through a sieve with large holes, so that the coarsest bran is left out. Indeed, among the poor classes it is not passed through the sieve at all. Thus the flour, though not the same as that used by the vegetarians here, is far superior to the ordinary flour that is used here for the much abused white bread. Some clarified butter, that is, butter boiled and passed through a sieve sometimes a useless process when the butter is quite pure and then allowed to become cool say a teaspoonful to a pound of flour as mixed with the flour, a sufficient quantity of water is poured on it, and then it is kneaded with the hands until it forms itself into one homogeneous mass. This lump is divided into small equal parts, each as big as a tangerine. These are rolled into thin circular pieces about 6 inches in diameter with a wooden stick made specially for the purpose. Each piece is separately and Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896 21. Thoroughly baked in a flat dish. It takes from 5 to 7 minutes to bake one cake. This cake is eaten while hot with butter and has a very nice flavor. It may be, and is, eaten even quite cold. What meat is to the ordinary Englishman, the cake is to the Indian, be he a vegetarian or a meat eater, for in India a meat eater does not, in the writer's opinion, regard his meat as an absolute necessity, but takes it rather as a side dish to help him, so to speak, in eating the cakes. Such an outline, and only an outline, is the ordinary food of a well-to-do Indian vegetarian. Now a question may be asked, has not the British rule affected any change in the habits of the Indian people? So far as the food and drink are concerned yes, and no. No, because ordinary men and women have stuck to their original food and the number of meals. Yes, because those who have learnt a little bit of English have picked up English ideas here and there, but this change too whether it is for the worse or for the better must be left to the reader to judge as not very perceptible. The last mentioned class have begun to believe in breakfast, which usually consists of a cup or two of tea. Now this brings us to the question of drink. The drinking of tea and coffee by the so-called educated Indians, chiefly due to the British rule, may be passed over with the briefest notice. The most that tea and coffee can do is to cause a little extra expense, and general debility of health when indulged in to excess. But one of the most greatly felt evils of the British rule is the importation of alcohol had enemy of mankind, that curse of civilization in some form or another. The measure of the evil wrought by this borrowed habit will be properly gauged by the reader when he is told that the enemy has spread throughout the length and breadth of India, in spite of the religious prohibition. For even the touch of a bottle containing alcohol pollutes the Mohammedan, according to his religion and the religion of the Hindu strictly prohibits the use of alcohol in any form whatever, and yet, alas, the government, it seems, instead of stopping, are aiding and abetting the spread of alcohol. The poor there, as everywhere, are the greatest sufferers. It is they who spend what little they earn in buying alcohol instead of buying food and other necessities. It is that wretched poor man who has to starve his family who has to break the sacred trust of looking after his children, if any, in order to drink himself into misery and premature death. Here be it said to the credit of Mr. Kane 1, the ex-member for Barrow, that he, undaunted, is still carrying on his admirable crusade against the spread of the evil, but what can the energy of one man, however powerful, do against the inaction of an apathetic and dormant government? The Vegetarian, February 21, 1891 22. 10. Indian vegetarians IV After having known who are vegetarians in India, and what they generally eat, the reader will be able to judge from the following facts how hollow and baseless are the arguments advanced by some people regarding the weak constitutions of the vegetarian Hindus. One thing often said about the Indian vegetarians is that they are physically very feeble, and that, therefore, vegetarianism is not compatible with bodily strength. Now, if it can be proved that generally in India the vegetarians are as strong as, if not stronger than, the Indian meat-eaters, and for that matter even Englishmen, and moreover, 
that where weakness exists it can be ascribed to many other reasons than that of non-flesh diet, the whole structure on which the above argument is based falls to the ground. It must at the outset be admitted that the Hindus as a rule are notoriously weak. But an unbiased person meat eater who knows India and her people even superficially will tell you that there are many other causes incessantly at work to account for the proverbial one weakness. One of the most important reasons, if not the most important one, is the wretched custom of infant marriages and its attendant evils. Generally, children when they reach the great age of nine are burdened with the fetters of married life. In many cases they are married at a still younger age and in some cases they are betrothed while yet unborn. Thus one woman would promise to marry her child, if male, to another's of female, and vice versa. Of course in the two latter cases consummation does not take place before they are 10 or 11 years old. Cases are recorded in which a wife of 12 had a child by a husband of 16 or 17. Will not these marriages tell upon the strongest constitutions? Now fancy how weak the progeny of such marriages must be. Then look at the care such a couple have to undergo. Suppose a boy of 11 is married to a girl of about the same age. Thus at a time when the boy should be, and is, ignorant of what it is to be a husband, he has a wife forced on him. He is, of course, attending his school. In 1 William Sproston Kane 1842-1903 Four times member of British Parliament Serve on the Indian Parliamentary Subcommittee of the British Committee of the Congress Supported self-government for India Was nearly interested in South Indians' cause Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896 23 Addition to the drudgery at school he has his child wife to look after he has not actually to maintain her, for in India a son when married does not necessarily separate from his parents unless he be at sixes and sevens one with them. But he has to do everything short of that. Then about six years after marriage he has a son, probably he has not yet finished his studies, and he has to think of earning money not only to maintain himself but his wife and child, for he cannot expect to pass his whole life with his father, and even granting that he may he should certainly be expected to contribute something towards his wife's and his child's maintenance. Will not the mere knowledge of his duty prey upon his mind and thus undermine his health? Can anyone dare to say that this will not shatter the most robust constitution? But one may well argue that if that boy, in the above example, had eaten flesh meat he would have kept stronger than he did. A reply to such an argument is to be found from those Kshatriya princes who in spite of their meat diet are very weak owing to debauchery. Then the shepherds in India afford a good example of how strong an Indian vegetarian can be where other opposite agencies are not at work. An Indian shepherd is a finely built man of Herculean constitution. He, with his thick, strong cudgel, would be a match for any ordinary European with his sword. Cases are recorded of shepherds having killed or driven away tigers and lions with their cudgels. But, said a friend one day, this is an example of men living in the rude and natural state. In the present highly artificial state of society you require something more than mere cabbage and peas. Your shepherd lacks intelligence, he reads no book, etc. etc. The one and only answer to this was, and is that the vegetarian shepherd would be equal to, if not more than a match for, a meat-eating shepherd. Thus there is a comparison between vegetarian of one class and a meat-eater of the same class. It is a comparison between strength and strength, and not between strength and strength plus intelligence, for my attempt for the moment is simply to disprove that Indian vegetarians are physically weak on account of their vegetarianism. Eat what food you will, it is impossible it seems, to make physical and mental strength go together except, perhaps, in rare cases. The law of compensation will require that what is gained in mental power must be lost in bodily power. A Samson cannot be a. One Ganthiji perhaps means at variance. 24. Gladstone. And granting the argument that a substitute is required for vegetables in the present state of society, is it conclusively proved that flesh or meat is that substitute? 
then take the case of the Kshatriyas, the so-called warlike race in India. They are, of course, meat-eaters and how few of them there are who have wielded a sword. Far be it from me to say that they as a race are very weak. So long as Prathari I and Bintu and all of their type ought to go to the older times re-remembered, he will be a fool who would have it believed that they are a weak race. But now it is a sad fact that they have degenerated. The truly warlike people, among others, are the people of the northwestern provinces, known as Bias Three. They subsist on wheat, pulse, and grains. They are the guardians of peace, they are largely employed in the native armies. From the above facts it is easy to see that vegetarianism is not only not injurious, but on the contrary is conducive to bodily strength and that attributing the Hindu weakness to vegetarianism is simply based on a fallacy. The Vegetarian, February 28, 1891-11 Indian Vegetarians v. We saw in the last article that the bodily weakness of the Hindu vegetarians was attributable to other causes than their diet and also that the shepherds who were vegetarians were as strong as meat-eaters, this shepherd being a very good specimen of a vegetarian, we may with profit examine his way of living. But before proceeding further, the reader may be told that what follows does not apply to all the Indian shepherds. It applies to the shepherds of a certain part of India. Just as the habits of the people in Scotland would be different from those of the people in England, so also would the habits of the people living in one part of India be different from those of the people living in another part. The Indian shepherd then gets up generally at five o'clock in the morning. The first thing he does, if he is a pious shepherd, is to offer one Prithvirai Chauhan, 11th century king claiming descent from the sun. Famed for his physical prowess two second of the Pandava princes, in the Mahabharata, reputed for his great stature and strength. 3. The references to the Bay is literally, brothers, a name originally given to the peasantry of Uttar Pradesh. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 25. Some prayers to his God. Then he does his toilet which consists of washing his mouth and face. I may be allowed here to digress for a while to acquaint the reader with the brush an Indian uses for his teeth. The brush is nothing more than a branch of a thorny tree called babel. One branch is cut up into pieces about a foot long. Of course, all the thorns are removed. The Indian crushes one end of the stick between his teeth till it is soft enough to brush his teeth. Thus he makes for himself every day a new and homemade brush. When he has well brushed his teeth and made them pearl white he splits the stick into two, and after bending one part into a curve scrapes his tongue. This process of brushing probably accounts for the strong and beautiful teeth of the average Indian. It is perhaps superfluous to add that he uses no tooth powder. Old persons when their teeth are not strong enough to crush the stick use a small hammer. The whole process does not take more than 20 or 25 minutes. To return to the shepherd, he then takes his breakfast consisting of a thick cake made of millet an Anglo-Indian name for bajari a kind of corn much used in India instead of, or in addition to, wheat clarified butter and molasses. At about 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning he goes to pasture the cattle placed under his superintendence. The place of pasture is generally two or three miles from his town. It is hilly tract of land studded with a green carpet of luxuriant foliage. Thus he has the unique advantage of enjoying the free chesm air with natural scenery thrown in. While the cattle are roaming about, he whiles away his time in singing or talking to his companion who may be his wife, brother or some other relation. At about twelve o'clock he takes his lunch, which he always carries with him. It consists of the ever-present cakes, clarified butter, one vegetable, or some pulse, or instead, or in addition, some pickle and fresh milk directly taken from the cow. Then at about two or three o'clock he not infrequently takes a nap for about half an hour under some shady tree. This short sleep gives him relief from the heat of the scorching sun. At six he returns home, at seven he has supper, for which he takes some hot cakes, pulse or vegetables, winds up with rice and milk, or rice and whey. After doing some household business, which often means a pleasant chat with the family members, he goes to bed at ten o'clock. 
he sleeps either in the open air, or in a hut which is sometimes overcrowded. He resorts to the hut in winter or in the rainy season. It may be worthy of remark that these huts, even though miserable in appearance and often without any windows, are not air. 26. Tight. Being constructed in a rude state, their doors are made, not as a protection against drafts of wind, but against burglars. It cannot, however, be denied that there is much room for improvement in the huts. Such, then, is the living of a well-to-do shepherd. His, in many respects, is an ideal mode of life. He is perforce regular in his habits, is out of doors during the greater part of his time, while out he breathes the purest air, has his due amount of exercise, has good and nourishing food and last but not least, is free from many cares which are frequently productive of weak constitutions. The Vegetarian, July 3, 1891-12 Indian Vegetarians vi The only flaw that can be found in his mode of living is the paucity of baths. In a hot climate baths are very useful. While a Brahmin would have his bath twice a day, and a Vaisya once a day, a shepherd would have only one bath a week. I shall here again digress to explain the manner in which the Indian takes his baths. Generally, he has his baths in the river flowing near his town, but if he is too idle to go to the river, or is afraid of being drowned, or if there is no river near his town, he has his baths at home. There is no bath into which he can plunge. He takes water from a large vessel, placed near him, with a goblet and pours it over his body, because he believes that the moment you plunge into stagnant water you render it impure and, therefore, unfit for further use. For the same reason he would not even wash his hands in a basin, but have someone to pour it over his hands or do it himself by holding the goblet between his arms. But to return, the paucity of the baths does not, it seems, materially affect his health. While it is obvious that if the Brahmin were to go without his baths even for a day, he would feel very uncomfortable, and if he were to continue not taking them a little longer, he would very soon become ill. This is, I suppose, an instance of many things which, otherwise inexplicable, can be accounted for by habit. Thus while a scavenger, in pursuing his employment keeps good health, any ordinary person trying to do the same will be face to face with death. Death would soon be knocking at the door of a delicately nurtured lord trying to. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 27. Imitate an East End laborer. I cannot help here giving a fable or anecdote which is exactly to the point. A king fell in love with a female toothbrush seller, who was a very Venus in beauty. As might naturally be expected she was ordered to be placed in the king's palace. She was, in fact, placed in the lap of luxury. She had the best food, the best clothes, in short, everything of the best. And lo! In proportion to the luxury, her health began to fall. Scores of physicians were in attendance, but all the drugs most regularly administered proved of no avail. Meanwhile a shrewd physician found out the real cause of all the illness. He said that she was possessed by evil spirits. Therefore, in order to satisfy them, he ordered some pieces of old cakes to be set, together with fruit in each of her many rooms. They were to disappear in as many days as there were rooms, and with them, he said, the illness would disappear. And it was so. Of course the cakes were consumed by the poor queen. Now this shows the mastery that habit gets over men. So I think the paucity of baths does not greatly harm the shepherd. The result of this mode of living was partially noticed in the last article, viz., the vegetarian shepherd is physically strong. He is also long-lived. I know a shepherdess who was more than 100 years old in 1888. When I last saw her, her eyesight was very good. Her memory was fresh. She could recollect things that she had seen in her childhood. She could walk with a stick to support her. I hope she is still living. Besides, the shepherd's figure is symmetrical. It is very rare to see any deformity in him. Without being fierce like a tiger, he is yet strong and brave and as docile as a lamb. Without being awe-inspiring, 
his stature is commanding. Altogether, the Indian Shepherd is a very fine specimen of a vegetarian, and will compare very favorably with any meat eater so far as bodily strength goes. The Vegetarian, March 14, 1891 13. Some Indian festivals I at this Easter time I should have liked to write something on the holidays which correspond to the Easter in point of time. But these holidays with their painful associations not being the greatest Hindu festival may very properly give way to the Diwali holidays which are far superior in importance and grandeur to the former. 28. Diwali, which may be termed the Hindu Christmas, occurs at the end of the Hindu year, that is, during the month of November. It is both a social and religious holiday. It spreads over nearly a month. The first day of the month of Ashwin the twelfth month of the Hindu year heralds the approach of the Gram festival when the children let off their first fireworks. The first nine days are called Nava Ratri nine nights. These days are chiefly marked by Garbis. Some twenty or thirty, and even more people form themselves into a large circle. In the center is placed a huge lamp post tastefully constructed and illuminated all round, in the center also sits a man with his tabors reciting some popular verses. The people forming the circle repeat the verses, keeping time to them with claps of hands. While repeating the verses, they move round the lamp post, at the same time stooping down in a half-bending posture. It is very often a great treat to hear these garbis. It may be remarked that girls such less women ever take part in them. Of course they may have their own garbage where men would be excluded. In some families the custom of half-fasting prevails. It is sufficient if only one member of the family fasts. The fasting man has only one meal a day, and that, too, in the evening. Moreover, he is not allowed any corn or pulse, but is restricted to fruit milk and root vegetables such as potatoes, etc. The tenth day of the month is called Dashara, when friends meet and feast one another. It is also customary to make presents of sweets to one's friends and especially patrons or superiors. Except on the Dashara holiday all the amusements are carried on at night, while the ordinary daily pursuits are attended to in the daytime. After Dashara everything is comparatively quiet for about a fortnight except that the ladies are making preparations for the approaching grand day, by cooking and baking sweets, cakes, etc. 4. In India, women of the highest class would not mind cooking. In fact, it is an accomplishment which every lady is supposed to possess. Thus, spending the evenings in feasting and singing, we reach the thirteenth day of the dark half of the month Ashwin. In India every month is divided into two parts, the dark half and the bright half, the full moon day and the new moon day being starting points. Thus, the day following the full moon day is the first day of the dark half of a month, and so on. The thirteenth day and the three following days are wholly devoted to amusements and enjoyment. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 29. The 13th day is called Danteras, that is, the thirteenth day set apart for the worship of Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth. Rich people collect different kinds of jewels, precious stones, coins, etc., and put them carefully into a box. These they never use for any other purpose than that of worship. Each year an addition is made to this collection. The worship, that is, the external worship or who, save a select few, is there who does not at heart covet, or in other words, Worship money? Consists in washing the money with water and milk, and then decorating it with flowers and kumkum, that is, red ochre. The fourteenth day is called Kali Chaudash. But this day people get up before the break of day, and even the laziest person is required to take a good bath. The mother even compels her little children to take a bath, though it is the winter season. On the night of Kali Chaudash, Cemeteries are supposed to be visited by a procession of ghosts. Persons affecting to believe in ghosts would go to these places to see their ghost friends. Timid ones would not stir out of their houses lest they should see a ghost. The Vegetarian, March 28, 1891-14 Some Indian Festivals I.I. Budlow
now is the morning of the fifteenth day, Diwali proper. The greatest fireworks are let off on the Diwali day. No one is willing to part with his money on this day. He will neither borrow nor lend. All the purchases are supposed to have been finished the previous day. You are standing near the corner of a public road. Mark the shepherd trotting onward in his milk-white suit, worn for the first time, with his long beard turned up beside his face and fastened under his turban, singing some broken verses. A herd of cows, with their horns painted red and green and mounted with silver, follows him. Soon after you see a crowd of little maids, with small earthen vessels resting on cushions placed on their heads. You wonder what those vessels contain. Your doubt is soon solved by the careless maid spilling some milk from her vessel. Then observe that big man with white whiskers and a big white turban, with a long reed pen thrust into his turban. He has a long scarf wound round his waist with a silver inkstand adjusted in the scarf. He, you must know, is a great banker. Thus you see different sorts of persons leisurely going along, full of joy and mirth. 30. The night comes. The streets are resplendent with dazzling illumination. Dazzling indeed to a person who has never seen Regent Street or Oxford Street, but by no means to be compared with the scale on which illuminations are carried out at the Crystal Palace, except in large towns like Bombay. Men, women and children wear their best costumes, almost all of various colors, and so form a wonderfully bizarre effect, which harmonizes into kaleidoscopic beauty. This is also the night for worshipping Saraswati, the goddess of learning. Merchants start their new ledgers, by making the first entry. The officiating priest, the ubiquitous Brahmin, mutters some prayers and invokes the goddess. At the end of the worship, the children, who are only too impatient, set the fireworks ablaze. And as this worship generally takes place at a fixed time, the streets resound with the popping and fizzing and cracking of fireworks. Pious people then go to the temples, but here too there is nothing to be seen but mirth and glee, dazzling light and splendor. The following day, that is, the New Year's Day, is the day of paying and receiving visits. Kitchen fires are put out on this day, so that people eat the cold food which has been previously prepared. But the glutton by no means starves, for there is such profusion that though he eats and eats again there is yet plenty and to spare. Well-to-do classes buy and cook every sort of vegetables, corn and pulse, and taste them all on the New Year's Day. The second day of the New Year is comparatively a quiet day. Kitchen fires are now relighted. Light food is generally taken after the heavy meals of the previous days. There is no display of fireworks except by some mischievous children. Illumination, too, is on the smaller scale. With the second day the Diwali holidays are practically over. Let us see how these holidays affect society, and how many desirable things people do unwittingly. Generally, all the family members try to meet together for the holidays at their chief place of residence. The husband always tries to get home to his wife again, even though his business may have taken him away the whole of the previous year. The father travels a great distance to meet his children. The son, if abroad, comes back from his school and so a general reunion always takes place. Then all who can afford it have new sets of clothes. Among the richer classes ornaments, too, are ordered especially for the occasion. Even old family quarrels are patched up. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 31. At any rate a serious attempt is made to do so. Houses are repaired and whitewashed. Old furniture, which was lying packed up in a wooden case, is taken out, cleaned, and used for decorating the rooms for the time being. Old debts, if any, are paid up wherever possible. Everyone is supposed to buy some new thing, which almost always takes the form of a metallic vessel, or some such thing, for the New Year's Day. Alms are freely given. Persons not very careful about offering prayers or visiting temples are now doing both. On holidays no one is to quarrel with or swear at any other pernicious habit very much in vogue, particularly among the lower classes. In a word, everything is quiet and joyful. 
life, instead of being burdensome, is perfectly enjoyable. It will be easily seen that good and far-reaching consequences cannot fail to flow from such holidays, which some cry down as a relic of superstition and tomfoolery, though in reality they are a boon to mankind, and tend to relieve a great deal of the dull monotony of life among the toiling millions. Though the Diwali holidays are common to the whole of India, the mode of observing them varies in point of details in different parts. Moreover, this is but an imperfect description of the greatest festival of the Hindus. And it must not be supposed that there is no abusing of the holidays. Like every other thing, this festival, too, may have, and probably has, its black side, but that had better be left alone. Certainly the good that it does far outweighs the evil. The Vegetarian, April 4, 1891-15 Some Indian festivals ye next in importance to the Diwali holidays are the Holy Holidays, which were alluded to in the Vegetarian of the 28th March. Holy Holidays, as will be remembered, correspond to Easter in point of time. Holy takes place on the full moon day of the fifth month, Falgan, of the Hindu year. This is just the springtime. Trees are budding forth. Warm clothes are put off. Light clothes are the fashion. That the spring has come is even more manifest when we have a peep at one of the temples. The moment you enter a temple and you must be a Hindu in order to gain admittance thereinto, you smell nothing but sweet flowers. Pious persons are sitting on the steps, making garlands for the Korji god. Among the flowers you see beautiful roses, shameli, magra, etc. When the doors are flung open. 32. For darshan literally, seeing, you observe the fountains in full play. You enjoy soft and fragrant breezes. The Korji has worn light costumes of delicate shades. Piles of flowers before him, and garlands round his neck, almost hide him from your view. He is swung to and fro. The swing, too, is covered with green leaves sprinkled with fragrant waters. Outside the temple this sight is not edifying. You here meet with nothing but obscene language during the fortnight preceding the holy. In small villages, it is difficult for ladies to appear without being bespattered with mud. They are the subject of obscene remarks. The same treatment is meted out to men without distinction. People form themselves into small parties. Then one party competes with another in using obscene language and singing obscene songs. All persons men and children, but not women take part in these revolting contests. Indeed, it is not considered bad taste to use obscene words during this season. In places where people are steeped in ignorance they even pelt one another. They paint obscene words on your clothes, and if you wear a white garment and go out, you are sure to return home with plenty of mud about you. This reaches its climax on the holy day. Whether you are in the house or out of it, obscene words are jarring on your ears. If you happen to visit a friend, you are sure to be bathed in foul water, or in fragrant water, as the case may be. In the evening, a big pile of wood or dried cow dung is made and set on fire. These piles are often as high as 20 feet or more. And the pieces of wood used are so thick that the fire is not extinguished for seven or eight days. On the day following, people heat water on these fires and bathe with it. So far I have spoken of the way in which the holy holidays are abused. It is a relief to be able to say that with the progress of education and civilization such scenes are slowly, though surely, dying out, but the richer and refined classes use these holidays in a very decent way. Colored water and fragrant waters take the place of mud. Throwing pails of water is replaced here by a little sprinkling only. Orange colored water is most used during these days. It is made by boiling dried flowers, called kasuda, which have the color of an orange. Rose water, too, is used where people can afford it. Friends and relations meet and feast one another, and thus enjoy the spring in merriment. In many respects, the Diwali holidays present a beautiful contrast. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 33. To the, for the most part, unholy holy holidays. 
Diwali holidays begin soon after the monsoon season which is also the time of fasting. So the feasting during the Diwali holidays is all the more enjoyable. While the holy holiday follow the winter which is the time for taking concentrated foods of all sorts, such foods are left off during the holy holidays. Obscene language of holy follows the most sacred songs of the Diwali. Then again people begin to wear winter clothes in the Diwali, while they put these off in the holy. The Diwali proper takes place on the 15th day of the dark half of the month Ashwin and consequently there is much illumination. While on account of the holy taking place on the full moon day, illumination would be out of place. The Vegetarian, April 25, 1891-16 the foods of INDIA1 Before I proceed to the subject of my address I should like to tell you what are my qualifications for undertaking the task. When Mill wrote the history of India, he, in his most interesting preface, pointed out how he was qualified to write the book, though he had never been to India, and was ignorant of the Indian languages. So I think that in following his example, I shall be doing just what I ought to do. Of course, the very idea of referring to one's qualifications for any task argues some sort of unfitness on the part of the speaker or writer, and I confess that I am not the person to speak upon the foods of India. I have undertaken the task not because I am thoroughly competent to speak on the subject but because I thought I would thereby be doing a service to the cause that both you and I have at heart. My remarks are chiefly derived from my experience of the Bombay Presidency. Now. As you know, India is a vast peninsula populated by 285 million souls. It is as large as Europe less Russia. In such a country, the customs and manners in different parts must be necessarily different. So, if in future you hear anything different from what I am going to say, I request you to bear in mind the above fact. As a general rule, my remarks will apply to the whole of India. I shall divide the subject into three parts. In the first place I shall say something, by way of preliminary, about the people who live upon the foods. Secondly, I shall describe the foods. And thirdly, their uses, etc. 34. It is commonly believed that all the inhabitants of India are vegetarians, but this is not true. And for that matter even all the Hindus are not vegetarians. But it is quite true to say that the great majority of the inhabitants of India are vegetarians one. Some of them are so because of their religion, while others are compelled to live on vegetable foods because they cannot afford to pay for meat. This will be quite clear to you when I tell you that there are millions in India who live upon one paisai, e, one third of a penny a day, and even in a poverty-stricken country like India you cannot get eatable meat for that sum. These poor people have only one meal per day, and that consists of stale bread and salt, a heavily taxed article. But Indian vegetarians and meat-eaters are quite different from English vegetarians and meat-eaters. Indian meat-eaters, unlike English meat-eaters, do not believe that they will die without meat. So far as my knowledge goes, they the Indian meat-eaters do not consider meat a necessity of life but a mere luxury. If they can get their roti, as bread is generally called there, they get on very well without their meat. But look at our English meat eater. He thinks that he must have his meat. Bread simply helps him to eat meat, while the Indian meat eater thinks that meat will help him to eat his bread. I was talking the other day to an English lady on the ethics of diet, and she exclaimed, while I was telling her how even she could easily become a vegetarian, say what you will, I must have my meat. I am so fond of it, and am positively sure I cannot live without it. But, madam, I said, suppose that you were compelled to live on the strictly vegetable diet, how would you manage then? Oh, she said, don't talk of that. I know I could not be compelled to do so, and if I were I should feel very uncomfortable. Of course, no one can blame the lady for so saying. Society is in such a position for the present that it is impossible for any meat-eater to leave off eating meat without much difficulty. In the same manner, an Indian vegetarian is quite different from an English one. The former simply abstains from anything that. One the vegetarian, June 5, 1891, reported, 
Saturday, May 2nd, Bloomsbury Hall, Hart Street, Bloomsbury. Mrs. Harrison was followed by Mr. M. K. Gandhi. After congratulating the previous speaker and apologizing for his paper, which was entitled The Foods on India, he began to read it. He was rather nervous in the beginning. The text given here is of the paper read at the Portsmouth meeting of the Vegetarian Society. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 35. Involves the destroying of a life, or a would-be life, and he goes no further. Therefore he does not take eggs, because he thinks that in taking an egg he would kill a would-be life. I am sorry to say I have been taking eggs for about a month and a half. But he does not hesitate to use milk and butter. He even uses these animal products, as they are called here, on fruit days, which occur every fortnight. On these days he is forbidden wheat, rice, etc., but he can use as much butter and milk as he likes. While, as we know, some of the vegetarians here discard butter and milk, some do away with cooking, and some even try to live on fruit and nuts. I will now pass to the description of our different foods. I must say that I shall not dwell upon the flesh foods at all, as these, even where they are used, do not form the staple article of food. India is preeminently an agricultural country, and a very large one. So its products are numerous and varied. Though the foundation of the British rule in India dates from the year 1746 AD, and though India was known to the English much earlier than 1746, it is a pity that so little should be known of the foods of India and England. We have not to go very far to seek the cause. Almost all the Englishmen who go to India keep up their own way of living. They not only insist on having the things they had in England, but will also have them cooked in the same way. It is not for me here to go into the why and wherefore of all these incidents. One would have thought that they would look into the habits of the people, if only out of curiosity, but they have done nothing of the kind, and hence we see the result of their stolid indifference in the loss to many Anglo-Indians of the finest opportunities of studying the food question. To return to the foods, there are many kinds of corn produced in India which are absolutely unknown here. Wheat, however, is, of course, of the greatest importance there as here. Then there are bajara which is called millet by the Anglo-Indians, jor, rice, etc. These are what I should call bread foods, because they are chiefly used for bread making. Wheat, of course, in greatly used, but it being comparatively dear, bajara and jor take its place among the poor classes. This is very much so in the southern and the northern provinces. Speaking of the southern provinces, in his Indian history, Sir W. W. Hunter once says, the food of the common. 1 1840-1900, served in India for 25 years. Wrote a number of books including Indian Empire. Compiled the Imperial Gazetteer of India in 14 volumes. Member of the Viceroy's Legislative Council 1881-87. On retirement from India became member of the British Committee of the Congress, and from 1890 contributed to the Times on Indian Affairs. 36. People consists chiefly of small grains, such as jor, bajara, ragi. Of the north, he says, the two last that is, jor and bajara form the food of the masses, rice being only grown on irrigated lands and consumed by the rich. It is not at all unusual to find persons who have not tasted jor. Jor being the diet of the poor, it is held in reverence, as it were. Instead of goodbye as the parting salute, the poor in India say jor, which, when extended and translated, would, I think, mean, may you never be without jor. One the rice, too, is used for bread making especially in Bengal. The Bengalis use rice more than wheat. In other parts, rice, as an article for bread making, is rarely, if ever, used. Chana, or gram as it is called by the Anglo-Indians, is sometimes used for the same purpose, either in combination with or without wheat. It closely resembles peas in taste and shape. This brings me to the various kinds of pulses for soup making, or dal. Gram, peas, lentils, haricot beans, tuar, mug, muth, 
Urad are the chief pulses used for doll. Of these, I think, Tuar heads the list in popularity. Both these kinds of foods are chiefly used when dried. Now I come to the green vegetables. It would be useless to give you names of all the vegetables. They are so numerous that I am sure there are many of them that I do not know. The soil of India is so rich that it can produce any vegetable you like. So we may safely say that with a proper knowledge of agriculture, the Indian soil may be made to produce any vegetable to be found on earth. There now remains fruit and nuts. I am sorry to say that the proper value of fruits is not known in India. Though it is used in abundance, it is used rather as a luxury than anything else. It is used more for the sake of its palatable taste than of health. Therefore, we do not get such valuable fruits as oranges, apples, etc., in plenty. Hence they are available only to the rich. But we get plenty of seasonal fruit and dried fruits. Summer in India, as everywhere, is the best season for the former. Of these, the mango is the most important. It is the most delicious fruit I have yet tasted. Some have placed the pineapple at the top of the list. But a great majority of those who have tasted the mango vote in its favor. It remains in season for three months, when it is very cheap, and consequently both the rich and the poor can enjoy it. I have heard that some even live on mangoes of course, only while they are in season. But, unfortunately, the mango is a fruit that will not keep long in a good condition. It resembles the peach in. One Ganthiji appears to have confused between jowar the food grain and jewar, a word of salutation in some Indian languages. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 37. Taste and is a stone fruit. It is often as big as a small melon. That brings us to the melons, which are also plentiful in summer. They are far superior to what we get here. However, I must not inflict any more names of fruits on you. Suffice it to say that India produces innumerable varieties of seasonal fruits, which do not keep long. All these fruits are available to the poor. The pity is that they never make a meal of these fruits. Generally, we believe that fruit causes fever, diarrhea, etc. In summer, when we always dread cholera, authorities prohibit idly, too, in many cases he sale of melons and other such fruits. As for dried fruits, we get almost all the varieties that are to be had here. Of nuts we get some varieties which you do not get here. On the other hand, some that are to be had here are not seen in India. Nuts are never used as food in India. And so, properly speaking, they should not be included in the foods of India. Now, before I come to the last division of my subject, I should request you to bear in mind the following divisions that I have made. First, corn for bread making, for example, wheat, millet, etc. Second, pulse, for dal or soup making. Third, green vegetables. Fourth, fruits. And, fifth and last, nuts. Of course, I am not going to give you recipes for cooking these different kinds of foods. That is beyond my power. I shall tell you the general way in which they are cooked for their proper uses. Diet cure or hygiene is a comparatively recent discovery in England. In India we have been practicing this from time out of mind. Native physicians no doubt, use drugs, too, but they depend more upon change of diet than upon the efficacy of the drugs they prescribe. They would ask you to take salt in certain cases. In many, they would ask you to abstain from acid foods, and so on, every food having its medical value. As for the corn for bread making, it is the most important article of diet. For convenience. I have called the preparation made of flour bread, but cake would be a better name for it. I shall not relate the whole process of making it, but I may just say that we do not throw away the bran. These cakes are always fresh made, and generally eaten hot with clarified butter. They are to the Indians what meat is to the English. The quantity of food a person eats is measured according to the number of cakes he eats. Pulse and vegetables are left out of account. You may make a meal without pulse, without vegetables, 
but never without cakes. Different preparations, too, are made of the various kinds of corns, but they are merely cakes in disguise. 38. Pulse for soup making, for example, peas, lentils, etc., is prepared by simply boiling it in water. But an addition of innumerable condiments makes it a most delicious dish. The art of cooking has full play in these foods. I have known peas spiced with salt, pepper, turmeric, cloves, cinnamon, and such like. The proper use of pulse is to help you to eat the cakes. Medically, it is not supposed good to take too much of the pulses. A remark on rice here would not be out of place. As I have already said, rice is used for bread making, especially in Bengal. Some of the doctors trace the diabetes from which the Bengalis very often suffer to this source. No one in India would call rice a nourishing food. It is the food of the rich, that is, of people who do not want to work. Laboring men very rarely use rice. Physicians put their feverish patients on rice. I have suffered from fever no doubt by breaking hygienic rules, as Dr. Allenson would say, and was put upon a diet of rice and mug water. Recovery was marvelous. Next come green vegetables. These are prepared in much the same way as pulses. Oil and butter play an important part in the preparation of vegetables. Often gram flour is mixed with them. Simply boiled vegetables are never eaten. I never saw a boiled potato in India. Not infrequently they make a combination of many vegetables. It is needless to say that India would far outbid France in cooking vegetables nicely. Their proper use is much the same as that of pulse. In importance they stand next to it. They are more or less a luxury, and are generally supposed to be a source of disease. Poor people have hardly one vegetable once or twice a week. They would have cakes and dal. Some of the vegetables have an excellent medicinal value. There is one vegetable called tandalja. It very closely resembles spinach in taste. Physicians prescribe it to persons who have indulged in too much cayenne pepper and spoiled their eyesight thereby. Then come fruits. They are used chiefly on fruit days, but are rarely, if ever, used at the end of ordinary meals. People generally take them now and then. Mango juice is very greatly used in the mango season. It is eaten with cakes or rice. We never cook or stew ripe fruits. We preserve unripe fruits, chiefly mangoes, while acid. Medicinally, fresh fruits, being generally acid, are supposed to have a tendency to give fever. Dried fruits are much used by children, and dried dates deserve some notice. We suppose them to be strength. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 39. Giving, and therefore in winter, when we take concentrated foods, we prepare them with milk and various other things too numerous to be mentioned, and eat an ounce every day. Lastly, nuts take the place of English sweets. Children eat a great quantity of sugared nuts. They are also largely used on fruit days. We fry them in butter, and even stew them in milk. Almonds are supposed to be very good for the brain. I will just point out one of the various ways in which we use the coconut. It is first ground and then mixed with clarified butter and sugar. It tastes very nice. I hope some of you will try at home those coconut sweet balls as they are called. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a sketch most imperfect sketch f foods of India. I hope you will be induced to learn more about them, and I am sure you will profit by doing so. In conclusion, I further hope the time will come when the great difference now existing between the food habits of meat eating in England and grain eating in India will disappear, and with it some other differences which, in some quarters, mar the unity of sympathy that ought to exist between the two countries. In the future, I hope we shall tend towards unity of custom, and also unity of hearts. The Vegetarian Messenger, January 6, 1891-17 Speech to the Band of Mercy, London Upper Norwood, before June 6, 1891 by previous arrangement. Mrs. McDowell was to deliver a lecture to a meeting of the members of the Band of Mercy 1, by the courtesy of Miss Siakum, 
but she being ill, Mr. Gandhi a Hindu from India was requested and kindly consented to take the meeting. Mr. Gandhi spoke for about a quarter of an hour on vegetarianism from a humanitarian standpoint, and insisted that the members of the Band of Mercy, in order to be logical, ought to be vegetarian. He wound up with a quotation from Shakespeare. The Vegetarian, June 6, 1891. One for the prevention of cruelty to animals. 40. 18. Speech at Farewell D.I.N.N.E.R. 1 June 11, 1891 Although as was a sort of a farewell dinner, there was no sign of sorrow, because all felt that though Mr. Gandhi was going back to India, yet he was going to a still greater work for vegetarianism, and that upon the completion of his law career and his final success, congratulations to him should take the place of personal wailings. At the close of the function, Mr. Gandhi, in a very graceful though somewhat nervous speech, welcomed all present, spoke of the pleasure it gave him to see the habit of abstinence from flesh progressing in England, related the manner in which his connection with the London Vegetarian Society arose, and in so doing took occasion to speak in a touching way of what he owed to Mr. Oldfield too. He also pointed to the hope that a future Congress of the Federal Union would be held in India. The Vegetarian, November 6, 1891-19 Interview to the Vegetarian 3 I Mr. Gandhi was first asked what was the reason which first induced him to think of coming over to England and adopting the legal profession. In a word, ambition. I matriculated at the Bombay University in the year 1887. Then I joined the Bhavnagar College, for unless you graduate at the Bombay University you get no status in society. If you want any employment before that, you cannot secure unless, of course, you have a very good influence to back you up, a respectable post, giving a handsome salary. But I found that I would have to spend three years at the least before I could graduate. Moreover, I suffered from constant headaches and nose bleeding, and this was supposed to be due to the hot climate. And, after all, I could not, even after graduating, expect any very great income, while I was incessantly brooding over these things. An old friend of my father saw. One held at Holborn to Dr. Josiah Oldfield, editor of the Vegetarian 3 to enable Englishmen to appreciate the difficulties confronting Hindus intending to proceed to England for studies and to point out to such Hindus how the difficulties might be overcome, a representative of the Vegetarian put Gandhiji a number of questions. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 41 and advised me to go to England and take the robe. He, as it were, fanned the fire that was burning within me. I thought to myself, if I go to England not only shall I become a barrister of whom I used to think a great deal, but I shall be able to see England, the land of philosophers and poets, the very center of civilization. This gentleman had great influence with my elders, and so he succeeded in persuading them to send me to England. This is a very brief statement of my reasons for coming to England, but they by no means represent my present views. Of course, your friends were all delighted at your ambitious purpose? Well, not all. There are friends and friends. Those who were my real friends, and of about my age, were very glad to hear that I was to go to England. Some were friends, or rather, well-wishers, old in years. These sincerely believed that I was going to ruin myself, and that I would be a disgrace to my family by going to England. Others, however, set up their opposition simply from malice. They had seen some of the barristers who derived fabulous incomes, and they were afraid that I might do the same. Some, again, there were, who thought that I was too young I am now about twenty-two, or that I should not be able to bear the climate. To cut the matter short, no two persons supported or opposed my coming on the same grounds. How did you set about carrying out your intention? Just tell me, if you please, what were your difficulties, and how you overcame them. Even to try to tell you the story of my difficulties would fill up the whole of your valuable paper. It is a tale of misery and woe. The difficulties may well be likened to the heads of Ravana the giant of the second one great Hindu epic Ramayana whom Rama, the hero, fought, 
and ultimately defeated which were many, and which were no sooner chopped off than replaced. They may be divided chiefly under four heads, viz., money, consent of my elders, separation from relations, and caste restrictions. First, then, as to money. Though my father was the prime minister of more than one native state, he never hoarded money. He spent all that he earned in charity and the education and marriages of his children, so we were practically left without much cash. He left some property, and that was all. When asked why he did not collect money and set it aside for his children, he used to say that his children won the other great epic is the Mahabharata. 42. Represented his wealth, and if he hoarded much money he would spoil them. So, then, money was no small difficulty in my way. I tried for some state scholarship but failed. At one place, I was asked to prove my worth by graduating and then expect it. Experience teaches me that the gentleman who said so was right. Not daunted, I requested my eldest brother to devote all the money that was left to my education in England. Here I cannot help digressing to explain the family system that prevails in India. There, unlike as in England, the children always, if male, and until marriage, if female, live with their parents. What they earn goes to the father, and so also what they lose is a loss to the father. Of course, even the male children do separate under exceptional circumstances, for example, in the case of a great quarrel. But these are the exceptions. In the legal languages of Maine, individual property is the rule in the West. Corporate property is the rule in the East. So then everything was under the control of my brother, and we were all living together. To return to the question of money. What little my father could leave for me was in the hands of my brother. It could only be set free subject to his consent. Moreover, that was not enough, so I proposed that the whole capital should be devoted to my education. I ask you if any brother would do so here. There are very few such brothers in India. He was told that I might prove an unworthy brother after imbibing the Western ideas and that the only chance of regaining the money would be in my returning alive to India, which was very doubtful. But he turned a deaf ear to all these reasonable and well-meaned warnings. There was one, and only one condition attached to the consent to my proposal, viz., that I should get the permission of my mother and my uncle. May many persons have such brothers as mine. I then set about the allotted task, which I can assure you was uphill enough. Fortunately, I was the pet of my mother. She had much faith in me, and so I succeeded in getting over her superstition, but how was I to make her nod consent to a three years' separation? However, by showing the exaggerated advantages of coming to England, I got her to accede, with much reluctance, to my request. Now for the uncle. He was on the point of going to banners and such other holy places. After three days' incessant persuasion and arguments I could get the following answer from him, I am going on a pilgrimage. What you say may be right, but... Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 43. How could I willingly say yes to your unholy proposal? The only thing I can say is that, if your mother does not mind your going, I have no right to interfere. This was easily interpreted into yes. Nor were these the only two whom I had to please. In India everyone, no matter how remotely connected, thinks that he has a right to poke his nose into another's affairs. But when I had exacted for it was nothing else acquiescence from the two, the pecuniary difficulties almost disappeared. The difficulties under the second head are partially discussed above. You will, perhaps, be astonished to hear that I am married. The marriage took place at the age of twelve. Small blame then to my wife's parents if they thought that they had a right to interfere if only for the sake of their daughter. Who was to look after her? How was she to manage to spend the three years? Of course she was to be looked after by my brother. Poor brother. According to my ideas at that time, I should have taken little notice of their legitimate fears and growlings had it not been that their displeasure would have been reflected on my mother and brother. 
It was no easy task to sit night after night with my father-in-law and to hear and successfully answer his objections. But then I was taught the old proverb, patience and perseverance to overcome mountains, too well to give way. When I had the money and the requisite permission, I said to myself, how am I to persuade myself to separate from all that is dear and near to me? In India we fight shy of separation. Even when I had to go for a few days my mother would weep. How, then, was I to witness, without being affected, the heart-rending scene? It is impossible for me to describe the tortures that my mind had to suffer. As the day of leave-taking drew near I nearly broke down. But I was wise enough not to say this, even to my closest friends. I knew that my health was failing. Sleeping, waking, drinking, eating. Walking, running, reading, I was dreaming and thinking of England and what I would do on that momentous day. At last the day came. On the one hand, my mother was hiding her eyes, full of tears, in her hands, but the sobbing was clearly heard. On the other, I was placed among a circle of some fifty friends. If I wept they would think me too weak. Perhaps they would not allow me to go to England, soliloquized I. Therefore I did not weep, even though my heart was breaking. Last, but not least, came the leave-taking with my wife. It would be contrary to custom for me to see or talk to her in the presence of friends. So I, 44, had to see her in a separate room. She, of course, had begun sobbing long before. I went to her and stood like a dumb statue for a moment. I kissed her, and she said, don't go. What followed I need not describe. This done, my anxieties were not over. It was but the beginning of the end. The leave-taking was only half done, for I parted with the mother and the wife in Rykot here I was educated at my brother and friends came to see me off as far as Bombay. The scene that took place there was no less affecting. The collisions with my caste fellows in Bombay defy description, for Bombay is the place where they chiefly live. In Rykot I did not meet with any such opposition worthy of the name. It was my misfortune to live in the heart of the city of Bombay, where they most abound, so I was hemmed in on all sides. I could not go out without being pointed and stared at by someone or other. At one time, while I was walking near the town hall, I was surrounded and hooted by them, and my poor brother had to look at the scene in silence. The culminating point was reached when a huge meeting of the caste fellows was summoned by the chief representatives. Every member of the caste was called upon to attend the meeting, under pain of forfeiting a fine of five annas. I may here mention that, before this step was determined upon, I was pestered with many deputations from them without avail. At this great meeting, I was seated in the center of the audience. The Patels, as the representatives are called, remonstrated with me very strongly and reminded me of their connection with my father. It may be mentioned that all this was quite a unique experience to me. They literally dragged me out of seclusion, for I was not accustomed to such things. Moreover, my position became more precarious on account of an extreme shyness. Seeing that remonstrance fell flat on me, the head Patel addressed me in effect in the following words, We were your father's friends and therefore we feel for you. As heads of the caste you know our power, we are positively informed that you will have to eat flesh and drink wine in England. Moreover, you have to cross the waters. All this you must know is against our caste rules. Therefore we command you to reconsider your decision, or else the heaviest punishment will be meted out to you. What have you to say to this? I replied in the following words, I thank you for your warnings. I am sorry that I cannot alter my decision. What I have heard about England is quite different from what you say. One Need Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896 45. Not take meat and wine there. As for crossing the waters, if our brethren can go as far as Aden, why could not I go to England? I am deeply convinced that malice is at the root of all these objections. Very well, then, replied the worthy Patel in anger, you are not the son of your father. Then, 
Turning to the audience, he went on, This boy has lost his sense, and we command everyone not to have anything to do with him. He who will support him in any way or go to see him off will be treated as an outcast, and if the boy ever returns, let him know that he shall never be taken into the caste. These words fell like a bombshell upon all. Even the chosen few who had supported me through thick and thin left me alone. I had a great mind to answer the childish taunt, but was prevented from so doing by my brother. Thus even though I got out of the ordeal safely, my position became worse than ever. Even my brother began to vacillate, though only for a moment. He was reminded of the threat that the pecuniary support from him would cost him not only the money, but his membership of the caste. So although he did not say anything to me in person, he asked some of his friends to persuade me either to reconsider my decision or to defer its execution till the fury had subsided. There could be but one answer from me, and ever since that he never flinched, and, in fact, he has not been excommunicated. But the end had not come yet. The intrigues of the cast fellows were always at work. They almost seemed to have scored this time, for they could put off my going for a fortnight. They carried it out thus wise. We went to see a captain of a steamship company, who was requested to say that it would be unwise for me to leave during that time august echoes of the rough weather in the sea. My brother would consent to anything but this. Unfortunately, this was the first voyage that I had undertaken, so no one knew whether I was a good sailor or not, so I was helpless, much against my will I had to put off the departure. I thought the whole structure would fall to the ground. My brother, having left a note to a friend, requesting him to give me the passage money when the time came, took leave. The parting scene was similar to the one described above. Now I was left alone in Bombay without money to buy the passage. Every hour that I had to wait seemed a year. In the meanwhile I heard that another Indian gentleman one was about to leave for England. This. One must muter. Vide London Diary, December 11, 1888. 46. News was God sent to me. I thought I would be allowed to go now. I made use of the note, and was refused the money. I had to make preparations within 24 hours. I was in a dreadful flutter. Without money I felt as if I was a bird without wings. A friend whom I shall always thank came to the rescue and advanced the passage money. I bought the ticket, telegraphed to my brother, and sailed for England on the 4th September, 1888. Such were my chief difficulties, which spread over nearly five months. It was a time of terrible anxiety and torture. Now hopeful, and now despondent, I dragged along always trying my best, and then depending upon God to show me the cherished goal. The Vegetarian, June 13, 1891 20. Interview to the vegetarian I on your arrival in England, of course, you were face to face with the flesh-eating problem. How did you solve it? I was overwhelmed with gratuitous advice. Well-meaning yet ignorant friends thrust their opinions into unwilling ears. The majority of them said I could not do without meat in the cold climate. I would catch consumption. Mr. Z went to England and caught it on account of his full hardiness. Others said I might do without flesh but without wine I could not move. I would be numbed with cold. One went so far as to advise me to take eight bottles of whiskey, for I should want them after leaving Aden. Another wanted me to smoke, for his friend was obliged to smoke in England. Even medical men, those who had been to England, told the same tale. But as I wanted to come at any price, I replied that I would try my best to avoid all these things, but if they were found to be absolutely necessary I did not know what I should do. I may here mention that my aversion to meat was not so strong then as it is now. I was even betrayed into taking meat about six or seven times at the period when I allowed my friends to think for me. But in the steamer my ideas began to change. I thought I should not take meat on any account. My mother before consenting to my departure exacted a promise from me not to take meat. So I was bound not to take it, if only for the sake of the promise. 
The fellow passengers in the steamer began to advise us the friend who was with me and myself to try it. They said I would require it after leaving Aden. When this. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 47. Turned out untrue, I was to require it after crossing the Red Sea. And on this proving false, a fellow passenger said, the weather has not been severe, but in the Bay of Biscay you will have to choose between death and meat and wine that crisis to pass away safely. In London, too, I had to hear such remonstrances. For months I did not come across any vegetarian. I passed many anxious days arguing with a friend about the sufficiency of the vegetable diet. But at that time having but little knowledge of arguments other than humanitarian in favor of vegetarianism, I got the worst of it as the friend scouted the idea of humanity in such discussions. At last I sealed his tongue by telling him I would sooner die than break the promise to my mother. Humph, said he, childishness, rank superstition. But since, even after coming here, you are superstitious enough to believe in such nonsense, I cannot help you any more, I only wish you had not come to England. He never afterwards pressed the point seriously, except perhaps once, though ever since that he took me for a little more than a fool. In the meanwhile I remembered once to have passed by a vegetarian restaurant it was the porridge bowl. I asked a gentleman to direct me there, but instead of reaching there I saw the central restaurant, and went there and had some porridge for the first time. I did not at first enjoy it, but I liked the pie which I had for the second course. It was there that I first bought some vegetarian literature among which was a copy of A Plea for Vegetarianism by H. S. Salt, after reading which I adopted vegetarianism from principle. Till then I considered flesh to be a superior diet from a scientific point of view. Moreover, it was there that I came to know the existence of the Vegetarian Society of Manchester. But I did not take any active interest in it. I did, now and then, read the vegetarian messenger and that was all. My knowledge of the vegetarian dates from a year and a half. It was at the International Vegetarian Congress that I may be said to have known the LVS one. That the Congress was sitting I knew by the kind courtesy of Mr. Josiah Oldfield, who heard of me from a friend, and was good enough to ask me to attend it. In conclusion, I am bound to say that, during my nearly three years' stay in England, I have left many things undone, and have done many things which perhaps I might better have left undone, yet I carry one great. One London Vegetarian Society. 48. Consolation with me that I shall go back without having taken meat or wine, and that I know from personal experience that there are so many vegetarians in England. The Vegetarian, June 20, 1891 21. Application for Enrollment as Advocate Bombay, November 16, 1891 To the Prothonotary and Registrar of the High Court OF Judicature Bombay Sir, I am desirous of being admitted as an Advocate of the High Court. I was called to the bar in England on the 10th June last. I have kept 12 terms in the Inner Temple and I intend to practice in the Bombay Presidency. I produce the certificate of my being called to the bar. As to the certificate of my character and abilities, I have not been able to obtain any certificate from a judge in England, for I was not aware of the rules in force in the Bombay High Court. I, however, produce a certificate from Mr. W. D. Edwards, a practising barrister in the Supreme Court of Judicature in England. He is the author of the Compendium of the Law of Property and Land, one of the books prescribed for the bar final examination I beg to remain. Sir, your most obedient servant M. K. Gandhi Mahatma, Vol. I. Also from a photostat, 22. On way home to India I it was on the 12th June, 1891, that I left for Bombay after three years' stay in England. A beautiful day it was, the sun shone brilliantly. No overcoat was needed to keep off the cold breezes. It was at 11.45 that an express train carrying the passengers left the Liverpool Street Station for the docks. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 49. 
I could not make myself believe that I was going to India until I stepped into the steamship Oceana of the P. and O Company. So much attached was I to London and its environments for who would not be? London with its teaching institutions, public galleries, museums, theatres, vast commerce, public parks and vegetarian restaurants, is a fit place for a student and a traveller, a trader and a addist as a vegetarian would be called by his opponents. Thus, it was not without deep regret that I left dear London. At the same time I was glad because I was to see my friends and relations in India after such a long time. Oceana is an Australian steamer, one of the largest boats of the company. She weighs 6,188 tons and her horsepower is 1,200. When we stepped into this vast floating island, we were treated to a good refreshing tea, to which all passengers and friends alike did justice. I must not omit to say that the tea was served gratis. At this time, a stranger would have taken them all for passengers and they were a goodly number, from the ease with which they were taking their tea. But, when the bell rang to inform the friends of the passengers that the ship was going to weigh anchor, the number appreciably melted away. There was much cheering and waving of handkerchiefs when the ship steamed off the harbour. It may be well here to contrast the ocean with the assam into which the Bombay-bound passengers had to transship at Aden. There were English waiters on the ocean, always neat, clean and obliging. On the other hand, there were Portuguese waiters on board the assam who murdered the Queen's English, and who were always the reverse of clean, and also sulky and slow. There was, moreover, a difference of quality in the food supplied in the two steamers. This was evident from the way in which the passengers were grumbling in the assam. Nor was this all. The accommodation in the ocean at Farao did that in the assam. This, however, the company could not help. They could not throw away the latter because the former was better. How did the vegetarians manage in the ship? This would be an apt question. Well, there were only two vegetarians, including myself. Both of us were prepared, in case we did not get anything better, to manage with boiled potatoes, cabbage and butter. But we had no reason to go to that extreme. The obliging store gave us some vegetable curry. 50. Rice, stewed and fresh fruit from the first saloon, and last, but not least, brown bread. So we had all we wanted. Undoubtedly, they are very liberal in giving good and sufficient food to the passengers. Only, they go too far. So at least it seems to me. It would not be amiss to describe what the second saloon menus contained, and how many meals the passengers had. To begin with, the first thing in the morning, an average passenger would have a cup or two of tea and a few biscuits. At 8.30 a.m., the breakfast bell would bring down the passengers to the din and groom. They were punctual to the minute, at their meals, at any rate. The breakfast menu generally contained oatmeal porridge, some fish, chop, curry, jam, bread and butter, tea or coffee, etc., everything ad libitum. I have often seen passengers take porridge, fish and curry, bread and butter, and wash down with two or three cups of tea. Hardly had we time to digest the breakfast, when, bang, it was the dinner bell at 1.30 p.m. The dinner was as good as breakfast, plenty of mutton and vegetables, rice and curry, pastry, and what not. Two days of the week. All the second saloon passengers were served with fruit and nuts in addition to the ordinary dinner. But this, too, was not sufficient. The dinner fare was so easily digestible that we wanted a refreshing cup of tea and biscuits at 4 p.m. Well, but the evening breezes seemed so soon to take away all the effect of that little cup of tea that we were served a high tea at 6.30 p.m. bread and butter, jam or marmalade, or both, salad chops, tea, coffee, etc. The sea air seemed to be so very salubrious that the passengers could not retire to bed before taking a few, a very few nly 8 or 10, 15 at the most iscuits, a little cheese and some wine or beer. In the light of the above, are not the following lines too true, your belly is your god, your stomach is your temple.
Your paunch is your altar, your cook is your priest. It is in the cooking pots that your love is inflamed, it is in the kitchen that your faith grows fervid, it is in the flesh dishes that all hope lies hid. Who is held in so much esteem with you as the frequent giver of dinners, as the sumptuous entertainer, as the practised toaster of health? The second saloon was pretty full of passengers of all sorts. There were soldiers, clergymen, barbers, sailors, students, officials and, maybe, adventurers. There were three or four ladies. We beguiled our time chiefly in eating and drinking. The rest of the time was either. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 51. Dozed away or passed in chatting, at times in discussing, in playing games, etc. But after two or three days, the time between the meals seemed to hang heavy in spite of discussions and cards and scandals. Some of us really warmed to the work and got up concerts, took soft war, and running races for prizes. One evening was devoted to concerts and speeches. Now, I thought it was time for me to poke my nose in. I requested the secretary of the committee, who managed those things, to give me a quarter of an hour for a short speech on vegetarianism. The secretary obligingly nodded consent to my request. Well, I made grand preparations. I thought out and then wrote out and rewrote the speech that was to be delivered. I well knew that I had to meet a hostile audience, and that I should take care that my speech did not send my audience to sleep. The secretary had asked me to be humorous. I told him that I might be nervous, but humorous I could not be. Now, what do you think became of the speech? The second concert never came off, and so the speech was never delivered, to my great mortification. I fancy it was because no one seemed to enjoy the first evening, for we had no pits and gladstones in the second saloon. However, I succeeded in discussing vegetarianism with two or three passengers, who heard me calmly, and answered in effect, we grant you the argument. But so long as we feel happy on our present diet never mind about our being dyspeptic at times, we cannot give it a trial. One of them, seeing that my vegetarian friend and I got nice roots every day, did give the VEM diet a trial, but the chop was too great a temptation for him. Poor man. The Vegetarian, September 4, 1892-23 On way home to India I I moreover, as an instance of affability between passengers and of politeness on the part of the first saloon passengers, the second saloon passengers were often invited to witness the theatricals and dances that they got up from time to time. They had some very nice ladies and gentlemen in the first. 52. Saloon. But it would not do to have all play and no quarrel, so some of the passengers thought fit to get drunk beg your pardon, Mr. Editor. They got drunk almost every evening, but this particular evening they got drunk and disorderly. They, it seems, were discussing with one another over a glass of whiskey, when some of them used improper language. Then followed a fight of words culminating in a fight of blows. The matter was reported to the captain. He reproved these pugilistic gentlemen, and ever since then we had no more rows. Thus. Dividing our time between eating and amusements, we moved onward. After two days' voyage, the steamer passed by, but did not touch, Gibraltar. This caused much disappointment, mostly among smokers, who wanted to get tobacco, duty-free in Gibraltar, as some of us had entertained a hope the steamer would cast anchor. The next place reached was Malta. It being a coaling station, the steamer stops there for about nine hours. Almost all the passengers went ashore. Malta is a beautiful island without the London smoke. The construction of houses is different. We had a look round the governor's palace. The armory is well worth a visit. Napoleon's carriage is on view there. You see there are some beautiful paintings too. The market is not bad. The fruit is cheap. The cathedral is magnificent. We had a nice drive of about six miles to the orange garden. There you see some thousands of orange trees and some ponds with goldfish. The drive was very cheap, only twos. 6D. What a wretched place Malta is for beggars. 
You cannot go along the road quietly without being pestered by a crowd of dirty-looking beggars. Some would offer to be your guides. Others would offer to take you to shops where you could buy cigars or the famous Maltese sweet nougat. From Malta we reached Brindisi. It is a good harbor and that is all. You cannot pass a single day in amusement. We had about nine hours or more at our disposal, but we could not utilize even four. After Brindisi we reached Port Said. There we took final leave of Europe and the Mediterranean. Of course, there is nothing to be seen in Port Said, unless you want to see the dregs of society. It is full of rogues and rascals. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 53. From Port Said the steamer moves along very slowly, for we enter the Suez Canal of M. de la Seps. It is a distance of 87 miles. The steamer took nearly 24 hours to travel that distance. We were close to the land on both sides. The strip of water is so narrow that two steamers cannot go abreast except at certain places. At night the sight is charming. All the ships are required to light electric lights in front and these are very powerful. The scene when two ships pass one another is very pleasant. The electric light you get from the opposite ship is simply dazzling. We passed the Ganges. We raised three cheers for her, which were heartily returned by the passengers on board the Ganges. The town Suez is at the other end of the canal. The steamer hardly stops there for half an hour. Now we entered the Red Sea. It was a three days voyage but it was most trying. It was unbearably hot. Not only was it impossible to remain inside the steamer, but it was too hot even on the deck. Here, for the first time, we felt that we were going to India to face the hot climate. We had some breeze when we reached Aden. Here, we the passengers for Bombay had to transship into the Assam it was like leaving London for a miserable village. The Assam is hardly half as big as the Oceana, misfortunes never come single. With the Assam we had a stormy ocean, because it was the monsoon season. The Indian Ocean is generally calm, so during monsoon it is stormy with a vengeance. We had to pass five days more on the waters before we reached Bombay. The second night brought the real storm. Many were sick. If I ventured out on the deck I was splashed with water. There goes a crash. Something is broken. In the cabin you cannot sleep quietly. The door is banging. Your bags begin to dance. You roll in your bed. You sometimes feel as if the ship is sinking. At the dinner table you are no more comfortable. The steamer rolls on your side. Your forks and spoons are in your lap, even the cruet stand and the soup plate. Your napkin is dyed yellow and so on. One morning I asked the steward if that was what he would call a real storm, and he said, No, sir. This is nothing. And, waving his arm, showed me how the steamer would roll in a real storm. Thus tossed up and down, we reached Bombay on July 5th. It was raining very hard and so it was difficult going ashore. However, we reached the shore safely, and bade goodbye to the Assam. 54. What a human cargo was on the Oceana, and the Assam. Some were going to make fortunes in Australia in high hopes. Some, having finished their studies in England, were going to India in order to earn a decent living. Some were called away by a sense of duty, some were going to meet their husbands in Australia or India, as the case may be, and some were adventurers who, being disappointed at home, were going to pursue their adventures, God knows where. Were the hopes of all realized? That is the question. How hopeful, yet how often disappointed, is the human mind? We live in hopes. The Vegetarian, April 16, 1892-24 Letter to Ran Khadlal Patwari Bombay, September 5, 1892 My dear Patwari, I thank you for your kind letter and the advice you have given me. As I told you in my last PC, I have to postpone going abroad for practice. My brother is very much against it. He thinks that I need not despair of getting a decent livelihood in Kathy Hour 1 and that without directly taking part in the cut putt 2. However this may be, 
since he is so hopeful and is entitled to every consideration from me, I shall follow his advice. Here, too, I have been promised some work. So I intend to be here for about two months at least. I do not think my accepting a literary post will materially interfere with my legal studies. On the other hand, such a work will add to my knowledge that cannot but be indirectly useful in practice. Moreover, thereby I can work with a more concentrated mind free from worry, but where is the post? Not an easy thing to get one. Of course, I ask for a loan on the strength of the promise you made me while at Rycott. I entirely agree with you that your father should not know of it. Never mind about it now. I shall try somewhere else. I can easily understand that you cannot have a large surplus from one year's practice. My brother has been retained in Sakin as secretary to the Nawab of Sakin. He has gone to Rikot and will return in a few days. One Kathy Anwar, also known as Sarashra, a collection of former princely states, or principalities in Gujarat two machinations, in Gujarati. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 55. I am glad to hear from Kashidas that he will settle in Damduka. The caste opposition is as great as ever. Everything depends upon one man who will try his best never to allow me to enter the caste. I am not so very sorry for myself as I am for the caste fellows who follow the authority of one man like sheep. They have been passing some meaningless resolutions and betraying their malice clearly and overdoing their part. Religion of course, finds no place in their arguments. Is it not almost better not to have anything to do with such fellows than to fawn upon them and wheedle their fame so that I might be considered one of them? However, I have to move with the times. I was very glad to hear of Ralal Pai becoming Karpari one somewhere in Gujarat. You write such a nice hand that I have been induced to imitate you though but imperfectly. Yours sincerely. From the original. M. K. Gandhi. 25. Letter to the Natal Advertiser. To the Editor the Natal Advertiser. Durban, May 26, 1893. Sir, I was startled to read a paragraph in your today's issue referring to myself, under the heading, An Unwelcome Visitor.2 I am very. One administrator to the reference was as follows. An Indian entered the courthouse yesterday afternoon and took a seat at the horseshoe. He was well dressed and it was understood that he was an English barrister, on his way to Pretoria, where he is reported to be engaged in an Indian case. He entered the court without removing his head covering or salaaming, and the magistrate looked at him with disapproval. The new arrival was courteously asked his business, and he replied that he was an English barrister. He did not attempt to present his credentials, and, on returning to the horseshoe was quietly told that the proper course for him to pursue, before taking up his position at the bar, was to gain admission to the Supreme Court. The incident was reported in the Natal Mercury, May 26, 1893. 56. Sorry if His Worship the Magistrate looked at me with disapproval. It is true that on entering the court I neither removed my headdress nor salaamed, but in so doing I had not the slightest idea that I was offending his worship, or meaning any disrespect to the court. Just as it is a mark of respect amongst the Europeans to take off their hats, in like manner it is in Indians to retain one's headdress. To appear uncovered before a gentleman is not to respect him. In England, on attending drawing-room meetings and evening parties, Indians always keep the headdress, and the English ladies and gentlemen generally seem to appreciate the regard which we show thereby. In high courts in India those Indian advocates who have not discarded their native headdress invariably keep it on. As to bowing, or salaaming as you would call it, I again followed the rule observed in the Bombay High Court. If an advocate enters the court after the judge has taken his seat on the bench he does not bow but all the advocates rise up when the judge enters the court, and keep standing until the judge has taken his seat. Accordingly, yesterday when His Worship entered the court I rose up, and took my seat only after His Worship had done so. The paragraph seems to convey also that though I was told privately not to keep my seat at the horseshoe, 
I nevertheless returned to the horseshoe. The truth is that I was taken by the chief clerk to the interpreter's room, and was asked not to take my seat at the horseshoe the next time I came unless I produced my credentials. To make assurance doubly sure I asked the chief clerk if I could retain my seat for the day, and he very kindly said yes. I was therefore really surprised to be told again in open court that in order to be entitled to the seat I had to produce credentials, etc. Lastly, I beg his worship's pardon if he was offended at what he considered to be my rudeness, which was the result of ignorance and quite unintentional. I hope, in fairness, you will extend me the favor of finding the above explanation a space in your paper, as the paragraph, if unexplained, would be likely to do me harm. The Natal Advertiser, May 29, 1893. I am, etc., M. K. Gandhi. Volume 1, 1884 30, November, 1896. 57. 26. Letter to the Natal Advertiser. Pretoria, September 16, 1893. To the Editor, the Natal Advertiser. S.I.R. My attention has been drawn to the reproduction of Mr. Pillay's letter 1 to the Transvaal Advertiser in your paper with comments thereon. I am that unfortunate Indian barrister at law who had arrived in Durban, and who is now in Pretoria too. But I am not Mr. Pillay, nor am I a Bachelor of Arts. I am, etc. The Natal Advertiser, September 18, 1893. M. K. Gandhi. 27. Letter to the Natal Advertiser. To the Editor the Natal Advertiser. Pretoria, September 19, 1893. Sir, I shall be very thankful to you if you would be good enough to find place for the following in your paper. Mr. Pillay, who recently wrote to the Transvaal Advertiser, has been taken to pieces for being nasty by some gentlemen here and by the papers there. I wonder if your leader about the wily wretched Asiatic traders the real canker that is eating into the very vitals of the community, these parasites who live a semi-barbaric life would not bear Mr. Pillay's letter out of the field in a hard word competition. However, tastes differ as to style, and I have no right to sit in judgment upon anyone's style of writing. But why all this outpouring of wrath on the poor Asiatic traders? It is difficult to see how the colony is in danger of literal ruination. One Pillay's complaint was that he was violently pushed off the footpath. Two administrative capital of the Union. 511 miles from Durban. 58. The reasons, so far as I can gather from your leading article of the 15th instant, can be summed up in the following words, one Asiatic has gone into insolvency, and paid 5d in the this is a fair sample of an Asiatic trader. He has driven out the small European trader. Now, granting that a majority of Asiatic traders do become insolvent, and pay very little to their creditors which is not at all the case, is that a good reason for driving them out of the colony or South Africa? Does it not rather show that there must be a defect in the insolvency law that they can thus ruin their creditors? If the law would give any latitude for such practices, people would take advantage of it. Do not the Europeans seek the protection of the insolvency court? I do not, of course, mean to defend the Indian traders by this too quick argument. I sincerely regret that the Indians should resort to such practices at all. It is a disgrace to their country, which one time had too great an idea of its honor to be associated with any dishonest dealing in trade, but it certainly seems to me that a case is not made out for expelling the Indian traders on the strength of the fact of their availing themselves of the law of bankruptcy. Not only can the law put a stop to the frequent occurrence of such cases, but the wholesale merchants, too, by being a little more careful, can do so. And, by the way, does not the very fact that these traders do get credit from the European merchants show that they are not, after all, so bad as they are portrayed by you? If the small European trader has been driven out, is it to be laid at their door? This shows, it would appear a greater competency on the part of the Indian trader and commerce, and this very superior competency is to be a reason for his expulsion. I ask you, sir, is this fair? If one editor edited his paper more ably than his rival, and consequently, 
drives the latter out of the field. How would the former like to be told that he should give place to his crestfallen rival because he the successful one was able? Should not the superior ability be a special reason for encouragement so that the rest may try to rise as high? Is it a sound policy to stifle healthy competition? Should not the European trader take a leaf out of the book of the Indian trader, if that be not below his dignity, and learn how to trade cheaply, how to live simply? Do unto others as you would be done by. But you say these wretched Asiatics live a semi-barbaric life. It would be highly interesting to learn your views of a semi-barbaric life. I have some notion of the life they live. If a room without a nice, rich. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 59. Carpet and ornamental hangings, a dinner table perhaps unvarnished, without an expensive tablecloth, with no flowers to decorate it, with no wine spread, no pork or beef ad lib be a semi-barbaric life. If a white comfortable dress, specially adapted to a warm climate, which, I am told, many Europeans envy them in the trying heat of summer, be a semi-barbaric life, if no beer, no tobacco, no ornamental walking stick, no golden watch chain, no luxuriously faded sitting room, be a semi-barbaric life. If, in short, what one commonly understands by a simple frugal life be a semi-barbaric life, then, indeed, the Indian traders must plead guilty to the charge, and the sooner the semi-barbarity is wiped out from the highest colonial civilization, the better. The elements that generally constitute a reason for expulsion of a people from civilized states are entirely absent in the case of these people. You will agree when I say that they are not a political danger to the government, since they meddle very little, if at all, in politics. They are not notorious robbers. I believe there is not a single case of an Indian trader having suffered imprisonment, or even been charged with theft, robbery, or any of the heinous crimes. I speak under correction. Their teetotal habits make them exceptionally peaceful citizens. But they spend nothing says the leading article under discussion. Don't they? I suppose they live on error or sentiments. We know that Becky lived on nothing for a year in Vanity Fair. And here a whole class seems to have been found out doing the same. It is to be presumed they have to pay nothing for shop rents, taxes, butcher's bills, grocer's bills, clerk's salaries, etc. etc. One would, indeed, like to belong to such a blessed class of traders, especially in the present critical condition of the trade all the world over. It seems, on the whole, that their simplicity, their total abstinence from intoxicants, their peaceful and, above all, their businesslike and frugal habits, which should serve as a recommendation, are really at the bottom of all this contempt and hatred of the poor Indian traders. And they are British subjects. Is this Christian-like? Is this fair play? Is this justice? Is this civilization? I pause for a reply. Thanking you in anticipation for inserting this. The Natal Advertiser, September 23, 1893. I am, etc. M.K. Gandhi. 60. 28. Welcome address to new governor. To His Excellency, Sir Walter Healy Hutchinson, KCMG, etc. Town Hall, Durban, September 28, 1893. May it please Your Excellency, we the undersigned members of the Mohammedan and Indian community of the colony of the Natal, beg most respectfully to welcome Your Excellency on the occasion of Your Excellency's arrival here as the representative of Her Majesty the Queen, Empress of India. We trust that Your Excellency will find the colony and its associations congenial and that the task of introducing a new form of government into natal will be as free from difficulty as it will be pregnant with interest. The special affairs of the Indian community in natal will, owing to the extending Indian influence here, constantly occupy Your Excellency's attention. And we bespeak, with Your Excellency's permission, that consideration towards our community, which, we are confident, Your Excellency, representing Her Most Gracious Majesty, will be pleased to grant to us. We take leave to wish for Your Excellency and Lady Healy Hutchinson all prosperity during your stay in this country. And we are.
Your Excellency's most obedient servants. Dad Abdullah 1. Dawad Mahmud. MC Kamradeen 2. Ahmad Jia. Ahmad Tilly. Percy Rustamji. The Natal Mercury, September 30, 1893. A.C. Pillay. One proprietor of Dada Abdullah and Company, Durban, leading Indian firm, in connection with whose lawsuit Gandhiji first went to South Africa to Indian merchant of Johannesburg and active member of the Natal Indian Congress. Volume 1, 1884 30 November, 1896. 61. 29. Letter to the Natal Advertiser. To the editor, the Natal Advertiser. Pretoria, September 29, 1893. Sir, I have to request your indulgence for inserting the following in your paper to make an exhaustive reply to the program set forth by you for the would be Anti Asiatic League in your issue of the 19th Insta the Herculean task, and it cannot be undertaken in the compass of a letter to a newspaper. I would, however, with your permission, take up only two items. Viz, the fears about the coolie vote swamping the European vote, and the supposed unfitness of the Indians to vote. At the outset, I would appeal to your good sense, and the love of fair play which is supposed to be a characteristic of the British nation. No amount of facts or arguments would convince you or your readers of the justness of my remarks if you or they are resolved upon looking at one side only of the question. Cool judgment and a dispassionate and impartial inquiry are essential to a right view of the whole matter. Does it not appear a far-fetched view that the Indian vote can ever swamp the European vote? A mere superficial observer can see that such a thing can never happen. A sufficient number can never command the property qualifications to be able to outdo the European vote. They are divided into two classes he traders and the laborers. The latter are by far in the majority, and have no votes as a rule. Poverty-stricken, they come to natal on starvation wages. Can they ever dream of having enough property to qualify themselves for voting? And these are they who live here with any degree of permanence. Some only of the former class have the property qualifications. But then they do not live permanently in natal, and many of those who can legally vote would never care to do so. The Indians as a class never, even in their own country, avail themselves of all their political rights. They are too much taken up with their 62. Spiritual well-being to think of taking an active part in politics. They have no great political aspirations. They come not to be politicians, but to earn an honest bread, and it is a matter for regret if some do not earn it strictly honestly. So, then, it seems that all the fears about the Indian vote assuming portentous proportions are ill-grounded. And even the few votes that the Indians command cannot in any way affect natal politics. All talk about an Indian party clamoring for Indian representation seems to be chimerical, for the selection would always be between two white men. Would it, then, matter much that there are some Indian votes? The most the few votes can do will be to secure them a perfectly white gentleman, who would, if he is faithful to his promise, do them good service in the assembly. And fancy one or two such members making up an Indian party. Why, they, or rather he, would be a veritable John one crying in the wilderness without his electric, and perhaps I should say divine, power of converting. Even strong little parties representing diverse minor interests can affect very little in the imperial parliament. They can only heckle the first lord with a few questions, and have the satisfaction of seeing their names appear in the next morning's papers. Then, you think that they the Indians are not civilized enough to be fit for voting. That they may not be any better than the natives. And that they are certainly not equal to the Europeans in the scale of civilization. Perhaps not. And all would depend upon the meaning of the word civilization. It is impossible to enter into a full discussion of all the questions suggested by an inquiry into the matter. I may, however, be allowed to point out that they enjoy these privileges in India. The Queen's Proclamation of 1858 Hitch is justly and rightly called the Magna Charta of the Indian Sons.
We hold ourselves bound to the natives of our Indian territories by the same obligations of duty which bind us to all our other subjects, and these obligations by the blessing of Almighty God, we shall faithfully and conscientiously fulfill. It is our further will that, so far as may be, our subjects, of whatever race or creed, be freely and impartially admitted to offices in our service, the duties of which they may be qualified by their education, ability, and integrity, duly to discharge. I can produce other similar extracts relating to the Indians, but I. 1. The References to Jean the Baptist. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 63. I am afraid I have already trespassed too much upon your courtesy. I may add, however, that an Indian has been the acting Chief Justice of the High Court of Calcutta. An Indian is a judge of the High Court at Allahabad, whose co-religionists the Indian traders as a rule are. And an Indian is a member of the British Parliament. Moreover, the British government in many respects follow in the footsteps of Akbar the Great who ruled and lived in the 16th century. He was an Indian. The present land system is a copy of the policy of Tadermal, the great financier and an Indian, with but few modifications. If all this is the outcome, not of civilization, but of semi-barbarity, I have yet to learn what civilization means. If, in the face of all the above facts, you can foment dissensions, and set the European section of the community to work against the Indian section, you are great. I am, etc. M. K. Gandhi The Natal Advertiser, March 10, 1893 30. Work for Vegetarianism Mr. M. K. Gandhi, in a private letter from Pretoria, writes, There is a very fine opportunity in South Africa for vegetarian gardener. Cultivation is very much neglected though the soil is very fruitful. I am glad to say I have been able to induce my landlady, who is an Englishwoman, to become a vegetarian, and bring up her children on a vegetarian diet, but I am afraid she will slide down. Proper vegetables cannot be had here. Such as can be had are very dear. Fruit, too, is very dear. So is also milk. It therefore becomes very difficult to give her a sufficient variety. She would certainly leave it off if she finds it more expensive. I was very much interested in Mr. Hills's article on vital food when I intend giving it another trial very soon. You will recollect that I did when the theory of vital food was originally propagated by Mr. A.F. Hills, chairman of the Vegetarian Society, at its first quarterly meeting on February 4, 1889. In the first Diet of Paradise, he expounded, at some length, a somewhat remarkable theory of vitality, energy, rays of the sun, etc., which were to be found in the following foods, fruit, grain, nuts and pulse, all raw. Vide also an experiment in vital food, March 24, 1894. 64. Give it a trial when in Bombay, but not for a time long enough to warrant any opinion about it. Kindly remember me to all our friends. The Vegetarian September 30, 1893. 31. Guide to London 1893-94, one introduction in these days of cheap publication authors are constantly multiplying and have naturally lost a great deal of the respect they used to command before. Let me then at once inform the reader that, in issuing this little guide I am not aspiring to authorship, but simply supplying, as I believe, a long-felt want. Issuing guides does not make authors. They are made of sterner stuff. It will be readily admitted that, though Indians have been going to and returning from England for the last 20 years and more, no attempt has yet been made at writing a guide like this. Some of them have published books describing with much effect what is to be seen. One the exact date of writing is not available. PRL says, Comparative leisure at Pretoria enabled Gandhiji to resume two little unfinished ventures which he had launched while he was in India. One was a little handbook or guide to London that he had set about to prepare in answer to numerous inquiries on his return from London. It bears the evidence of having been written, at least in part, between the second half of 1893 and the first half 1894. He never published it. The Early Phase 
pages 316. In the introduction, Gantiji writes, and here the only topic of conversation with my visitors has been England till I have been sometimes literally bored vol 1, Guide to London. Introduction. Here in this sentence appears to refer to Indian. It is not known whether the introduction was written before or after the text, but it may be presumed that the work was commenced before Gantiji left for South Africa in 1893. Gantiji mentions the morning coat, now five years old, which he must have bought on reaching London in September 1888. Vide Volume 1, Guide to London, Chapter II. About the circumstances in which the MS was located, PRL writes, the existing copy was retrieved by me from a heap of papers littering the floor of the weaving shed in the Satyagraha ashram at Sabarmati, shortly after my arrival there in 1920. It being shown to Gantiji, he said that it had been made at his instance by one of his clerks in South Africa, who wrote a very bad hand, to improve his handwriting. Unfortunately some pages in the appendix are missing. The original could never be traced e.p. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 65. In England and elsewhere. But they have not gone further. They leave you in suspense, for they do create in you a desire for going to England, but how to do it they seem to have failed to tell. Scores of Indians have become barristers, yet no one has been bold to inform his countrymen how he managed to live in England. While there I received many from friends asking me to throw some light on one thing or another. And here the only topic of conversation with my visitors has been England till I have been sometimes literally bored. The avidity with which they have devoured the information must by itself justify the publication of this unpretentious guide. No doubt there are many reasons why a book like this has not been before the public long ago. Any such book in order to be exhaustive must necessarily contain important revelations which I know painfully would perhaps stir up a useless controversy and wrangle and which some would always like not to be made at all. The movements alike of students and laymen in England are shrouded in mystery. No one for instance knows definitely what an Indian eats in England, where he lives, whether he cooks his food or not, etc etc. Now these are the very points which are of vital importance to those who intend to go to England. The writer, therefore, of the following pages proposes to discover the mystery and lay bare the movements of Indians in England. Such a course, I hope, would facilitate to some extent the way to England in addition to helping the people to understand the England returned Indians, but I am afraid it will bring on me showers of reproaches and remonstrances from many persons. It may even cost me friendships. Some would call me rash, others would be content with seeing that I lacked tact one, while yet others would fling youth into my face, but I have resolved upon bearing the storm for the sake of truth. The next question is whether I am the person who should write such a book. I am inclined to leave it to the reader to a great extent to answer the question. I know there are persons who would tell the same story in a nobler language who would tell it with a greater accuracy, who would tell with a greater fullness and I know also that probably no one can combine in himself all the qualities. The only reason why I write the book is that no one has as yet written it though badly wanted. 1. The source has tactics. 66. As a rule the book will contain facts only and at times personal observations when absolutely necessary. If, at any time, anyone finds anything that he cannot understand or any error in the book, I shall thank him to correspond with me so that I may offer an explanation or correct the error. Before concluding the introduction, I beg all to extend me their cooperation, I. E. Help me by buying and, what is more necessary, reading the book so that they may help themselves. Facts which can be determined easily from other sources will not generally find place in this guide but the sources will be referred to. The province of the book is not to collect information from the existing books, but to attempt that which has not yet been attempted. Chapter 1 WHO should go to England? It may be laid down broadly that all who can afford should go to England. Of course, here the meaning of the word afford should be understood in its widest sense. 
Thus some cannot go to England because they cannot afford the money, some cannot afford through ill health, others cannot owing to young age and various other objections. All these will be briefly discussed in the following paragraphs. The first and the foremost question is the question of health. No one with a weak chest or a tendency to consumption should ever think of going to England. It will simply mean going to England in order to court death away from friends and relations. It is true that you can go to the south of Europe not only without injury to the constitution but with benefit to it. Thus you can go to the Riviera and be cured of consumption. Thousands of consumptive persons annually flock there to be cured of the fell disease. It is supposed to be one of the finest places for persons with weak chests. But all this means a great outlay of money. And then again the book is not written for invalids so that they may get cured by following the instructions therein contained. It is written for those with a good health who want to learn and be useful. Moreover it is for those who would go to England. It is true also that a person with a generally weak health might take a trip to England during the summer season without coming to much or any harm. Still, if I can venture to give an opinion, I should say that those with any chest disease whatever should never think of going to. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 67. England except under special circumstances and conditions. On the other hand, persons suffering from any disease due to a warm climate can do worse than going to England. I used to suffer from headaches and nose bleeding in India. I could not read for three or four hours at a stretch during the summer months without getting a headache. Now I am happy to say I am entirely free from both and this I ascribe mainly to the cold and invigorating climate of England. On their question of health if there be any doubt about it, it would be best always to consult some medical authority. The next question is as to age. It is very difficult to lay down any hard and fast rules for that. All parents must generally know when they can part with their children. The solution of the question depends moreover on the character of the boy who wants to go. Then again it depends on what he wants to do there. If he wants to pass the civil service examination, the limit of age is now 23. For a person desiring to be a barrister, he must be 21 years before he is called. He who wants to matriculate must be at least 16 years old. If you want to give your child a beginner's education, you can send it without a guardian to one of the many homes, where children only are educated and taken care of. Having so far dealt with the negative side, I come to the positive. To lay down broadly that all those who have money, a good constitution and are of proper age should go to England seems very tempting, but it is not sufficient. All such persons may inquire, why should we go to England? And I venture to answer, for the purposes of trade, travel or education. Nowadays many go there for education, some go there for traveling, but very few for trade, though the last is the most important for the material well-being of the country. Everyone knows that India wants trade more than anything else and that England is the best place for getting an insight into different trades. I do not for a moment hold that a person can learn trading only in England. What he does learn is the trading habits of the people. If he wants to extend his commerce with England, the more he knows the land and their people the better for him, from this it follows that he should go to England specially for that. Those who go there for the sake of education or travel do not and cannot make it their object to study everything relating to trade. There one sees different branches of commerce in a most efficient state. He sees also how the large establishments are carried on. A fellow with a trading. 68. Knowledge can know what would be the best things to trade in. Then again, if we had a direct communication with English gentlemen, we can dispense with agency. I know there are some Indians who have established themselves in England and are trading there. This is very good so far as it goes, but it does not go far enough. I am sorry to say that the management of these houses is far from satisfactory and consequently they are not doing a swinging business. I should like educated traders who have a good knowledge of English to go there, mix with the people, see the secret of their success and then return to India, 
open up branches in England and India in an improved style. I have been told that we stand a fair chance of doing a good business in selling carved wood and stones and feathers in England. Everyone knows how many feathers are daily wasted away in almost every part of India. Since they are a saleable commodity in Europe, we are wasting away real wealth simply through sheer ignorance or indifference. These are mere instances. There must be various other things which would sell in England. It is exactly because we do not know these things that we should go to England to learn what they are. Will a time come when every trading firm will send their man to England? Then as to traveling. Both the traders and students can combine a little traveling with their profession. These are travelers of a low type. Those who want to become professional travelers, who want to write books on travels must go there for the special purpose of traveling. But I believe such persons had better see their own country first. I cannot do better than quote Mr. Malabari on the point, in study as in travel it is best to begin at the very beginning and to proceed by slow stages, gaining something at every stage and that something such as to be of immediate practical use at the next stage. When you travel or study by degrees, every fresh step or item of knowledge is a keen enjoyment. You are prepared to receive it and, thus received, your knowledge will fructify. But when knowledge is thrust upon you without previous discipline, that is, without your being fit for it, it will be inert and unleavened. What is the use of visiting foreign countries when you know nothing of your own? When you go to Europe ignorant of your own national life, you will miss those thousand points of comparison and contrast, those thousand shades of difference those thousand beauties and blemishes that modern European civilization presents. At the best you will look at things, not see or see through them. These are wise words worthy of serious consideration. The Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896 69 Outcome of it is that you should begin not at the wrong end. Last of all comes education. It is with very much regret that I have to record here that almost all who go to England for the purpose of education go there in order to become barristers. Education does not mean becoming barristers. I shall have a good deal to say about barristers in a separate chapter, so here I shall just say what other things you can do there. Of course the most coveted examination is the civil service examination. But those only who are British-born subjects can go in for that examination. Engineering is another branch of education which you can learn at the Coopers Hill College. You can get the highest medical degree at the London University. It has turned out most eminent doctors, but it is a long course and, though theoretically requiring only five years, requires practically seven years. Oxford and Cambridge universities impart a very good education. They are men for the richer classes, not the poor. The education received in these universities is quite different from that received in the Indian universities. They are not so exacting as our universities here. Again, in India generally it is all work which, as is said, with no play makes Jack a dull boy. The Oxford and Cambridge education combines both work and play. That university life is not a drudgery as I suppose. Unfortunately, it is here. It would be impossible to give exhaustive information about the various centers of education. They can only be pointed out. The secretaries of all these institutions can be written to and will send prospectuses where from every detailed information can be gathered. Edinburgh too is a place which has become a favorite place with the Indians, mostly medical students. The medical course there is far easier than the London course which of course, is the hardest. The Durham University, too, gives a medical diploma. It might be urged that all these things can be had here and at a less cost. I would admit the former though not the latter. However, the mere fact that the same thing can be had in India is not sufficient. The question is which is of superior quality. Is not education in any branch far superior in England to that in India? Cannot a man learn more during the same time in England than in India? The last proposition is self-evident. A student here is half student and half man. He may be married too. In that case, he has to think of his wife, 
perhaps children, in addition to household cares which an Indian student is generally saddled with. While, in England, he is alone, no. 70. Wife to tease or flatter him, no parents to indulge, no children to look after, no company to disturb. He is the master of his time. So, if he has the will, he can do more. Moreover, the invigorating climate in England is by itself a stimulant to work, the enervating climate of India is a stimulant to idleness. Who has not passed idle hours in a summer noon? Who has not wished he had nothing to do in summer but to sleep? Of course, persons are there who never cease to work in India. In fact, hardest working students are found in India. But that work is against the will. In England, it does not do to be idle. You like the work for the sake of it. You cannot help working. I have heard it said of a very learned professor that he read as much in three years in England as he would have in nine years in India. That amount of work which tells upon one's health in India can be gone through with ease in England. An instance is at our very doors. Do we not work more in winter than in summer? So, then, it will not be doubted that a person willing to work will do more in England than in India. It is needless to mention the advantage that we have in England of talking in the English language the whole of our time. It is fervently to be hoped that examples of persons having cut a sorry figure will not be cited in refutation of the above proposition. For such fall under the category of those who are not willing to work, while we are here talking of persons who seek more opportunities for work in England than in India. It will be very uncharitable to expect drones to return types of learning from England. There are the better opportunities, it is for you to avail of them. If you do not, you are to blame, not England. And if superior education can be obtained in England, it follows that it is not more expensive than that to be obtained in India, if the ratio of superiority be the same as that of increased expenses. Chapter 2 Preliminaries Having in the previous chapter shown who should go to England, I now proceed to describe what preliminaries one has to make before starting. In so doing if I may at times enter into the most trifling details, I hope the reader will not take it as an insult. The standard by which I go is my intelligence and lower still if possible and I shall describe things which required an explanation in my case when I left for England. The first consideration is that of money. The amount of money. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 71. The candidate has to take with him will be given later on, but whatever the amount, let him make absolutely sure of getting the full amount in England. In certain cases it may be advisable to take the whole amount with him. I know by personal experience how even persons who have promised on oath to give some pecuniary assistance, alone mind you, not an absolute gift and whom you think you can safely depend upon prove false to their promises one inch London you do not often find persons who would give you a loan even. The loan too is generally big, for when you do not get the promised money, it is not a small sum, but a tolerably large one which you would not expect any friend to lend. I know by personal experience and that of friends what it is for an Indian to be without money even for a moment in England. It involves an extra expense of wiring home, not to speak of the anxieties one has to suffer under such circumstances, and wiring to India is very expensive. It is four shillings per word. Therefore be sure you will get a sufficient amount of money and that, too, at the proper time. Then, if possible, it is always advisable to get some introduction notes to gentlemen in England. They are not absolutely necessary, but when you can get them, they are not useless. You know that you will have some friends when you reach there. They are a consolation and, at times, friendships built upon such introduction notes become lasting and genuine too. Now you have to consider what things to take with you, where to buy the passage and where to put up on reaching London. I shall first give a list of necessary things and then offer a few remarks thereon, when deemed necessary. One overcoat, one morning coat, one waistcoat, one jacket, suit, vest, jacket, three pairs of trousers. R.S. As 30 0 20 0 10 0 30 0 27 0. One vide and autobiography, P.T. 
I C H X I I I. Also draft of letter to Frederick Lely, December 1888. To Vide an autobiography, P T I C H X I I I. 72. Three drawers woolen. Three cotton or merino. Three woolen vests. Three cotton or merino vests. Three woolen shirts without collars. Six woolen shirts with collars. One white shirt. One pair of braces. Three stand-up collars. Mother of pearl studs. Links. Twelve handkerchiefs. Two sleeping suits woolen. One pair of gloves. One rug. Six cotton or merino socks. Three woolen socks. BF. One rug strap, one pair of slippers, one pair of shoes, one boots, one Turkish cap, one cloth brush, one hair brush, one toothbrush, one shaving brush, one razor, one razor strap, one comb, one shaving stick, tongue scraper, volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 15060120406160180414152010030402028 RS. As 228-8-18-14-40-60-14-10-10-04-10-20-20-08-10-04-73. Note paper. 08. Envelopes to match. 04. Traveling inkstand. 08. Penholder and pocket pencil. 08. Blotting. 04. Pins and needles and thread. 04. Penknife. 18. Pen zero. 8. Money purse. 08. Stick. 10. Deck chair. 50. Two trunks. 16 zero. Some books. Umbrella. 40. Total. RS. 282 4. To buy the above things care must be taken that the best things are bought at the cheapest prices and that the things bought are suitable. There are many shops in Bombay. Some of the native shops are very good. The English shops would be found to be very expensive. Whenever practicable, it is always best to get some experienced person to buy the things for you. It may not be useless here to make a few remarks on the above list. Two trunks have been mentioned in the list and the price for both has been put down at RS 16 slash. Each trunk may be 26 x 121. Generally they buy one steel trunk and a leather bag. And one of THOE best steel trunks would cost RS 25 and a leather bag Gladstone bag old cost much the same. This expense is not necessary. A good trunk can be bought for RS 12. In putting down the price at RS-16 I have in my mind native iron trunks which are as strong as, if not stronger than, the steel trunks. That would be an encouragement to native industry and a saving of a few rupees to the purchaser. If the native trunks do not suit or if they cannot be had, wooden boxes can be bought or imitation steel trunks which do not cost more than RS-5 each. The P. And O rules say with regard to the size of the trunks. One obviously inches 74. The portmanteau for cabin use should not exceed 3 feet in length, 1 foot 9 inches in width and 1 foot and 3 inches in depth. No packages exceeding this limit are allowed in the saloons or cabins. The prices for other articles are not by any means the lowest prices. For example, while I have put down one slash rupee for a pair of two socks, a good pair can be had for five or six annas. If good woolen socks cannot be had in Bombay, they may be bought in London. For six socks would answer the purpose in the boat. With the clothing mentioned in the above list one need not spend anything on dress for a year in England. A further list of clothing will be given later on. It may be bought in England if it is found necessary. And that would give one more than enough clothing for a three years stay in England. Certain things that are generally included in such lists have been purposely left out, for example, towels, soap, etc. These things can be had gratis on board. Foreign stamps can be bought on board. As to what dress to wear on board, it is best to begin with the jacket suit. 
It is not at all necessary to wear the undervest or the drawers. They should be made use of only when the cold weather has begun. It is always advisable not to overload oneself with dress. I have come across many persons who have suffered from overclothing. Of course, it is equally necessary not to underclothe. The undervest and drawers would not be required till the steamer reaches Port Said. 4. The weather to be met with from Bombay to Port Said is not less warm than that we experience in India. If cold is felt after leaving Port Said, the cotton underclothing may be worn or, if necessary, the woolen underclothing. Till Brindisi is reached the overcoat may not be touched at all. It must be understood that this is not the condition in which all can live. No hard and fast rules can be laid down for clothing. The above remarks have been made simply to remove the generally prevalent idea that the underclothing and the overcoat are absolutely necessary as soon as the steamer leaves the harbor. The safest thing to do is to begin to wear more and warmer clothes according to necessity. The white shirts have almost been left out. This may be considered a hardship not because they are a climatic necessity but because they are a fashion. Well, this is a book meant for those who want to live cheaply and yet respectably. One can safely break through fashion especially when it is expensive and injurious, but the process should not be gone through violently. The White Shirts Have Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896 75 been left out because they swell up the weekly washing bill to a very great extent. A white shirt would cost 4d to wash while a flannel shirt would cost only 2d. Again, while one flannel shirt per week is sufficient, at least two white shirts would hardly answer the purpose. They spoil sooner than the flannel shirts. Indeed, some unconventional gentlemen in England who have ceased adoring the fashion as a goddess have discarded stiff clothing altogether. They have bidden goodbye to the stiff collars, cuffs and the shirts. Even medical opinion has begun to revolt against too much use of starch which is absolutely necessary for washing white shirts. The starch has been pronounced to be injurious to the body. Whatever it is, there is no denying the fact that flannel shirts are more comfortable and, in the end, less expensive than linen shirts. However, if the fashion is to be adored as it ought to be more or less, if you are not to break through it violently, wear the flannel shirts without collars. Use the white collars and cuffs and you would lead others to believe that you have white shirts on. This trick is resorted to by thousands in London and sometimes it is very convenient. And, if at times, you like to look a London swell, that too has been provided for. A white shirt would be found mentioned in the list and may be used occasionally. As a token of respect to the fashion goddess, the neckties too have not been forgotten. They will find a place in the further list. They might be used or not according to one's fancies. They do not cost much if bought cheaply. The morning coat is worn on visits. On board, too, if you are a first saloon passenger, it is a necessity. As far as possible, you should wear the jacket suit so that the morning coat may not be spoiled. The writer of these pages had only one morning coat. It is now five years old and yet looks as new as if it were made yesterday. As soon as it is done with, brush it well, fold it and put it in your chest of drawers and it would never spoil. Shaving materials are mentioned in the list. Do not be surprised. You shall not be a professional barber but you will have to shave yourself if you have a beard. Even kings are not ashamed of so doing in Europe. If you have thick hair, you have to shave every day. It is a trouble to be at the mercy of a barber every day and incur an expense of at least 2d. To say that it is necessary to learn how to shave oneself. It does not take long. Only a few minutes spent for three or four days would be found sufficient. 76. For headdress the Turkish cap is mentioned. This is very handy. But, for one who feels uncomfortable in the cap and does not like to be noticed by people, a felt hat is mentioned in the second list that is to follow. For tooth powder the best medically and yet the cheapest powder is precipitated chalk. You can get 4 ounces for 6d. This will last for months. 
Slippers are to be worn at home and on board only. There is another item of dress that has been left out from the list. It is the dress suit. Now this is not at all necessary. Although many Indians buy it, it is not advisable to incur that expense. I bought it myself and am very sorry for it. I wore it but three or four times. I consider that to be the most foolish expense I incurred in England. They wear it for evening parties. We Indians can wear the morning coat or the Parsi coat or our own native dress whatever that may be. I have seen many Indians wearing the morning coat. There is nothing wrong in it. You have to look clean and tidy, nothing more. A watch has not been mentioned in the list. 4. It has become an article of everyday wear among the educated Indians. The second list will be found in the fourth chapter. The articles contained in it are to be bought in England. No one should go beyond the list unless he uses his clothes very carelessly and, if one goes to England to become or remain careless, might it not be said, he had better not go at all. The two lists include more than ordinarily required clothing for an ordinarily careful man for three years. The next thing that one has to do is to buy the passage. Three things are to be considered before buying it, viz. 1. What month to start in 2. Whether to go all the way by sea or via Brindisi. 3. Whether to go by the P. And O boats or any other companies. As to the first question, while one can start in any month, all things considered the middle of March is the best season. Thereby one avoids immediate experience of English winter and, before he meets with the bitter cold, he will have six beautiful months, viz., from April to September. April is the depth of spring and September the beginning of autumn. Before he has the first experience of an English winter, he will have been acclimatized and accustomed to the English ways of living. He would thus be able to bear the winter with a greater equanimity. Moreover by starting in March, one gets the mildest. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 77. Weather in the Red Sea. And even the mildest weather of the Red Sea is most trying. In summer, although only three days have to be spent on the Red Sea, it is unbearable. The heat is suffocating. No use of punkhas and ice is sufficient to allay the burning sensation. It is a time of perpetual perspiration. Moreover, in March the sea all the way is the calmest in the year. The next best time is September or October. By leaving at that time, of course, you have to brave the winter as soon as you reach England, but if you want to become a barrister, you have this consolation that you would be able to return home three months earlier than by starting in any other month. This will be treated more fully in the chapter for would-be barristers. Having selected the season, one has to consider what would be the best thing to do whether to go all the way by sea or via Brindisi. It takes nearly 22 days by the P&O boats to reach London and 13 days to reach Brindisi, whence London is reached in two days by rail. It seems that it is much better to take the sea route throughout. Thereby all the inconveniences of removing luggage and having it examined, etc., are avoided and all the comforts to be found in P&O boats are enjoyed for a longer time. Moreover, a long voyage is very good for health. Some remain on the seas for months for the sake of health only. It is, therefore, advisable that one should take the sea voyage when especially it causes a saving of expense. The second saloon fare to London by sea is RS 370, while via Brindisi it is more than RS 400. Those who get seasick very often need not be afraid of a sea voyage on that score. For during the 13 days for Brindisi one gets used to the sea and overcomes the sickness. It is to be hoped that no one would avoid the voyage from Brindisi for the reason that thereby he would be less open to the dangers of a wreck. This is an idea unworthy of one intending to go to England. It must be remembered that he would be one out of many in his steamer. There are dangers even on the railway. In fact, nowhere is life without dangers. It is a question merely of degree. The next question to be decided is what company's boat to go by. There is a very wide field for selection. There are the city, hall, clan, etc., steamers. 
but by far the best and most popular are the Peninsular and Oriental Company's boats, which carry Her Majesty's mails to London. The other lines are a trifle cheaper than the last mentioned and, if anyone chooses to book his passage on any of the above lines. 78. He can see the manager and make arrangements. For there are no fixed rates for these lines. However, whenever practicable, P and O boats should be preferred. The passage can be booked through Messrs. King and Company, or Messrs. Thomas Cook and Sons at Bombay who are always obliging and ready to supply every information. They do not charge any commission. Whether to take the first saloon or the second saloon ticket, very much depends upon one's purse. As to comforts, there is not much difference. Of course, a first saloon passenger gets better company and better food. The food, however, given in the second saloon is good enough. And, especially, a vegetarian should not incur the expenses of a first saloon passage. The main difference is in food and, since a vegetarian would not take flesh meat, for him the first saloon expense would be entirely unnecessary. The second saloon by sea costs RS 370, while the first saloon costs RS 680. A second saloon passage via Brindisi including second class railway ticket costs RS 445 and a first class railway ticket costs RS 500, while a first saloon with first class railway ticket costs RS 810. First saloon passengers are allowed on board 336 pounds of personal luggage free of freight and the second saloon passengers 168 pounds. A few remarks about food, etc on board would not be out of place here. For those who do not object to meat, nothing specially need be mentioned here except everything one can wish for can ordinarily be had on the steamer. The only complaint that can be urged against the company in respect of food is that the passengers are overfed. From morning till evening or, even as late as 11 o'clock, one can get something to eat at short intervals. As early as 6 or 7 o'clock, you get biscuits and tea or coffee. At 8.30 a.m., you get breakfast consisting of oatmeal porridge, jam, marmalade, bread, butter, salad, meat and potatoes ad libitum. At 1 p.m., you get a good dinner consisting of meat, potatoes and cabbage, some sweet, bread, butter, etc., and twice in a week fruit and nuts. At 4 p.m., you can have a cup of tea and biscuits again at 6 p.m. A nice supper consisting of salad, cheese, bread, butter, jam, marmalade, tea, cocoa, etc., is provided and, as a finishing stroke, just at the time of going to bed, you can replenish the hungry stomach with biscuits and cheese. All this to an Indian would sound very strange and look like gluttony. A vegetarian must have found from the above that plenty of things can be had in the steamer that he can take. An Indian Who Has Not. Volume 1, 1884 30 November, 1896. 79. Been used to English dishes would, it is very likely, not relish the above dishes for some time. Though, after some time, he would find that all the dishes are very nice and nutritious. As a precaution, it would be better to keep a stock of some fresh fruit and sweets, for example, jalebi, halva, etc and some salty things, for example, Ganthia 1, etc. These with English dishes now and then would quite suffice. Care should be taken that English dishes are increased and the quantity of native things taken decreased. Such a gradual change would be effected imperceptibly and without affecting the constitution. The things to be found on board for vegetarian are bread, butter, milk, fruit, nuts, jam, marmalade, rice cheese, potatoes, cabbage, salad, cakes, tea, coffee, biscuits and porridge. This is really a large variety out of which many meals containing quite distinct articles can be made. Nothing can be more nutritious than porridge, bread and butter and a cup of cocoa or if you like tea. For dinner you can have one course of bread, butter and vegetables, another course of rice, milk and jam a sweet preparation and a third course of some fruit or bread and cheese. You can make a very good supper of bread, 
butter and cocoa and jam and salad or cheese or both. If these be not sufficient, special arrangements are made for vegetarians. The chief steward should be informed and requested to prepare some vegetable dishes and he very obligingly gets for you vegetable curry, fresh fruit and stewed fruit and brown bread. And you cannot want anything more. Some interesting facts would be found from the appendix as to how the writer of these pages managed on board too if a pious Indian does not want to eat food cooked by Europeans, he can cook his own food in the Indian quarters, where they would give a space for cooking. Whether this is advisable or not is quite another matter. This is mentioned just to remove the prevailing prejudice to the effect that on board one has no other course open but to take food cooked by the Europeans. The much vexed and important question whether it is possible to remain a vegetarian on board and in England will be discussed in another chapter. It is sufficient to mention for the present purposes that it is not at all necessary to take meat or wine and it is positively injurious to take the latter. 1. The source has this in Devnagari script. Reference to a preparation made of grain flour. 2. Vide also an autobiography, P.T. I. C.H. XIII. 80. Having landed in London, where to go seems to present some difficulty. The editor of The Vegetarian, a newspaper published in London Memorial Hall, Farringdon Street, has kindly consented to give the necessary directions and find them the proper lodgings where they can have everything cheap and nice. Here I may be allowed to say a word about The Vegetarian. It is a paper which I believe should be subscribed to by every Indian who would see Englishmen as vegetarians and who would sympathize with the movement now going on in London. It should be bought not especially as mental food, not for the sake of the information given by it, not for the high-class intellectual matter contained in it, though these are by no means of an inferior quality, but for encouraging a movement every Indian should have at heart, to return, however, to the main subject. The people of the London Vegetarian Society are always kind and hospitable towards Indians and a more genial man than the editor of the Vegetarian it would be difficult to find. It would, therefore, be a great gain for every Indian going to England to let the editor know of his so doing. I may perhaps suggest, though the suggestion has nothing whatever to do with the editor, that in common fairness every such person would subscribe himself as a member of the society or subscribe to the paper. But, if the above arrangement be not deemed feasible or advisable, the next best thing to do would be put up at the Vegetarian Hotel, Charing Cross, be he a vegetarian or meat-eater. A list one of houses would be found at the end of the book where from to make a selection. The terms in the appendix places are very reasonable. Other hotels would be found very dear. On landing, a cab can always be had which would take you, on your giving the name to the place named. These lodgings, it must be understood, are only temporary until a permanent one is found. So the next thing to do would be to search for a good and suitable room. This can be done in the company of some friend whom you may be knowing or to whom you have got an introduction note. Chapter 3 The Cost of Living This is the stumbling block. This is the question which is the 1. This is not available in Appendix A as some pages are missing. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 81. Most inviting and yet most repulsive. To enter into that question seriously is to differ from everybody. Every man would furnish his own estimates, thinking at the same time that no other estimates could be true and, if true, possible for everyone. That again is the question which is the most important, especially, to a man of ordinary circumstances. And it is strange that, although the question is admittedly of such a vast importance, greater ignorance does not prevail with regard to any question ordinarily presenting itself to an Indian wishing to go to England than with regard to this. It is moreover true that the ordinary estimates quoted are from 10 to 20 pounds per month. Living on zero per month was pronounced to be very economical. With such estimates to say that one can live comfortably on a month or a week could be a heresy, nevertheless, it is a fact beyond doubt, as shall be proved just now, that it is possible to live on one pound a week and that many have lived on less. 
I may say that I have tried the experiment successfully and was never happier than under the living. While I was living on per month, I had to work the hardest. The reader will find from app. A. How, from two per month, I gradually came down to per month. First of all, I shall consider the cost of lodgings. It is commonly supposed that a student should have two rooms, one bedroom and one sitting room. Now this is quite useless except to show that you are very rich and can afford to spend any amount of money. This guide is not written for those who would make a show very often false of their riches. It is written for those who would live a regular student's life as economical as possible. There are many professional gentlemen bachelors living in one room only. Of course, there are many Indian students and thousands of English students living in one room only. Two rooms are more for families than for students. Then if you have one room only with the necessary furniture in a good quarter, it can be had for sevens per week and less. Of course, one room can be had for twos per week. I give low estimates. Such rooms can be had in North London, West, Central, West Kensington, Westbourne Park, and many other respectable parts of London commonly favored by Indian students. In such a room you would find a table, three or four chairs, an easy chair, a wash stand with all the requisites, a hearth, a chest of drawers, probably a bookcase, cupboard, a carpet, a bedstead with bed sheets and blankets, a looking glass, etc. Are Indian students used to better furnished rooms? Indeed, a raw Indian not used to the two rooms would be quite enchanted with such a room. 82 and would not wish for a better one. When I first saw my room in the Victoria Hotel, I thought I could pass a lifetime in that room. It is always best to find out a room in the neighborhood of a place to be frequented most by you, thereby a great deal of money required in traveling by bus or tram is saved. Secondly, as to other expenses, for example, washing, bathing, etc. Your washerman's bill need not amount to more than 11 pence per week, which is as follows. D. One flannel shirt. 2. One drawers. 2. One vest. 2. Two handkerchiefs. 1. One sleeping suit. 4. Total. 11 D. A saving can be effected in the above if you do not use the Drawers which you need not, in summer especially. The sleeping suits may be changed fortnightly. Moreover, with a little care, a good washerman can be found who would wash the drawers and suits for 11 slash d each and sleeping suits for 3 d. If and when you wear the white two shirts regularly for a week, instead of the flannel shirt, the washerman's bill would be heavier by 6 or 8 d. But under no circumstances should it amount to more than 11d per week on an average. As to bathing, it is only in the newly built houses that bathrooms are attached to them. In ordinary houses no bathrooms can be found. In such cases very many visit the public baths weekly which cost 6d or 4d. But it is possible to have a daily bath without any expense. Wherever you go. You can take a sponge bath with two or three tumblers of hot water always to be supplied at your request by the landlady in the morning. You can pour water into your basin, dip a sponge in it and rub hard with the sponge twice or thrice and then rub the body with a dry towel, and you have taken a very nice bath which gives a glow to the body and keeps it clean. Even the sponge may be left out and the hands only used. To these daily baths may be added a fortnightly or monthly visit to the public baths. Your landlady supplies you with two towels every week. All these arrangements must be made with the landlady before engaging your room so that no misunderstanding may arise in future. Whenever you go to engage a volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 83. Room. Explain to the landlady what you want to have included in the weekly rent. Boot black, sheets, towels, service, hot water in the morning, etc., are generally included. 
It is not true to say, as is commonly supposed, that owing to the severe cold one cannot take baths daily. On the other hand, it is necessary that one should bathe daily in order to keep good health. A landlady, I know, drove away her boarder simply because he would not take his daily bath. She often used to quote, cleanliness is next to godliness, and, no matter how cold it was, she used to see every morning that everyone in her house had a bath. Next to bathing come traveling expenses, which should not amount to more than 60 per week. By having your room in the neighborhood of the place to be most frequented by you, you avoid the daily expense of traveling to the place, but on Sundays you may visit friends and spend a few pence in traveling. Of course, one week you may spend a shilling if need be and not spend anything the next week. It is always best, whenever possible, to walk so that you may have exercise at the same time that you save the money. Nothing can be better. Many do this purposely in England, not so much for the sake of saving a few pence, as for the sake of exercise. Walking three or four miles is a pleasure in the cold climate of England. Indeed, whenever it is possible in the cold weather, a brisk walk should be preferred to a ride in a train or a bus. Very often the latter proves injurious. I was once literally stiff in a bus. Even the bus conductors recognize the danger. At intervals they run with the bus and get into it when they are warm. Six pence per week on an average may be set apart for stamps, etc., though such sum is hardly necessary. If you have your hair cut twice every month, it would cost you a D, so that 2D per week may be put down for hair cutting. Of course, you shave yourself. One cake of Paris soap would last a month. It costs 31 slash D. So two then one D per week may be allowed for soap. One penny per week may be set aside for tooth powder. This is rather extravagant. You can have a very fine and harmless tooth powder and precipitated chalk, four ounces of which can be had for 6 D. And an ounce would last you quite a month instead of a week. There is one big item of expenditure that should not be lost sight of. In winter, fire is required in the room during the daytime if 84. You use the room. For those who use the library in the case of Stude. NTS, the expense does not amount to much. But for others, it amounts to nearly two shillings per week. For two shillings you can get four scuttles. Coal. But, as fire is not required generally from April to September, we may put down on an average one shilling per week for coals. This ends the extra expenditure per week which may be thus summed up. D. Washerman's Bill. 11. Bathing. 6. Traveling expenses. 6. Stamps, etc. 6. Haircutting. 2. Soap. 1. Tooth powder. 1. Coal. 12. Margin. 3. Total for SOD. With 7s for the room rent and 4s for extras we have 9s. Remaining for food. It may here be remarked that a saving can be effected even in the 11s, whenever required, so that it may be spent on food or buying books and many other useful things. Thus, for instance, out of 6d for stamps, etc., only a penny or two may be spent. One penny, I suppose, would be absolutely necessary for writing. Home a postcard. Fortnightly baths in winter especially may take the place of weekly baths when a sponge bath is taken daily. Similarly, at times, nothing may be spent in traveling. It is an expense to be counted, not necessary to be incurred. The aim ought to be not to Spend more than one pound per week on an average and live comfortably. Passing now from this comparatively incontestable part of the question of the cost of living, we reach the most important and contestable part of the question, viz., the cost of food. There is so much to be said on this part of the subject, so much prejudice and misunderstanding to be removed that to treat the subject 
fully would require a separate and larger book. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 85. How to get good, nutritious, healthy and palatable food for nines per week is the question before us. At the outset I may say that those only can live on that some who eat to live, not live to eat. If you must have the luxuries, if you cannot sit at the table without company, if you must entertain friends pretty frequently to sumptuous dinners, if you must live like a gourmand, then for you ten times the sum may not be sufficient. But if you would live ruefully and happily and not luxuriously, nines per week would be more than sufficient. I earnestly beseech the reader to dismiss from his mind all premeditated ideas, all prejudice, and he will, I am sure, see for himself that without entailing any loss of health, but rather keeping it up, he would find nine sufficient for his food per week. As nothing tells like illustrations, I would first cite illustrations in support of the contention that one pound a week is sufficient for a person of frugal habits and not born in the lap of luxury or rather not addicted to a luxurious mode of living. There are thousands of commercial gentlemen living on one pound a week in England. I had a chat with an Anglo-Indian here who said that he was living on one pound a week. There is a gentleman who is an M.A., B.E.L., barrister at law, who lived on tens a week and has yet been living on less than one pound a week. He is the editor of a newspaper and I have seen him work at the rate of 16 hours or more per diem. He was, when I saw him last, living on bread, figs and water. There are Irish MPS living on one pound per week. And some of them are the best debaters. The late Mr. Bigger, MP, I believe, lived on one pound a week. And what did Charles Bridlaw do? Says Mrs. Annie Besant of him, he sold everything he possessed except his books. His home that he had got together by hard work, his furniture, even a diamond ring given to him by a grateful person whom he had helped. He sent his children to school. His wife, not physically able to bear the life he faced, went to live with her parents in the country and he took two small rooms in Turner Street, Whitechapel, for which he paid three sixty a week and where he remained until he had cleared off most of his liabilities. He then moved to lodgings over a music shop in Circus Road, St. John's Wood, where he lived for the remainder of his life his daughters joining him on the death of their mother in 1877. He died poor indeed with no personal property save his library, his Indian gifts and his very modest wardrobe, but he left his name free, his honor unstained. 86. He began life on tens a week. And we all know how clever intellectually and how strong in body he was. So far as food is concerned, his food did not cost Cardinal Manning more than nine shillings per week if what is written about him be true. There are, to take a noted and living example, few harder working men in England than Archbishop Manning, a man full of cares and labors, yet I am assured by those who have had the most intimate personal relations with him that Mr. Disraeli in Lothair has not in the least exaggerated his habitual abstinence and that his ordinary meal, in public or private, is a biscuit or a bit of bread and a glass of water. His strict abstinence from wines is notorious. Dr. Nichols from whose work the above has been taken did not, and probably does not, spend more than 60 a day on food. 360 per week. He has written a book How to Live on Sixpence a Day, a book everybody who would live frugally ought to read. In it he relates his experiment with the most gratifying results. There are many other books written on the subject. There is a book entitled How to Live on One Pound a Week. This includes everything, lodging, food, clothes, etc. Indeed, a gentleman has even tried to limit his food expenses to one shilling a week and written a book on the subject. We however allow nine times the sum for food. All these instances must suffice to show that, not only is it possible to live on a week, but many have done it. Has any Indian done it, some may ask. Yes, a gentleman, a judge from the Punjab, while I was in England came there, for a barrister's education on furlough. He was over forty years of age and was with his son in England. He said his pay was RS 150. He gave, he said, 
RS50 to his wife at home and spent RS50 for himself and his boy in London. That amounted to 1 slash per month, that is, less than 3 per week for two souls. This small sum was made to include many things besides those that we allow for one pound. Another Indian gentleman from Gujarat was living on less than tens per week and seemed to be quite happy. He shared a room for fours with a friend and thus got his accommodation for twos only. This gentleman has been receiving medical education in England. Sadhu Narayan Hemchandra has been living on one pound a week when he has a one vide and autobiography, pt. i, ch. xxii. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 87. Room for sixes a week. He spends three or four d for washing and sevens for food per week. He works very hard. He says in his letter that he knows now German, English and French. In one pound per week he manages to buy his clothes and books of which I brought to India a box full. He must have bought quite as many, if not more, by this time. A gentleman who has recently gone to England writes thus to me, From my last letter you might have thought very badly of me because I myself look upon my conduct at the time with little satisfaction. But, as you wanted to know how I was living, I had to give you my sincere views. Since that time a great change has been brought about by degrees. What I thought an impossibility at that time is now a practical possibility. Six pounds a month are a thing of the past, and you will wonder to hear that, even in London, I am able to limit my board and lodging expenses to three pounds per month. With this array of facts before the reader, I hope he will have no difficulty in following and agreeing with me that, if one has the will, one can live on one pound a week and even less in England. Now we come to the solution of the question how to live on nines a week. In the first place it may be mentioned that, to live so cheaply, all the luxuries ought to be avoided, viz, tea, coffee, tobacco and wines and, last but not least, flesh foods. There are people to tell you that it is impossible to do without tea in England. Some say you cannot do without coffee, others say you would die without tobacco, wines or meat. All these gentlemen must be questioned as to the source of their information and the difficulty will be solved. It is all humbug and hearsay. There is difference of opinion as to flesh foods. As to the rest, Every Indian who has gone to England would tell you that not one of them is necessary except for the sake of pleasure of luxury. However what do they think of tea and coffee in London? Says Dr. Nichols about tea and coffee, even the milder stimulants such as tea and coffee have no appreciable nutritive value. If the leaves of tea or the berries of coffee had as much nutrition as the same weight of spinach, but an infinitesimal portion can be in the decoctions we drink. In the matter of food and as the materials of bone, muscle or nerve, an ounce of bread is worth gallons of tea or coffee. The sugar and milk drunk in them are food, all the rest is almost worthless. They soothe hunger as narcotics and sedatives, some physiologists are of opinion that they prevent waste and so make less food necessary. If this were true, it would be injurious, for waste and the removal of waste matter are necessary to the 88 health of the system. Tea and coffee are stimulants only and their influence upon the body is either inappreciable or hurtful. Strong decoctions of either stimulate the brain and nerves, produce overaction and, by combating fatigue for a time, allows us to overtask our powers until we bring on dyspepsia, neuralgia, softening of the brain, paralysis, apoplexy. A distinguished Indian doctor of considerable experience, while talking about tea, said that he refused to treat patients who would not leave off tea under his treatment. However, if tea and coffee are to be taken, they would not mean so much more expense as so much less nutritive food. For they will be substituted for milk which is far better than tea or coffee. From a pecuniary point of view, a cup of tea or coffee made at home would cost less than a glass of milk. If tea is to be taken, it would be better to use condensed milk as it would be difficult to buy milk sufficient only for one or two cups of tea, unless only milk is used for making tea. As to tobacco, 
It is positively injurious to the system and an expensive luxury which does no good and a great deal of harm. Tobacco, it must be known, is very dear in England. If it is indulged in, sixpence would be ordinarily required daily. It cost an Indian gentleman zero during his three years stay. A good cigar costs four to six d and a cigarette one d each. One can get five cigarettes for a penny, but this is the dirtiest stuff possible. It contains either ashes of tobacco or cabbage leaves. So in order to be able to live well on a week, it is absolutely necessary to abstain from one tobacco which whether chewed or smoked or snuffed has no nutritive property but is an acrid poison, absorbed into the blood and resting upon the brain and nerves, first exciting and then dulling their sensibility and finally stupefying and paralyzing. Thus hatefully does Count Tolstoy, than whom few men have been more given to wine and cigarettes, speak of both. People drink and smoke not merely for want of something better to do to while away the time or to raise their spirits, not because of the pleasure they receive, but simply and solely in order to drown the warning voice of conscience. To illustrate the proposition he says, no one would take the liberty to flood with water a room in which people were sitting to scream and yell in it or to perform any other acts tending to disturb or injure others and yet out of a thousand smokers scarcely. One source is damaged here. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 89. One will hesitate to fill with noxious fumes a room the atmosphere of which is being breathed by women and children who do not smoke. Indeed. This nuisance is so much felt that, in railway carriages, special compartments for smoking are reserved. In orderly houses smoking rooms are set apart for young men who are never allowed to smoking in dining rooms. A friend was taken to task for smoking in a shelter on the staircase of the house he was living in says the court further, for the more a man stupefies himself with these stimulants, narcotics, the more stolid, quiescent and stagnant he become intellectually and morally. We all know what deeds are committed by men in a drunken state. As to the wines, the above quotations are sufficient to show what a man who used to drink fearfully thinks of them. It is not necessary to quote extracts to prove that wines are injurious and that we are not required to drink wines in England. There are hundreds of societies to convince you of the fact that wines are not necessary. There are many members of Parliament who do not drink at all. In fact, there in a teetotaler's party in the Commons, with which are prominently associated the names W. S. Kane and Sir Wilfrid Lawson. We have temperance societies in Bombay and many parts of India. There are even Anglo-Indians who are teetotalers. In spite of all this, persons there are, enlightened by then, who believe and refuse to disbelieve, even though convinced, that wines are absolutely necessary in England. A gentleman said, after reaching England, you may not require them, but somewhere in the Mediterranean Sea, I am told you die without them. He was told, I may be allowed to tell him that if the wines were so very necessary, the P. and O. Company would provide wines together with the food for the fees they charge and not make the passengers pay separately for the wines they consume. If the wines were to be taken in England, and that regularly, Nines would be used up simply in drinking and it would be impossible to make the two ends meet for the estimate given by me. So, then, it is absolutely necessary to exclude wines and tobacco from the estimate and advisable to exclude tea and coffee, as the latter can be used at a sacrifice of far more substantial drink, milk. Now we come to the question of flesh foods which, I think, must be abandoned if nines are to be sufficient so as not to injure health. How would the Mohammedans and Parsis do, it may be asked in that case. For them this guide is useless. Tarry a little. I would ask, are there not? 90. Many Mohammedans and Parsis who, on account of their poverty, get flesh foods only on rare occasions and some on none? These surely can manage without flesh foods which they get but rarely in India, not for the sake of religion or principles, but for the sake of economy. They are free to take meat whenever they can get it, for example, in their inn if they have gone for a barrister's education. If it be true that one can live on vegetable foods without injuring one's health, 
why should not all live on a vegetable diet because it is more economical than a meat diet? That vegetarianism exists in England there are living examples to prove. There are vegetarian societies and any quantity of vegetarian literature to testify to the existence of vegetarianism in England. There are living notable Englishmen who are vegetarians. Lord Hannon of the HMS Privy Council, better known as Sir James Hannon, the president of the late Parnell Commission, is a vegetarian. Mr. Gottling of Bombay is a vegetarian. John Wesley was a vegetarian. So was Howard the philanthropist and a host of others all men of light and learning. The poet Shelley was a vegetarian. It is impossible in the compass of a small book to so much as do justice to such a vast subject. I must content myself with referring the inquisitive reader to perfect way in diet by Dr. Anna Kingsford one who says of herself, I cured myself of tubercular consumption by living on vegetable food. A doctor told me I had not six months to live. What was I to do? I was to eat raw meat and drink port wine. Well, I went into the country and ate porridge and fruit and appear today on this platform. There is another advisable book to which the reader might be referred. It is entitled A Plea for Vegetarianism by H. S. All to Dr. Benjamin Ward Richardson, M.B., L.R.C.S., etc., himself not a vegetarian, has come to the following conclusions in his Food for Man 1. Man, although possessing the capacity of existing on an animal diet in whole or in part, is by original cast adapted to a diet of grain and fruit and, on the scientific adaptation of his natural supplies, might easily be provided with all he can require from that source of subsistence. One find also an autobiography, P.T. I. C. H. X. V. Two vide an autobiography, P.T. I. C. H. X. I. V. Volume 1. 1884 30 November, 1896. 91. 2. The vegetable world is incomparable in its efficiency for supply of food for man when its resources are thoroughly understood and correctly applied. 3. The supplies of food for man are most economically and safely drawn direct from the vegetable world. 4. Diseases may be conveyed by both sources of supply, but need not be conveyed by either. Diseases may be generated by misuse of either source, of supply, but need not be, and under judicious management, would not be, generated by either. Under a properly constituted fruit and vegetable diet, strength of mind and body may be as fully secured as under an animal or a mixed animal and vegetable system. He says also, I admit that some of the best work has been done and is being done on a vegetarian regimen. If so much is conceded by a thoughtful and cautious doctor not a vegetarian, the reader will easily guess how much must be claimed by vegetarians for their system. They claim that anatomically, physiologically, economically and morally vegetarianism is far superior to meat-eating. From this it must be abundantly clear that vegetarianism is not only possible, but is really practiced by hundreds of people in England. If, then, vegetarianism be as shown above as good as flesh-eating in other respects, I hope no man, not determined upon setting his face against vegetarianism at any cost, would hesitate to adopt it if it is cheaper than flesh-eating. While a vegetable soup costs 3d per plate, a meat soup costs from 9d to 1 slash 3s and more. A mutton chop would cost at least three times as much as a vegetable chop, unless you go in for meat of the worst kind, and it must be borne in mind that there are more diseases lurking in cheap meat than in vegetables. It would be futile for me to demonstrate an admitted fact, viz., that vegetarianism costs far less than meat eating. If there be anyone who can contradict this, let him try to live on nines per week and get flesh foods. I concede that, by a judicious management, it would be possible to have in that sum, if anyone thinks that he must have, not as a luxury but as a sheer medical necessity, meat once or twice a week. Another fact is worth mentioning here. An ordinary vegetarian in England does not exclude eggs from his dietary, while an Indian vegetarian would. As a counterpart, there are vegetarians in England. 92. 
who do not take even milk and butter, they being animal products. Before describing the food that can be had for nines per week, there are one or two points still remaining to be cleared. Whether you would cook the food yourself or whether you would have it cooked by your landlady, from a religious point of view, if you are a strict Hindu, you would of course cook your own food. In this case, your expenses would be much cheaper. Here let me remark, in spite of all that is said to the contrary, that given all the resources at your command, there is nothing to prevent you from leading a purely Hindu life. To say that there are no cooking arrangements to be had in London is humbug and a mere bagatelle. It would be true to say that there are very few who have the mind to do it. Again, to perform the everyday ceremonies, to dine bare-bodied, to sit in contemplation bare-bodied for hours together would be impossible for a poor man, but a rich man who is prepared to spend any amount of money can perform each and every religious ceremony that can be performed in India. If he does not want to cook his own food, he can even take a cook with him. But, then, an ordinary student would not be able to command money and time for such things. I should like to know how many students are there who find time or have the mind to perform all the ceremonies even in India. If they are not performed here, some of them may well be left out in London without shocking the pious and elderly persons as even our scriptures make certain exemptions in favor of travelers and students. A distinguished yogi told me that he followed most of the usual ceremonies while traveling. For an ordinary Indian who is not over-scrupulous in his religious views and who is not much of a believer in caste restrictions, it would be advisable to cook partly himself and get a part of his food ready-made. Of course, he can have all his things cooked by his landlady which by a previous arrangement, she engages to do for sevens that are paid for the rent. But, this would be found to be inconvenient in certain cases, the landlady may not know the vegetarian cookery. She may not be honest. She may be very unclean. She may cook vegetables and utensils used for cooking meat without first cleaning them. The first two difficulties can be surmounted, she may be given a cookery book and she would cook the required food by the help of the book. By a strict watch, she may not be given an opportunity for. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 93. Being dishonest, but if she is not clean, there is no help for the poor lodger if he has to be at her mercy. The last difficulty can be overcome or overlooked. So, then, on the whole, it would be better to cook one's food if the landlady is not clean. Cooking, as perhaps would be feared, is not at all a difficult or troublesome process. No smoke, no wood, no cotton cakes and no blowing or fanning are associated with the idea of cooking as here advocated. A portable oil stove serves the purpose of the Indian chulas. On that stove one can cook almost everything that may be cooked on the Indian chulas for five or six persons. Moreover, the cooking does not take much time. Twenty minutes would be found quite sufficient. Ten minutes are required for boiling milk. During the interval, while milk and boiling, many find it convenient to read something, for example, a newspaper. An enameled pan, one or two plates, two spoons would be your cooking utensils. The whole would cost not more than tens. Water white kerosene oil is very good for cooking. It does not give any nasty smell and burns well. The utensils would be supplied by your landlady too. It is, however, advisable to buy your own pan. Some meals may be prepared by the landlady and some taken outside, for example, breakfast and supper may be prepared by the landlady and the midday meal taken outside. Some meals may be cooked by yourself and others taken outside. It is not troublesome to prepare one's breakfast and supper which consist of simple things. Under every one of these modes it is possible to live on nines per week. And every one of the modes has been tried by me as well as many others. The first mode is the cheapest, viz, to cook all your meals. But it would cost more time and may prove inconvenient for a student who may pass his day in his library. However, let us see how under the first mode, nines would give us sufficient food. As has been said above, 
The same food that we usually take in India is sufficient in England. Then we may see what would be the cost of the Indian meals. For example, if you stick to the two meals per day, you have for dinner at 10 p.m. kapati, dal, vegetable, bad and milk. Such a dinner would cost as follows. 94. Wheat meal flour rice potatoes lentils. Oz. D. 8. 3 slash 4. 4. 1 slash 2. 8. 3 slash 4. 4. 1 slash 2. Butter salt and pepper oil for cooking. 1. 1. 1 slash 4. 1 slash 4. Milk. 1 half pint. 1. 5 D. For the evening meal, kichadi and kapati may be had. Rice and lentils. 16. 2. Butter. 1 slash 2. 1. Milk. 1 half pint. 1. Salt, pepper and oil. 1 slash 2. 1 slash 2. 4 D. Thus, two good meals can be had for 9 D and if it be found. Desirable that a third meal should be had, 3 D can be laid out in milk and bread or tea and bread. This for a week would amount to 7 s with a balance of 2s in our favor. However, it would be found convenient and perhaps better for health to have English vegetable dishes. You have before you a wide range of selection. In cereals you have wheat, oatmeal, maize, etc. In pulses you have peas, haricots, lentils, rice sick, etc. In vegetables you have potatoes, cabbage, spinach, celery, artichokes, haricot beans, green peas, tomatoes, cauliflower, parsnips, onions and leeks. In fruits there are fresh fruit and dry. Among the first class can be counted apples, oranges, grapes, bananas, apricots, pears, peaches, plums, strawberries, raspberries, cherries, etc. Among the second class are found figs, dates, currants, raisins, muscatel raisins and sultanas, etc. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896-95. In nuts we have hazel, Brazil nuts, almonds, chestnuts, etc. The above presents a variety sufficient to satisfy the most delicate tastes and all of these are within the reach of the 9s man. Fruits are supposed in England to be absolutely necessary. At any rate, the vegetarians think so. They are a sure safeguard against medicine. They purify the blood and keep the bowels regular. Since constipation is the father of many diseases, one cannot do better than take the utmost precautions to prevent that fell disease. This can be best done by a liberal use of whole wheat meal and fruits. The fine wheat flour ordinarily to be had in England is to be discarded altogether. It is very nutritious and very often injurious when it is adulterated as it very often is. Moreover, it is insipid. On the other hand wheat meal flour is very sweet to the taste. So one should always make it a point to use brown bread made of whole wheat meal flour and discard the white bread altogether. It may be said that the above observations are unauthenticated and useless coming from a person who cannot pretend to any knowledge of chemistry or medicine. Well, they are not unauthentic. Only the authorities have not been quoted. That what has been written above is the general opinion of doctors can be seen by reading the many vegetarian pamphlets published by the Vegetarian Society. It must be repeated here that the aim of this guide is not to supersede other useful books and to give all the information, its aim is to supplement, to give information not hitherto given and to direct where the proper information can be had. We assume then that food is to be selected for three meals from the vegetable kingdom. The meals consist of breakfast at 8.30 a.m., dinner at 1 p.m., and supper at 6.30 p.m. A good breakfast may be made of oatmeal porridge splendid dish especially in winter. In almost every household, they have this porridge for breakfast in winter. Thousands of Scotch people live on oatmeal. It tastes like wheat and is sweeter. The preparation is very simple. 
You can stir one ounce of oatmeal into a sufficient quantity of water and put it on the oil stove. If it is fine oatmeal, the porridge would be ready in 20 minutes. If it is coarse, it would take 30 minutes. It can be eaten with sugar and milk or stewed fruit. Stewed fruit is fruit cooked in water with a little sugar. The porridge may be made entirely in milk or milk and water. Made in milk it tastes better. This breakfast would cost as follows. 96. Oz. D. Oatmeal. 1. 1 slash. 4. Milk. 1 per pint. 1. 2. Fruit currants or raisins. 2. 1 slash. 2. Bread. 1 slash. 2. Butter. 3 slash. 4. 3D. Breakfast may consist of bread 1D, butter 1D, and cheese 1 slash 2D. It may consist of toast and milk 3D, toast, jam and tea 3D, bread, and butter and fruit 3D, maize, musk and fruit 2D, bread and apples 1 per pound 4D per 1B, 3D, bread, butter and cocoa 3D, bread, butter and 2 marmalade 21 slash D, at ad lib. 2 soup and bread and fresh fruit or rice and milk and sugar. Would make a good dinner. Soup made of potatoes. Onion and haricots costs 11 slash D. Rice, milk and sugar would cost 2 D or less and 2 bread 1 D. This dinner, then, can be had for 41 slash D. And if you are very too fond of butter, you can have a penny worth of butter in which case your dinner would be 51 slash D. Two the following variety of dinners can be had for an under 5 D. Pea soup and bread and stewed fruit or fresh fruit. Rice. Milk and bread and radishes and cheese. Potato soup, bread and semolina with stewed fruit or milk. Tapioca pudding bread with almonds and raisins, etc., etc. Supper may consist of bread, butter and cocoa 3D, bread and butter and cheese 21 slash D, toast and milk and radishes 3D, porridge 2 and fruit and bread 3D, bread, butter, celery and cheese, etc. Thus, three meals can be had for 11 D or say ones. These meals are quite sufficient and nourishing and give as much nutrition as a sumptuous meat meal with no dyspepsia or other disease which is generally the consequence of the latter. Thousands subsist well on such meals. The three meals or two of them may be cooked by you or by your landlady. When the cooking is entrusted to the landlady, all the things must be bought by you so that you may be sure that you get the right thing at the right price. It may be remarked here that only those fruit and vegetables must be bought which are in season. Otherwise they are very expensive. Moreover, they must be bought at Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 97. The Proper Place if you go to Regent Street and think of buying the hothouse grapes, they would cost threes per pound. These, of course, you cannot buy. But you can easily buy the grapes at 4D per pound when they are in season. Sometimes, I was going to say very often, it is found convenient to take the dinner outside. Whether you be a traveler or a student, you would go out after breakfast and return in the evening. In such a case, you would not care to return home for dinner. That entails a great loss of time and trouble and you would not care to go home from your library, especially if it be some distance from your house. There are vegetarian restaurants in all the busy quarters of London for such people. They have generally two divisions. One division provides sixpenny dinners of three courses. You buy a ticket and, on presenting the ticket, you get a selection of three out of about 20 courses. The popularity of these dinners is immense. From 1 p.m. to 2 p.m., very often it becomes very difficult to find a place owing to the large number of customers. In the other division, you can have any number of courses and you pay for what you eat. 
A list of items called the menu is shown to you in which the prices are marked against each item and you select your dinner according to your appetite and purse. Our 9S man can patronize either division. Two courses would be found to be quite sufficient in the first division, and three courses of the first division are more than sufficient even for a gourmand. It may be remarked that there is no difference in the quality of food in both the divisions. In fact, there are the same dishes in both. In the first division, you have the satisfaction to know that you pay more and, if you are ashamed to sit side by side with the laborer, to know that there is no such person to shame you in the first division. There is again more room in the first division called the dining saloon and the hall is better ornamented. I give a specimen menu showing the courses generally provided in the vegetarian restaurants of which Dr. Richardson says, I confess with perfect candor that, if I could on all occasions get for my meals the same foods as are to be obtained in the best vegetarian dining rooms, I should not take willingly any other kind of food. In time, I doubt not that the present centers for good vegetarian diets will become schools for the nation and that every hotel in the kingdom and every private dwelling will have its cook or housewife. 98. Monday, October 22nd-88. Soups. Porridges. Green pea. 3D oatmeal. Scotch broth. 3D wheaten. In sugar or syrup. 3D. Florator and milk. 3D maize musk. Bread. 1D Anglo Scotch. Savouries. Lentil cutlets. Parsley say. And sprouts. 4. Turnips. 4. Tomatoes. 4. Vegetarian pies. Tomato and macaroni pudding. 4. Yorkshire pudding say and herco. 4. Curried egg and rice. 4. Sprout say and baked potatoes. 4. Extra vegetables. Macaroni. 2. Turnips. 2. Rice. 2. Sprouts. 2. Tomatoes. 2. Baked potatoes. 2. Haricots. 2. Mashed. 2. Sweet puddings. Pastry. College pudding. 3. Tapioca and custard. 3. Damsanpi. 3. Blank mango and jam. 3. Apple tart. 3. Maize and peaches. 3. Plum. 3. Wheat and jelly. 3. Stewed fruits. Sundras. Apples. 3. Wheat cake. 2. Raisins. 3. Coffee chocolate. 2. Plums. 3. Cheddar. 1. Damson. 3. Gorgonzola. 2. Peaches. 3. Celery. 2. No greater variety can be required for a good selection. The vegetarian restaurants are closed on Sundays and bank holidays. On these days dinners must be taken at home. In dealing with this subject of food, I have simply put down the result of my own experience and that of others. It may interest the reader to know that the meals above enumerated give all the elements. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 99. Necessary to sustain life. It is outside the province of this work to show what they are and in what proportion they are required. That is a separate study. The inquiring reader can test the truth of my statement from the perfect way in diet, fruit and farinacea, and such other works. This closes the remarks on the most important subject. There should be no difficulty in carrying out the above plan and, if carried out, it will be found that it is far better even from the point of view of health. 4. Luxury and overeating never lead to health. Wise frugality in diet is the surest mode of preserving or attaining health. Says Dr. A. Von During, wouldst thou enjoy life, renounce life's enjoyment. There is an Italian proverb which says, he who eats more eats less because he shortens his days by gluttony. Again Seneca says, multos morbos multifercula furunt many dishes many diseases.
says Professor Mayer, that first Latin professor from whose why I am a vegetarian the above quotations are taken, with regard to students' extravagance, many we know who, for their own persons put up with plain fare, blush to set before guests what costs them little. They deem it penurious, shabby, churlish. This prejudice certainly affects students, at least in England, to no small extent. Even thrifty men may save three shillings a day, that is, a guinea a week, by adopting Spartan self-control. In other words, they may win without contest a scholarship of zero a year tenable for life, purchasing into the bargain independence of character and health. Sir Henry Thompson goes so far as to say that our eating is more injurious than our drinking, and who does not know that we are more apt to overeat than undereat. To carry out what has been mapped out above, nothing but a stern will is required. Given that one thing, the way is smooth. A little experience will accustom you to that mode of life. Adopt that course of life which is best and custom will render it delightful. I cannot do better than close this chapter with the following lines from Dr. Nichols' How to Live on Sixpence a Day, the case of Louis Carnaro so often quoted is a very remarkable instance of the effects of a very temperate and simple diet in producing health, cheerfulness and longevity. At the age of 40, his constitution seemed ruined by what is called free living. He changed all his habits and lived on 12 ounces of food a day and his health became so perfect that for half a century he was never ill. When past 90, in deference to his friends, he increased his food. 100. To 14 ounces a day instead of 12 and this trifling addition nearly cost him his life. He became sad and dispirited. Everything vexed him and he was attacked with a pain in the stomach which compelled him to return to his former diet and even to diminish it. Writing at the age of 95, he describes his life as one of great serenity and enjoyment. He wrote plays, he assisted in fortifying and embellishing Venice. He enjoyed what he called his beautiful life. He writes, I have attained my 95th year and find myself as healthy merry and happy as if I were but twenty-five. At this age, and even on to a hundred years, his senses, memory, heart, judgment and voice were perfect. He wrote seven or eight hours a day, walked, enjoyed society and music and sang and played delightfully. His grandniece writes of him, he continued healthy and even vigorous until he was a hundred years old. His mind did not at all decline. He never required spectacles. He did not become deaf. His voice remained so strong and harmonious that, at the close of his life, he sang with as much power and delight as he did at twenty. The reader will find in the appendix how I lived on per month during the last year of my stay in England. In the above estimates no mention is made of expenses on account of newspapers which are found to be an absolute necessity, a daily food as it were. There are now in almost all the parts of London free public libraries, where are to be found all the leading daily and weekly papers. These institutions are visited by hundreds of people every day. So it is always preferable to visit the public libraries to buying a paper. However, if necessary, there is a sufficient margin left for spending 6d per week on newspapers. The London newspapers are very cheap. An evening newspaper can be had for one half penny. Chapter for a chapter for would-be barristers Whether you will be a barrister or receive some other education in England is a question that can be best determined by you or those who know you best. Each man's case must be peculiar. I can offer only general remarks. For the present barristers are at a discount. They are not so well thought of as they were before. This I suppose is an undisputed fact. It is, however, true that they have got a status from which it is not easy to oust them and it is true also that they have got the widest field for action. And it may be said also that, with a large amount of patience and close application, no barrister need despair of earning a decent. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 101. Livelihood from his own profession or by accepting some appointment. But why are the barristers at a disadvantage? The fault is partly their own and partly the people's. Again, there are natural causes. 
the fault is their own because they do not come up to the expectations of the people. Of the people because they expect too much from them. The natural causes consist in the increase of their number. When there was only one newspaper, it was prized by all. Now when there are many only few are held in estimation. A first matriculate was a sort of demigod. Now when you stumble upon matriculates, they are sold at a nominal price. Again, when there was only one barrister, he was incomparable, now there are many among whom to set up a comparison. So, then, there is no need to be fear-stricken by a little dislodging of the position. Only we must not lower our standard of work and a time may come when we may be yet too few. That time is distant though. And, during that time, we ought to be cautious so that it may not be extended any further. In being over hasty we may spoil matters. In not working as we ought to, we may do the same. We must, therefore, guard against both. There is nowadays a tendency to do it easily, that is, to work little and expect much. This ought to be avoided if we would not be thrown further downward. If our parents send us to England, or if we hold a scholarship, we have a sacred trust to perform. We have to account to our parents or patrons for the work we have done and for the money which we have spent. We ought to do unto them as we would be done by. If we were to send someone to England at our expense to become a barrister, I suppose we would expect him to utilize every moment of his stay there and give us an account of how he passed his time. Exactly the same would be expected of us. Consciousness of this and work according to it are all that is required of us. If we do that, we shall have done our duty and will have no occasion to be sorry for having gone to England. When we go there to be barristers, we ought to do there everything that would make of us good barristers and not indulge in luxuries or pleasures. Let those who send their boys to England make sure that they would discharge their trust faithfully and they will have no occasion to regret having sent them. The best way to ensure this is to give your boy just enough money to make of him a barrister and then tell him. 102. Plainly that he should expect no more. Make a certain provision for him on his return from England for a year or two and then let him know that he shall be left to himself to earn his living. This may seem a little hard, but once done it would be a source of the highest happiness, or else it will be a source of woe and misery both to the parents and the boy. Are there already too many barristers? Yes and no. Yes, if we take any one province into account, but, if India as a whole were taken into account, there are far too few. That barristers have a field in any of Her Majesty's dominions seems to have either been forgotten or not cared for, because every barrister goes to his native land to practice. Now, while in one's fatherland there is some chance of success owing to acquaintances and knowledge of the native country, there is much disadvantage if the profession is overcrowded. Why not then invade the regions not yet invaded? Then, again, a field, I am told, is sure to be opened as well for barristers as for all educated persons in the protected states. They are yet in a very backward state. They are expected to make reforms. When that time comes, the aid of the educated of the land is likely to be called in. Again, it is a notorious fact that so far education has been too much neglected by the agencies and backdoor influence has prevailed. This too will be set right some day. I must not, however, be misunderstood to advocate the Indians flocking to England to become barristers. Whether it is good to be a barrister or not is not the province of this guide to discuss. There are many other guides to throw light on that matter. Indeed, I must confess really my incompetence to aid the discussion of that question. I am simply to guide those who have made up their minds to be barristers as to what they would be required to spend, what examinations they have to pass, how they would gain admission, etc. It was not without many misgivings and hesitation that I was induced to insert even the above paragraphs. Supposing, then, that you have made up your mind to become a barrister, the first thing for you to do is to get a certificate of your having passed the matriculation examination. If you have not passed the matriculation examination, you will be required to pass an entrance examination before admission. 
they examine in history and Latin, but Indian students are by an application exempted from the Latin examination. The examination is rather easy. Volume 1, 1884 30 November, 1896. 103. This done, you get the form of admission for one guinea. You pay the fees, which amount to nearly 41. Those who have joined some university are exempted from the payment of OO in the beginning, though they have to pay the sum in the end. In Lincoln's Inn, those who have passed public examination only in the British Dominions are exempted from that payment. I am not sure whether this applies to Indian universities. Such information can be had directly by writing to the treasurers of the respective inns of which there are four, viz., Inner Temple, Middle Temple, Lincoln's Inn and Gray's Inn. Perhaps, from an economic point of view, Lincoln's Inn is the best inn, which boasts also the best library. Middle Temple is the most patronized by the Indians. From the education point of view, all the inns are equal because they have a common examination. Middle Temple pays the scholarships in cash, the Inner Temple makes you join chambers and pays for them. One has to keep twelve terms before being called to the bar. There are four terms every year, the first in January, the second in April, the third in June and fourth in November. The shortest term lasts 20 days and the longest about 31 days. Keeping terms means taking dinners in the respective inns to which you belong. You have not necessarily to take your dinner but you must go to the dining hall punctually at the appointed time and sit there for one hour. You are said to have kept one term when you have attended six dinners in the term. Those who belong to a university have to attend only three dinners. These dinners, whether partaken of or not, have to be paid for inner temple charges 31 per seconds per two dinner, middle temple twos. Thus you make a saving of 11 per seconds every two dinner by joining the middle temple. And such dinners have to be taken 12 times in all. Lincoln's Inn and Gray's Inn, too, charge most probably twos. If you pay for the dinners and if you have no religious objection, why should you not take your dinner, one may pertinently ask. The answer is you ought to dine, but, then, a further question arises as to what a vegetarian should do. Well, you can have ordinarily bread and vegetables and cheese, but you can have a better vegetarian dinner specially prepared for you by applying to the chief steward of the inn or, if need be, the sub-treasurer of your inn. A Parsi friend who had turned a vegetarian and I used to get our vegetarian dinners specially prepared. 104. And it is better that every Indian should insist on this so that, in future, every Indian may make it a rule to prepare vegetarian dinners regularly. To be fit for being called to the bar at the end of twelve terms, two examinations must be passed, one in Roman law and the other in the English laws. A student can appear in the Roman law examination after a not before eeping four terms. Thus, after reaching England, the student has one year at least to prepare for the examination which is much more than what is required for the purposes of passing the examination. Hence, the brilliant results of the examination. For Roman law, Saunders Justinian is the textbook. Many students, however, read Hunter's Introduction to Roman Law. The other examination called the bar final a student can appear in it after a not before it being nine terms, that is, at the end of two years after admission. This time, too, is more than enough for the examination. The examination takes place in the law of property, common law including criminal law and equity, and lasts for four days. It used to last only three days, but now there are two equity papers instead of one. For the law of property the prescribed books are, William's Real Property Personal Property Goodeve's Real Property Personal Property Edwards Compendium of the Law of Property and Land. Students, however, generally find it sufficient to read William's and Goodeve's Real Property and Goodeve's Personal Property. Very few read William's on personal property. They read besides, various guides to the examination. In law the prescribed common book is Broom's Common Law. Indramar's Common Law is, however, read in addition to or instead of Broom by the students. For equity the prescribed book is Snell's Equity. The matter of the examination changes almost every year. Thus, 
While generally a competent knowledge of the English laws is required, special subjects are prescribed every year. For instance, for equity they sometimes prescribe certain portions only for example, trusts, mortgages, etc. from White and Tudor's leading cases in equity. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 105. Those, however, who are well grounded in the general principles of law do not find it difficult to pass. The latest prospectus one of the Council of Legal Education is appended here too. A notion seems to prevail in many quarters that students are called to the bar without any examinations or that the examinations are a farce. Both these statements are entirely without foundation and inventions of fertile brains. No doubt the examinations are easy or, rather, found to be easy. The results are generally good. There are two or three reasons for the examinations being found easy. In the first place, they take place four times every year. So, then, if a student fails, the failure does not shock him so much as it does in India. In England he can reappear in three months. Secondly, the time at the student's disposal for preparation is ample. While both the examinations are a year's work at the rate of six hours per day, to ensure success there are clear two years at the student's disposal. So, then, the preparation can be made with a light heart and without having to work hard. Whether it is good that more than sufficient time should be given for preparation is another question altogether, but let there be only three months for preparing for the examinations and we shall have cutting sick results and a different verdict. Thirdly, there are many facilities for study in the shape of tutors, etc. It is only in rare cases that tutors should be resorted to. It is a useless waste of money. And a tutored student never goes beyond what is required and forgets what he has learned soon after the examination. Such is the experience of many. Nothing like self-preparation. It is worthy of notice that the tendency nowadays is happily to raise the standard of the examinations. They have begun to prescribe more useful matter now. The latest prospectus is a substantial improvement on the prospectus of two years ago. For merely a knowledge of evidence was not then necessary. Now, however, it is. Students generally study for themselves through lectures common to the four inns. Special lectures, too, are organized by each. One this is not available. 106. In. These lectures are generally attended by those students only who want to compete for scholarship examinations. But attending the lectures has now been made indirectly compulsory as the examinations are held on the subject of lectures. Call to the bar is a mere formal ceremony. After you are called, a certificate is given to you and you have to apply for a special certificate if you want to practice in India or the colonies. Before leaving England, students, now barristers, generally get their names enrolled in Her Majesty's High Court of Justice on a payment of five shillings. It may be important here to discuss whether it is desirable that the student should try for scholarship examinations. It has been said above that, for the purposes of passing the examinations, the time at the student's disposal is more than enough. The question, therefore, is what shall he do with the rest of his time? It may be answered he will devote it to private study. Now this is all very well to say. There are persons who do study as well for the sake of study as for an examination. But these are exceptions to prove the rule that, unless a person has a task imposed on him, he will not generally do it only because it is good. Private study very often gives place to other pursuits, not so study for an examination. It, therefore, seems better to impose some examination task upon oneself than to rely upon one's own willpower to take care of private study. And, in that case, it is difficult to say whether it is better to compete for some scholarship or to join some university. In going in for some scholarships there is one drawback. The competition is unequal. There may be MAS, BAS and other university men against mere matriculates who would stand a very poor chance of winning scholarships. For those who have graduated in India nothing can be better than trying for the scholarship examinations. Indeed, 
There are students who do both OIN a university and work for a scholarship. Matriculates and others, if they try for a scholarship, while they may not be successful in getting one, will have the satisfaction of knowing that they have added to the stock of their knowledge and done some useful work. It may, however, be thought more advisable for them to graduate in one of the universities. Then comes the question of selection of a university. There are Cambridge and Oxford universities on one side and London University on the Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896 107 Other So far as substantial knowledge is concerned, London University is by far the best. And if a university is to be joined for enjoyment and pleasures, of course London University would lag far behind. Oxford and Cambridge would win the palm. There is no, what is called, university life in London of which there is plenty in Oxford and Cambridge. London University is an examining body merely and does not require candidates to have kept any terms. There is no doubt an opportunity of mixing with professors in Oxford and Cambridge which is not to be found in London. It is said that education in Oxford and Cambridge is very costly. To graduate and become a barrister would cost at least RS 15,000. Though I have no personal experience of either, I can say that education in either should not cost anything more than barristers' education except the actual expenses of fees and books. Of course, to live with such an economy one will have to remain a non-collegiate student. No such charge, however, can be brought against the London University. And, on that account, it would be better to graduate from the London University. The great advantage of the London University is that it holds its examinations even in India. London University would be found better by vegetarians as there are more facilities for them in London than anywhere else. Now, this university is so exacting that even an MA or BA of any other university has to matriculate in the London University before he can appear for any of its degree examinations. But, after passing the matriculation examination, one can appear in its law examinations without having to pass the BA examination, as is the case in the Bombay University. The London LLB course nearly extends to three years after matriculation. So, in three years one can pass the matriculation and the intermediate LLB examination together with being called to the bar. Such a course of training would keep the student's hands pretty full and he will find no time to devote to idle amusements and this would not mean an extra outlay over and above the cost of a barrister's education of more than 0 to 25. The cost of barrister's education, in order to be called to the bar, it is necessary to leave for England so as to reach there in time for keeping the November term. If you start in October or September, you can return in the July of your third year's stay in England. By starting in any other month you can return in that month of your third year's stay in England, which is 108. Previous to the month you started in for England. Except for the saving of two months by starting in October, it has been shown in a previous chapter that March is the best month to start in for England. For three years stay in England we have, in the previous chapter, calculated the expenses of board and lodging in London, which amount to per month. So 50 may be allowed for board and lodging in England during the three years stay in England. A list of clothes, too has been given in previous chapter. The clothes contained in the list in that chapter would be quite sufficient at least for the first year, though by a judicious use no more may be required for two years. However, a further list of clothes is appended below. These may be bought as required, but more should in no case be required. According to one's fancy changes may be made. The sum to be expended in clothing should not be exceeded. D. Three pairs of trousers. One sixteen zero. One jacket suit vest and jacket. Two oh oh. Three white shirts. Zero sixty. Two woolen shirts. 0-16-0. Two woolen undervests or merino. 0-11-0. Four cotton undervests. 0-80. Two woolen drawers. 
0-13-0. 6 pairs of woolen socks. 0 12 0. 20. 12 pairs of merino or cotton socks. 0 90. 12 cotton handkerchiefs. 0 20. 2 felt hats. 0 70. 6 neckties. 0 30. 1 slippers. 0 20. 4 pairs of boots and shoes. 1 12 0. 1 pair of gloves. 0 30. 10 0 0. SD. Brought forward. 10 0 0. 3 toothbrushes. 016. 6. 2 umbrellas. 0 11 0. 1 razor. 0 30. 1 evening suit on hire for 1 evening. 0 50. Volume 1, 1884 30 November, 1896. 109. 1 gown. 0 10 0. 4 cotton or merino drawers. 0 11 0. 1 oil stove. 0 56. 1 enameled pan. 0 16. 2 spoons. 0 20. Plates. 0 10. 13 11 6. It must be understood that there is room for economy in the above list as well as the list given in the previous chapter economy, both as regards quantity and prices. When the lists were shown to a friend who was rather exacting than otherwise, he pronounced it to be extravagant. The evening dress mentioned at the bottom in the list is meant for the call night. It is compulsory to wear the dress on the call night, so they say. No one seems to have tried to appear in the ordinary dress. The experiment is worth trying. However, if one has to wear the evening dress, he can have it on hire for one evening for fives at many shops in the Strand or Fleet Street. It may be borrowed from friends. It may not be superfluous to mention that expenses of mending shoes or clothes at times are included in the per week. Shoes are the article requiring repair rather often. They can be mended for one-sixth per pair or less. In the list will be found mentioned the oil stove and pan, etc. They are meant for cooking. They will prove very useful at times if not always. When traveling, cheap food may not be procurable, the landlady being not a good cook or from various other causes. In such cases it will be best to cook one's food. There remain now to be considered the expenses on account of fees and dues to be given to the inns. They are as follows in the inner temple. D. Admission form. 110. Stamp dues and fees. 3565. Lecture fee. 550. Commons and dues and dinners for 12 terms. 15130. Call certificate for the colonies. 0120. Call fees. 9410 152 711. Enrollment in the High Court. 050. 152 12 11. 110. These were the fees paid by me. Now, if the Middle Temple is joined and if there are no fees besides those charged in the Inner Temple, as there are probably not, 72 times 11 per seconds, that is, Minus 8 minus 0 can be 2 saved as the middle temple dinner costs only 2s as compared to the 31 per seconds of the inner temple. I know that in no case do the fees exceed 2 July 11th 152. Hence 153 may be put down as the highest expense for fees. Then we come to books. Before enumerating the books, it may be remarked that the libraries of the several inns are meant for the use of their members and it will be their own fault if they do not make a liberal use of them. Thus, all of the big works on law which have to be read for the scholarship examination will be found in the library. All the works just to be mentioned will also be found in the library. However, they being books of daily reference may be bought. There are law lending libraries in London which entitle their members to issue books to be kept for a month, three months, etc., according to the subscription they pay. 
so then he who wants to practice further economy may make use of these libraries, too. And, in passing, I may mention that such economy sometimes becomes very necessary. You may think of traveling and yet may not afford to spend more than a given sum which did not include traveling expenses. In that case you must save somewhere. An instance will be found of a saving thus effected in Appendix A a few odd shillings or pence saved now and then and collected swell up the savings to a decent sum which may be spent in various other useful pursuits. A mention has nowhere been made of theatres which are a national institution in England and, as some suppose, a seat of education and amusement combined. They moreover portray the modern habits and customs of England. No one would return to India without visiting the theatres. Then, where is provision for that in the estimates provided in this guide, it may be asked. They are provided for generally in the one pound a week and also in the estimates provided for clothing where a margin has been left for cutting down. Theatres do not cost much. Gallery seats are one shilling each and pit two or thirty-one slash d each. The last seats are used by respectable middle class two persons and frequently patronized by the Indians. Once a month on an average is more than sufficient and the reader will have remarked that an ample margin has been left for saving even four times twos. The arrangements given in the guide will have to be disturbed only when. Volume 1, 1884-30 November. 1896. 111. Some big expense has to be incurred. Thus, if a travel has to be undertaken and if the average limit of is not to be overstepped, a saving may be effected, for example, by removing to a cheaper room. To return, however, to the libraries. It has been alluded to in the previous chapter that it will be convenient to pass most of your time in the library of your inn for even a luxuriously faded room would not be so comfortable and suitable as the library hall which is always well warmed and ventilated. The books to be required are as follows. All the booksellers give a 25% discount on books of general literature and 20% on law books. The prices in the second column are prices minus discount. D.D. Saunders Justinian. 0180050. Hunter's Introduction to Roman Law 076060. Williams Real Property. 1100170. Goodeves Real Property. 1100170. Goodeves Personal Property. 1100170. Broom's Common Law. 150100. Indramar's Common Law. 1000160. Snell's Equity. 100100. Extra. 3120. Total 1000. There is now only one item of expenditure to be considered, viz., the fare on returning, which is 5. Thus the total expenses of a barrister's education are. Dress in Bombay. 18. Fare from Bombay to London. 24. Dress in London. 14. Fees, etc. 153. Board and lodging during three years in London. 150. Books. 10. Fare from London to Bombay. 35. Emergencies, etc. 16420. This brings down the expenses on a barrister's education to 112. 20 which as the reader must have seen is capable of being reduced oh oh quite easily. There are three items, viz, dress in Bombay, that in London and books, which evidently admit of a reduction of and the emergency some ought really to find no place in the estimate as that has been taken into account in the 50 for board and lodging. Attention ought to be drawn to the first two items which have been estimated in rupees and then reduced to pounds sterling at the present rate of exchange which is nearly RS 16 for one pound. In rupees, as will have been noticed, it amounts to nearly RS 653. Represented in pounds, it would fluctuate with the exchange. The passage RS 370, too, is subject to variation. Already owing to the sinking down of the rupee, the passage has been raised some 20 pc. If the rate goes higher, as it is expected to, 
it is likely that the fare would be brought down to its original value. Now it has to be discussed how many pounds you will take with you. Of course, RS 653 or thereabouts will be spent in Bombay. On reaching London you will have to pay your fees amounting to nearly 41. Out of this one are taken as fee and OO as deposit as security for further dues to your inn. It has been said above that this deposit is excused in certain cases. If you are sure that you come under the excuse rules, you may take OO less. But, in all other cases, take with you or be sure that you will get on your landing in England at least £175 sterling. If you take money with you, of course, you would not take it in cash, but take a bill of exchange to some bank. Messrs Hutchinson and Company are good bankers and cater for Indian customers. Mr. William Digby is concerned with the business. They undertake to supply gratis the requisite information to Indians about lodging, etc. I do not suppose they would be able, however, to show them cheap lodgings. They have got a list of families who take Indians, as boarders, but these families charge nearly 30s per week for board and lodging. Some charge even 25s. But they may be told that you want to live cheaply and perhaps they would secure you good lodgings. On this point, however, the editor of the vegetarian would be the best guide. He has promised to find suitable lodging for Indians asking for his advice. That is by the way. As bankers, Messrs Hutchinson and company would be quite good. Their address in London is, 1 Messrs Thomas Cook and Sons, Hornby Road, Bombay, also R. 1 The source carries no address. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 113. Good and well-known bankers. Many Indians have their accounts with them. All these firms get their customers' letters free of charge. It is better, however, to get your letters at your inn or at your lodging when you have fixed upon one. It would be advisable to keep two or three pounds with you in cash in order to pay for your railway ticket on landing in London and to pay a few shillings to the steward of your cabin or to pay for boat hires if you land at various stations touched by your boat. Although the estimates applied are not the lowest possible it is supposed that no one would venture to go to England who could not afford 20, that is, at the present rate of exchange RS 6720. I have, however, a word to say further. If you have got RS 10,000, do not spend all in London, thinking that you would be able to lead a happier life there. I shall just diverge from my main subject. I am going immediately to point out that, from every point of view, the life you would have to lead on 20 would be happier than the life led by many a student in India. And mind, RS 10,000 would not supply you with luxuries. They would simply make you pine for more to buy with your luxurious brothers and thus, in fact, make you more miserable. Did you say one room in England would not be sufficient for you? I ask you, then, what have you been having here? Do you not sleep, even though you may be the son of a rich man, two or three in one room, a room without a carpet, without any furniture, surrounded by dirty ditches having hardly a window or two? Have you not in Bombay used the same room for kitchen, bedroom and sitting room? Why, I have seen very rich students spending money like water living in a dirty house not even swept daily. Did you say you could not live on the food provided in the book? Well, if so, you can only be pitied. I am sure that you are having no better food here. Do you always taste, much less seat one, fruit in India? Do you not subsist on two meals only, in India, with milk only once in the day? Did you say you could not cook your food? Well, if so, it is not absolutely necessary that you should cook in London except for your religion. But, does not many a student, if not you, cook his food in India and in what? In the miserable fireplaces, blowing the fire now and then spoiling the clothes and having the eyes quite red with smoke after the dinner is. One the source has cut, obviously a slip. 114. Cooked. In the place of all this, what do you have in England on one pound per week? A nice comfortable room all to yourself, 
a room with a nice carpet specklessly clean, a nice bedstead with a feather bed, two pillows, looking glass, washing stand, chairs, etc. See the description empty. The maid of the house always makes the bedding for you, washes your basin and dances attendance on you whenever you want her and does all the household work for you. You have not to cry out aloud for her, but just touch the bell and she knocks at your door and enters only when you say, yes. That surely is not a miserable life and, if it be miserable, the RS-10,000 would not make it less so. To return, then, to our subject from the digression, if you have RS-10,000, keep them. Only spend out of them RS-6,000 or the equivalent of 20. And the rest you will be able to command on your return to India. What a relief. Just ask a junior how he felt to be told that he would be able to command some RS-2000 to go on with in India and you will gauge the measure of relief. But, if you spend the whole RS-10,000, why to find yourself without money on your return would cause far greater pain than the additional happiness, which you may expect but are sure not to get by spending more than 20 worth of rupees. It is absolutely necessary that you should have some money, RS. 1000. 2000 or any such sum at your disposal. Then you would not regret having gone to England. On that you would be able to build your position, but, if you have not got the foundation money, any edifice you may hope to build without that foundation would crumble down to pieces and you would find yourself in the open air without an edifice. For there is no work awaiting you on your return. There may be empty honors and congratulations just to sting you. Even if there be work, Perhaps, without a knowledge of practice you will not be able to accept it. Therefore, if you would take the advice of one who has undergone the bitter experience and would profit by it, if you have RS 10,000, only spend 20 worth and keep the rest to be spent in India and you would be happy and contented. No one would point his finger at you. Your position you would not feel unstable. And, in two years or so, according to abilities and opportunities, you would be able to establish yourself as a respectable barrister. Nay, more, the economical habits cultivated in England would stand you in good stead in India. You would then be able to pull on better and not feel the want of a luxurious way of living. Indeed, if you do not expect to command about RS 2000 on your return, it were advisable not to go to England. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896 115. At all for a barrister's education unless, of course, you expect to get some suitable appointment. 4. The RS 2000 or some such sum are as indispensable for India as the 20 for England. Too much stress cannot be laid, if you want to practice in India on your return, on the importance of studying the Indian codes in England, these books will be available in your library. Whitley Stokes' Anglo-Indian Codes are very popular with Indian students in England. There are books published for the information and guidance of those wishing to go to England for study. They invariably give much higher estimates than those given here. It will occupy a very large space to answer them here. I can only say that they may be read side by side with this and compared. There is, however, an association doing good work for Indians that deserves notice. It is the National Indian Association. So long as it can count upon the active services of that good and philanthropic lady, Miss E.A. Manning, 35 Bloomfield Road, Maiden Hill, the association cannot fail to do good. She may, indeed, be consulted by every Indian whom she is always willing to help and give kind advice to. But the information given by the association is, I am afraid, not trustworthy. The estimates furnished by it are too extravagant. I have talked to some of those who were put under the care of the association, and they told me that the estimates given were extravagant. They are as follows in the India Magazine and Review, the organ of the association. With regard to expenses it is estimated that the amount required will be for an ordinary school education, from 50 to 200 a year according to the age of the pupil and the standing of the school. For a student at the university, 300 a year. For an Indian civil service student, 300. For a student of engineering, 300. 
for a law student at the ends of court, 250. For a medical student, 250. For an agricultural student, 250. These sums include tuition, board and residence, dress, vacation expenses and cost of superintendence. Fees for entrance at one of the ends of court amounting to nearly 50 are not included in the above estimate. The sum of zero is also required to meet the expenses of outfit on arrival. So, according to the above, the expenses amount to 50 per year, that is, 50 inches 3 years. Add to that 50 for fees, not included in the above, as also zero for dress, and I suppose about 8 inches. 116. Bombay and also the fares to and from London, about zero, and we get 008. These estimates include tuition and superintendents not calculated in the estimates given in the guide. And he must be in a sorry plight, indeed, who would require tuition for passing the bar final examination and superintendent so that he may not go astray. Will it not be better to keep your boy with you if he required a strict watch than trust him to the superintendents of a committee not one of whom you know personally? It must be by this time clear to those who know or must know that no amount of superintendents, especially of the above type, would set a student right if he is bent upon going astray. He must be trusted to take care of himself or not sent at all. Only, he must not be given a full command of the purse so that he may play fast and loose with it. It is the purse more than anything else that is the most powerful instrument in spoiling a student in England. Why? It would be quite safe to undertake to spoil two students on fifty a year. It is not, however, for a moment argued that a single penny more than zero a year spent would be credited to extravagance. Far from it. Even though a year can be spent usefully in England. The aim of this guide is not, however, to show how a can be spent usefully per year in England but to show that one can live happily on zero per year and do all the things generally done by Indian students in England spending much more. In Appendix A, it will be found how from five per month I came down to per month and, in so doing, how I was not obliged to sacrifice any of the comforts I used to enjoy before. Appendix A It was on the 4th September 1888 that I left for England to receive a barrister's education per SS. The Clyde I had two Indian companions with me whom I did not know before one the mere fact that we were three Indians was a sufficient introduction to us. How I managed on the steamer, too as I was not sure that I would be able to partake of the vegetable foods provided on the steamer, I was well provided with Indian sweets, ganthias, and plenty of Indian fruits. This was my first experience of a voyage on the steamer. I was, therefore, very modest and shy and would not go to the table to. One vide London Dairy, December 11, 1888. Two vide an autobiography, P.T. I. C. H. X. I. 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 Volume 1, 1884 30 November, 1896. 117. Partake even of tea. I, therefore, began with the sweets. I lived upon them exclusively for about two or three days and could have done so for a long time, but one of the Indian friend mentioned above was very fond of his roti and rice and dal. So he arranged with one of the native sailors to cook us some Indian dishes. The flour and other articles were provided free of charge by the steamer authorities. So we lived on these Indian dishes. The sailors were very dirty and I generally preferred the English loaf to the roti. In spite of the persuasions of the brother passengers, I could not persuade myself to sit at the table with them to eat. I was so modest. During the return voyage, however, I naturally managed better. I was not ashamed to sit at the same table with other passengers. And it is very desirable that, if one has no religious objections, to do so even on going to England. There is sufficient vegetable food provided on the steamer. I, however, requested the chief steward to supply some vegetable foods and I had usually for breakfast oatmeal porridge, milk and stewed fruit and bread, butter and jam and marmalade and cocoa. For dinner I had rice, vegetable curry, milk and jam pastry, stewed fruit, 
bread and butter. For supper bread, butter, jam, cocoa, some lettuce with pepper and salt and cheese. I had only three meals per day. Two days in the week they provide fresh fruit and nuts on the steamer. How I began on 12 pounds per month, after staying with a friend for a month who treated me very kindly and taught me how to behave and how to use the fork and the spoon when I moved to a family where I had to pay 30s per week for board and lodging. Thus, my board and lodging cost me only. I was told, however, that living on two per month would be considered very economical. I therefore managed somehow or other to spend two per month. I did not discard tea from the very beginning. Did I believe at first in taking only three meals per day? A suggestion was thrown out by somebody that I would be considered to be stingy if I took all meals every day in the family and tea very often. Following up this suggestion, I used to lunch outside at least once a week and take tea only thrice a week. Thus, I paid for all this in the family. I spent about tens in the lunching and taking tea outside. I used to spend unnecessarily a great deal also in traveling. It need hardly be. One find an autobiography, P.T. I. C. H. X. I. V. 118. Said here that taking your meals or tea outside purposely to show that you are not stingy or that you are rolling in wealth is anything but gentlemanly and entirely unnecessary. Of course. It is another thing altogether when you have to dine or take tea outside because you have to go far for some business and it would be a waste of time to return home for tea. Again, while living in the family, you are supposed to be punctual. They have fixed times for all the meals and they do not or are not expected to wait for you. So, if you are outside and if you think that you would not reach in time for your meal, that would be a case of dining outside. These occasions are rare and do not at all prove costly, though one who would live on per month cannot afford to do these things. He cannot even get into a good family for per week. The food they used to provide for dinner was third rate. No fault of the family. I was the first vegetarian boarder with them vegetable soups and a vegetable, mostly potatoes, and some fresh fruit. For breakfast they gave me bread and butter and jam and tea and I had porridge occasionally. For lunch they gave me bread and butter and cheese invariably. For tea, bread and butter and tea and cake sometimes. All this did not cost them more than sevens per week. Thus, it will be seen that I paid thirties not because the cost of giving board and lodging was so much or even half so much, but because of the privilege of being allowed to enjoy their company. It is generally thought desirable to live in families in order to learn the English manners and customs. This may be good for a few months, but to pass three years in a family is not only unnecessary but often tiresome. And it would be impossible to lead a regular student's life in the family. This is the experience of many Indians. If you live in a family, you must he is only fair acrifice some time for them if only. Point one was to cook the morning and the evening meals and to have the midday meal outside. I was to spend at the most eights for one room per week. 60 breakfast, supper and one shilling at the most, for dinner. I was told that there was a vegetarian restaurant in Brighton too on reaching Brighton, it was after some difficulty that I could get a good room. The landladies could not be persuaded to believe that the room would not be spoiled by my cooking and room. One of. One pages 5, 6, 7 and 8 are missing. Two vide an autobiography, P.T. I. C. H. X. I. X. Volume 1, 1884 30 November, 1896. 119. Them said, No, I cannot give the room even for twenties. The whole carpet would be spoiled by a stain of grease, and no one else after you leave would take my room. I, however, assured her that she so spoke because her ideas were associated with mutton and that by allowing me to cook her room would not be spoiled as I simply wanted to prepare porridge or boil the milk and I told her also that, if her carpet was spoiled, I would pay for the spoiling. She after some hesitation accepted my proposal and I took her room for eights per week. After leaving my luggage in the room, I went out in search of the vegetarian restaurant. I could not find it. 
and I thought my experiment would fail. This gloomy outlook was rendered gloomier still when I found that no restaurant keeper would arrange to provide me a dinner consisting of vegetable soup and bread and butter for one shilling. I thought they could not undergo the bother for one man. I thought the task was hopeless and that I would be obliged to pay twos or threes merely for a dinner. I was quite tired by this time and very hungry, but I did not give up. I knew that I was to take rest and was not to read much during my stay in Brighton. So I said to myself that if I should cook two meals, why not cook three? As soon as the idea flashed in my mind, I caught hold of it, went to a grocer and bought the necessary things and went to my place. On reaching the house, I told the landlady that, although the arrangement was to allow me to cook only two meals, I would have to cook three. She was angry and would have driven me out of the house, had I not offered to raise the rent from eight to tens. I then set about to work. The first evening I prepared porridge and stewed fruit and I liked it very much. The next morning I had the same. For dinner I had haricot soup which proved to be very nourishing and nice. I thus arranged my meals for the four weeks. For breakfast I had bread and milk and stewed fruit and bread and butter 3D. For dinner I had soup 11 slash, strawberries 2D, and bread 2 1D. For supper I had porridge 11 slash, bread and butter and fruit 2. 2 thus I spent only 11D or 1 shilling per day at the most for food in Brighton. With the tens rent, 3 shillings for washing, the whole expenses for board and lodging for 4 weeks amounted to minus 10 minus 0. And it cost me minus 8 minus 5 for fares to and from Brighton. Thus I was able for four pounds to go to live for four weeks in and return from Brighton. I found out during the last week of my stay in Brighton that 120. There was a vegetarian home where I could have got board and lodging for 14s per week. The house is situated near the Preston Park. The weekly rent was 5s, breakfast 4d, dinner 9d, and supper 4d. Had I found the house a little earlier, I could have lived in Brighton yet more cheaply and more comfortably. But I would not have learned how to cook with facility. There is also another vegetarian house in Brighton where they charge 18s per week for board and lodging. It may be said that the cooking did not take much time. The breakfast took only 10 minutes to be ready. For there was only milk to be made hot. The supper took nearly 20 minutes and the dinner one hour. Thus encouraged by success on reaching London, the first thing for me to do was to go on in search of a suitable bed sitting room. I selected a room in Tavistock Street for eights a week. Here I cooked my breakfast and supper and dined outside. The landlady supplied me with plates, spoons and knife, etc. The breakfast almost always consisted of porridge, stewed fruit and bread and butter 3D. I dined for 6D at one of the many vegetarian restaurants and for supper I had bread and milk and some stewed fruit or radishes or fresh fruit 3D. So then the expenses for board and lodging in England were, during the last nine months of my stay, only 15s and even 14s latterly when, in the same house, I took up a 7S room. During this time I enjoyed the best of health and had to work very hard, if not the hardest as there were only five months left for the final examination. I used to walk about eight miles every day and in all I had three walks daily, one in the evening at 5.30 p.m. for an hour and the other always for 30 or 45 minutes before going to bed. I never suffered from ill health except once when I suffered from bronchitis owing to overwork and neglect of exercise. I got rid of it without having to take any medicine. The good health I enjoyed is attributable only to vegetable diet and exercise in the open air. Even the coldest weather or the densest fog did not prevent me from having my usual walks. And under the advice of Dr. Allenson, the champion of open air, I used to keep my bedroom windows open about 4 inches in all weathers. This is not generally done by people in winter, but it seems to be very desirable. At any rate it agreed with me very well. From the typescript. Courtesy, PRL Nayar. Volume 1, 1884 30 November, 1896. 121. 32. 
fragment of a petition 1894, when an Indian member of the British House of Commons, should he come here, would not be fit for becoming a voter. We thank your honor for receiving this deputation, and the patience and courtesy shown us, and implore you to use your honor's powerful influence to see full justice is done to Indians. It is justice we want, and that only. From a photostat, S.N. 88133. Diary, June 22, 18942, Friday wrote to J. Shanker and Brother 3. Read Kavya Dohan. Translated the Judgment, etc. June 23, Saturday telegram from Tayab for saying he would leave Monday. June 24, Sunday went out for a picnic with Abdullah 5. There was some rowdyism there. Received a long letter from brother discussing Jita. Paul came in the evening. Discussed the condition of the Indians with him. He said he would talk to Byrne about partnership. June 25th, Monday drafted a petition 6 regarding the Franchise Law Amendment 1 1894 a Franchise Law Amendment Bill, which deprived British Indians of any voting rights, had been introduced in the Natal Assembly Vide Bowl. I. The petition of which this fragment formed part was presumably submitted in that year to someone in authority, who cannot be identified. To the text, in Gantiji's hand, is damaged in many places. Wherever possible words have been supplied in square brackets. In this diary Gantiji has frequently used abbreviations, such as, FR for from, W for with, WD for would, RD for received, and so on. These have been spelt out. 3. Lakshmidas Gandhi 4. Mahan Tayab 5. Abdullah Haji Adam, President of the Natal Indian Congress 6. Vide Petition to Natal Assembly, June 28, 1894. 122. Bill? Read the Jita. June 26, Tuesday received a letter from Tayab. Telegraph to him your letter. Have. God fully. Start today. We shall talk over matter Ray. Settlement document passed between Friggins and Dada. Showed petition to Lawton 1. June 27, Wednesday telegraph to the speaker asking whether the petition was received although the bill had passed the committee stage. He replied it was too late as the bill was to be read at third time. Requested the Legislative Assembly to postpone the third reading. Sent also telegrams to Eskom 2. Tatham and Hitchens 3 inches Abdullah's name. Sent copies of the petition to the editors of Mercury 4 and Advertiser 5. June 28, T. Herzday Abdullah, Rustam G6, Tukulis and myself went to Meritsburg. Saw their labister who congratulated me on the petition but could not help in any way although the prayer was very just. Saw Eskim and Hitchens who also admitted the justice but could not help. Attended the third reading which was postponed. There were many Indians in the gallery. A man named Neil saw me. Saw Tatham who said he could not do anything and that he was. Indians come voting. June 29th, Friday left for Durban. Eskom and Hitchens were in the same compartment. Eskom said the debate in the second reading was the real reason for passing the bill. The object was to prevent Indians from coming anymore. Saw Robinson 7 before leaving. He admitted the justice but said he did not make any definite promise. Saw. And. 1 F.A. Lawton 2 Sir Harry Eskim. Attorney General. Premier of Natal in 1897. He had pleaded for Gantiji's admission to the bar of the Natal Supreme Court. 3 Charles T. Hitchens 4 The Natal Mercury 5 The Natal Advertiser 6 Parsi Rustam G7 Sir John Robinson, Premier and Colonial Secretary, Natal 1893-7. Volume 1, 1884-30 November, 1896. 123. Archibald. They too fully admitted the justice but could do nothing, the measure being a government measure. June 30th. Saturday Paul came to see me being sent for. Told him to go to England if possible and in the meantime to work for the Indians and induce them to give up the habit of drinking. He seemed to like the proposal being printed in the papers and favorably commented upon. Saw Campbell 1. 
He too admitted the justice of the prayer. Saw Eskim. He admitted his former promises but said he had. The utmost he would do would be to see that the firms that had property should have votes. Telegraphed to T. And received a reply. July 1st, Sunday wrote a long letter to Dr. Stroud. Also to Barn de Madelha, Jennings and to Tayab. About 100 Indians met. Spoke to them for 45 minutes. Exhorted them to talk less and work more, to have unanimity and to subscribe. The speech seemed to have made a favorable impression. Paul came and said he was going to work seriously. July 2nd, Monday Bill was read a third time. Drafted and sent a letter to Tatham that the Indians protested against his attitude towards the Indians. Saw Maiden who said he was quite willing that a commission should be moved for and that Indians should not be indiscriminately disqualified and also that some of his Indian electors were six times better than his white electors. Letter from Brother July 3rd, TUSA drafted a petition to the Legislative Council to telegraph to Governor asking him to appoint time to see. He was in Durban and therefore received the deputation here in Town Hall 3 drafted a letter to the members of both the houses for it was printed. Sent the petition 1 Henry Campbell, advocate and chief agent for the Transvaal British Indian Merchants 2 Vide Petition to NATO Legislative Council, April 7, 1894 3 Vide Deputation to NATO Governor, March 7, 1894 4 Vide A Circular Letter to Legislators, January 7, 1894 it is, however, dated July 1st, 124. To Campbell. Received a letter from Bird 1, wrote to him. July 4th, Wednesday received a letter from Bird also regarding deputation that waited upon Premier 2 received a letter from Tayab. Wrote to Bird, also to Tayab. Telegraphed to Campbell who replied that the petition was presented but ruled out of order. Telegraphed again eared post all the letters to the members. Translated for Abdullah. July 5th, T. Hursday received a letter from Campbell as to how petition was ruled out of order. Also a letter from Tatham. Drafted another long petition to Council 3 sent it with a letter to Campbell. Drafted a letter in reply to Tatham, and sent it. July 6th. Friday received a letter from Bird saying petition to home government for may be printed and their original signatures need not be applied to the other two copies. Wrote to Mayabai a long letter and also to brother. Received a letter from Ramsey and the book. July 7, Saturday wrote to the Mercury about the constitution of the Missouri Assembly 5 cent 10 to data by 6. July 8, Sunday a letter from Jay Shanker and one from Ruff. The educated youths Indian about assembled. I spoke to them for hours on political activity, drunkenness and self-respect. They seemed to have been favorably impressed. July 9th, Monday began to draft the petition to the home government. Paul saw. 1 Seabird, Principal Undersecretary.